Section 61 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Third Commandment. 36th Lord's Day, question 99, what is required in the Third Command? Answer, that we, not only by cursing or perjury, but also by rash swearing, must not profane or abuse the name of God, nor by silence or connivance be partakers of those horrible sins in others, and briefly, that we use the holy name of God no otherwise than with fear and reverence, so that he may be rightly confessed and worshipped by us, and be glorified in all our words and works. Question 100. Is then the profaning of God's name by swearing and cursing so heinous a sin that his wrath is kindled against those who do not endeavour, as much as in them lies, to prevent and forbid such cursing and swearing? Answer. It undoubtedly is, for there is no sin greater or more provoking to God than the profaning of his name, and therefore he has commanded this sin to be punished with death. Exposition. God, in the first and second commandments, framed the mind and heart for his worship, in the third and fourth the external members and actions. The third commandment consists of two parts, a prohibition and threatening. It first prohibits a rash and inconsiderate use of the name of God. Yea, every abuse of the name of God in whatever false, vain, or trifling thing, which tends to cast a reproach upon God, or which does not at least have respect to his glory. The name of God signifies in the scriptures, one, the attributes of God. Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name for ever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. The Lord is a man of war, the Lord is his name. Genesis 32 verse 29, Exodus 3 verse 15, and chapter 15 verse 3. 2. It signifies God himself. Let them that love thy name be joyful in thee. I will take the cup of salvation, and call upon the name of the Lord. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Thou shalt sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God, of the flock and the herd, in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. I purpose to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God. Psalm 5 verse 11, Psalm 116 verse 13, Psalm 7 verse 17, Deuteronomy 16 verse 2, 1 Kings 5 verse 5. 3. It signifies the will or commandment of God, and that either revealed and true or feigned by men. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. Deuteronomy 18 verse 19, 1 Samuel 17 verse 45. 4. It signifies the worship of God, confidence, prayer, praising, and professing God. All the people walk every one in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God for ever and ever, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Micah 4 verse 5, Acts 21 verse 13. Take the name of the Lord. God does not forbid us to take or to use his name, but he forbids us to do it rashly, which is to use it lightly, falsely, and reproachfully. To use the name of the Lord lightly is to make use of it, as in ordinary talk and conversation, contrary to what Christ says, let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. Matthew 5 verse 37. Falsely, as in unlawful oaths and perjury, reproachfully as in cursing, blasphemy, and sorcery, in which the works of the devil are cloaked under the name of God. The sense, then, is, Thou shalt not use the name of the Lord thy God rashly, that is, Thou shalt not only forswear, but Thou shalt not make any mention of the name of God that would not be honourable to him. This negative precept has an affirmative included in it, for in prohibiting the wrong use of the name of God, it at the same time enjoins upon us that use which is lawful and honourable, which consists in using the name of God reverently, religiously, and honorably, and in making no mention of God or of his works and revelations in our conversation, but such as comports with his divine majesty. Hence the end of this third commandment is that we all render unto God, both publicly and privately, that immediate external worship which consists in confessing and praising his name. 
God adds a threatening to this commandment to declare thereby that this part of obedience is also one of those things, the violation of which is peculiarly displeasing to him and which he will severely punish. For since praising and glorifying God is the chief and ultimate end for which man was created, God justly demands in the most rigid manner from us that, on account of which he commands all other things, and since man's chief good and enjoyment consists in glorifying God, it follows that the greatest evil consists in reproaching God, and taking his name in vain, and so merits the heaviest punishment, according as it is said, because that when they knew not God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, etc. Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin, and he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. Romans 1 verse 21, Leviticus 24 verses 15 and 16. The virtues of this commandment consists in the lawful and honorable use of the name of God, of which these are parts. First, the propagation of the true doctrine respecting the essence, will, and works of God, not indeed that which belongs to the office of teaching publicly in the church, of which mention is made in the fourth commandment, but that by which every one in his own peculiar sphere is bound to instruct others privately, and which contributes to the true knowledge and worship of God, as it is said, Teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. Wherefore comfort yourselves together and edify one another, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Deuteronomy 4 verse 9, chapter 11 verse 19, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11, Luke 22 verse 32, Colossians 3 verse 16. That which is opposed to the propagation of the doctrine concerning the true God includes, one, an omission or a neglect to instruct others, especially our children, and to spread a knowledge of the true doctrine according to our ability, and as opportunity presents itself, I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth, etc. Matthew 25 verse 25. 2. Abstaining or refraining from conversation respecting God and divine things. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they seek not thy statutes. Psalm 119 verse 155. 3. Corrupting religion and the doctrine revealed from heaven, which consists in asserting and propagating what is false concerning God, his will and works. The prophets prophesy lies in my name. Jeremiah 14 verse 14. Second, praising and glorifying God, which consists in an acknowledgement of the divine attributes and works, joined with approbation and admiration thereof in the presence of God and creatures, with the design that we may declare our love and reverence to God, in order that he may be exalted above all things, and that our subjection to him may be made manifest. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth! Let the heavens and the earth praise him, etc. Psalm 22, verse 22, Psalm 8, verse 1, Psalm 69, verse 34. Those things which are opposed to this virtue are one, contempt of God, a neglect of his praise, worship, and divine works. They glorified him not as God. Romans 1 verse 21. 2. Blasphemy, which is to speak such things of God as are opposed to his nature and will, either through ignorance or through hatred to the truth and to God himself. Whosoever shall curse his God shall bear his sin. Leviticus 24 verse 15. 3. All cursing, by which men speak and ask wicked things of God against their neighbor, as if God were their executioner to carry into effect their desire of vengeance upon those with whom they are at variance. To curse is to ask and desire evil to any one from God. All cursing now which proceeds from hatred and from a desire of private revenge leading to the destruction of our neighbor is unbecoming and wicked because it desires that God should be made the executioner of our corrupt wishes and passions. Certain imprecations of the saints against their enemies are indeed found in the Psalms and elsewhere, but these are not to be positively condemned, because they are in a great measure prophetical denunciations of punishment against the enemies of God. From these examples we may infer that execrations are at particular times lawful, but with these conditions. 1. If we desire evil things to come upon those upon whom God denounces them, viz. his enemies. 2. If it is done on account of God without any private hatred or desire of revenge. 3. If we ask it upon the condition that these things come upon them only in case they remain incorrigible. 
For, if we so desire these things, as not to rejoice in their destruction, but merely to desire that the divine glory be vindicated, and the church delivered. Third, the confession of the truth known concerning God, which consists in declaring what we know with certainty from the holy scriptures of God and his will, because we declare and make known from a consideration of duty our knowledge of God, that so we may glorify him and advance the salvation of our fellow men. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. Romans 10, verses 10 and 11, 1 Peter 3, verse 15. To this confession of the truth there is opposed, one, a denial of the truth, or an unwillingness on the part of any one to declare what he knows concerning religion for fear of hatred or the cross or reproach. This denial is of two kinds. The first is an entire apostasy from true religion, which is to cast away the profession of the truth to whatever extent it may have been known and received, which is done with the determined counsel and desire of the heart opposed to God, and which is also accompanied with no grief or sorrow for having rejected the truth, and without any purpose to obey God, by individually applying the promise of grace or showing signs of repentance. Such a denial of the truth is that of which hypocrites and the reprobate are guilty, concerning which it is said, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. Which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. 1 John 2 verse 19, Luke 8 verse 13. If this denial be made after the truth has once been certainly known, it becomes the sin against the Holy Ghost, of which none repent, so that no forgiveness is obtained, neither in this nor in the life to come. The other denial of the truth is particular. It is that which is committed by those who are of a weak faith, and results either from error, without being willful and intentional, or from fear of the cross, whilst there is still remaining in the heart an inclination to cleave to God, and a sorrow on account of this wickedness and denial, to a certain purpose to struggle out of it, and to assent to and obey God by applying individually the promise of grace and showing signs of true penitence. The regenerate and elect may be guilty of this denial of the truth, but they struggle out of it and return again to the confession of the truth in this life. So Peter denied Christ through weakness, but repented of his sin before God. 2. Dissembling or keeping back the truth, where the glory of God and the salvation of our neighbor require a confession of it, which is necessary when false views of God, of his word, and of the church seem to be confirmed in the minds of men by our silence, or when those things remain unknown which God will have known for the purpose of vindicating his glory against the calumnies of the wicked, for convincing the obstinate and instructing those who are disposed to learn or when our silence lays us open to the suspicion of approving what is said and done by the wicked. It was in this way that the parents of the man born blind, of whom we have an account in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John, dissembled, and also those chief rulers who would not confess Christ for fear of the Jews, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, John 12, verse 42. 3. An abuse of Christian liberty or giving offence in things which are indifferent, which is done when by the use of such things we confirm the adversaries of God in error, or alienate them from true religion, or by our example provoke them to an imitation accompanied with an evil conscience, of which Paul treats largely in the fourteenth chapter of his epistle to the Romans, and also in the eighth and tenth chapters of his first epistle to the Corinthians. 4. All scandals and offences in morals, as, for instance, when those who profess the true religion lead shameful and offensive lives, denying in works what they profess in words, and so laying the church open to reproach, and the name of God to the foul blasphemies of unbelievers. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, as if he would say they pretend a knowledge of God without faith. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. Titus 1 verse 16 Romans 2 verse 24, see also Psalm 50 verse 16, Isaiah 52 verse 5, 2 Timothy 3 verse 5. 5. An untimely or unseasonable confession of the truth, by which men stir up and excite the enemies of religion, either to contemn or revile the truth, or to bitterness and cruelty against the godly, without advancing the glory of God and the salvation of any one, and without any necessity demanding a confession of the truth at the time and under the circumstances under which it was made. Such an untimely confession Christ prohibits when he says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pills before swine. 
Matthew 7 verse 6. Paul also says, A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. Titus 3 verse 10 and 11. Nor is the declaration of the Apostle Peter, chapter 3, verse 15, in which he commands us to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh a reason of the hope that is in us, with meekness and fear, at variance with what we have just said, as though no confession were untimely. For the Apostle commands us always to be ready and well prepared to give an answer concerning the sum and foundation of the doctrine of the Church, and to repel the calumnies and sophisms by which this doctrine is perverted and evil spoken of by the enemies of religion, but he does not command us to profess and declare all things at all times and before every one, but merely before those who ask a reason or a defence of the hope that is within us, for the purpose of learning, knowing, or judging in reference to it. Hence, if any one should make a mock of religion or deride the doctrine of the gospel after it has once been sufficiently declared and explained to him, and should ask a reason of our hope, we should not return an answer to him, but leave him to himself." So Christ himself, after he had sufficiently confessed and confirmed his doctrine, made no reply to the high priest and Pilate with reference to the false witnesses, and gave as a reason of his silence, If I tell you, ye will not believe. Luke 22, verse 67. Fourth, gratitude, which consists in acknowledging and confessing what and how great benefits we have received from God, and to what obedience we are bound in view of these blessings, and that we will, therefore, cheerfully and heartily yield it unto God, to the extent of our power, according as it is said, Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. O give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth for ever. Colossians 3 verse 17, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18, Psalm 107 verse 1. There is opposed to this virtue one in gratitude, which is when any one either seldom or never thinks and talks of the benefits of God, or if he does think and speak of them, he does it with coldness and dissimulation, so that there is no love to God or desire of gratitude kindled in his heart. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Romans 1 verse 21. 2. The want of a proper appreciation of the benefits of God, or not placing such a value upon them as we ought. This occurs whenever any one regards himself or others as being the authors of his mercies. What hath thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7. 3. A neglect of the gifts of God which occurs whenever they are not so employed as to promote the divine glory. The same may also be said of the abuse of these gifts. Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, etc. Matthew 25, verses 26 and 27. Fifth, zeal for the glory of God, which is an ardent love of God, and sorrow on account of any reproach or contempt cast upon God, with an attempt to throw it from him, and to vindicate the honour of his name. Phineas hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them. I have been very zealous for the Lord of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, etc. Numbers 25 verse 11, 1 Kings 19 verse 10. Timidity or a want of firmness is opposed to this zeal for God on the side of want, and consists in not being affected with grief on account of reproach cast upon God, and so not caring for the divine glory, and in not having or showing any desire in word and deed to prevent this reproach. Those are guilty of this sin who, when they might prohibit cursing and foul blasphemies by which the name of God is dishonoured, do, nevertheless, not prevent them, not being led to it by any zeal for the glory of God. An erring false zeal is opposed to this virtue as it respects the opposite extreme, viz. that of excess. This Paul calls a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Romans 10 verse 3 it consists in being displeased with such words and actions as are erroneously conceived to impair the glory of God. This now may take place whenever we suppose that to be the glory of God and attempt to defend it which is not the glory of God and ought not to be defended, or when we regard that as detracting from the glory of God and endeavour to repel it which is not inconsistent with the divine glory and ought not to be repelled. 
or still further, when it is attempted to prevent an offence or injury to the divine glory in a way different from that in which it ought to be done. Sixth, calling upon the name of the Lord, which consists in asking of the true God those things which he has commanded us to ask at his hands. It proceeds from a sense of want on our part, and from a desire to share in the divine bounty, and commences with true conversion to God and faith in the divine promises for the mediator's sake. O give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, ask, and it shall be given you. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Psalm 105, verse 1, Matthew 7, verse 7, 1 John 5, verse 14. There is opposed to this invocation, one, a neglect of calling upon the name of the Lord, which the scriptures represent and condemn as the fountain of all ungodliness, and call not upon the name of the Lord, Psalm 14, verse 4. Two, all unlawful calling upon God, which is the case whenever any condition necessary to acceptable prayer is wanting, under which may be comprehended idolatrous invocation, which is either directed to some imaginary deity or to creatures, or else it restricts the divine presence and an answer to our prayers to a certain place or thing without any command and promise from God. Such are the prayers of the heathen, Turks, Jews, and all others who imagine unto themselves another God beside the true God revealed unto us in his word and works. Ye worship, ye know not what. John 4, verse 22. The same thing may also be said of those among the papists who pray to the angels and to the saints who have departed this life, because in so doing they attribute to them the honour due to God alone. 3. The asking of such things as are contrary to the will and law of God. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. James 4, verse 3. 4. A mere lip service for such prayers as consist merely in words, or in the motion of the body, without enlisting the feelings of the heart, and in which there is no real desire to obtain the blessing of God. Prayers which are without true repentance, without any assurance of being heard, without a subjection of the will to the will of God, without any reference to or thought of the divine promise, without any confidence in Christ, the only mediator, and without any true sense or acknowledgement of unworthiness in the sight of God. When ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. When ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you, yea, when ye make your prayers, I will not hear. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Matthew 6 verse 7, Isaiah 1 verse 15, James 1 verse 7. The objections which the papists bring against us in favour of the invocation of the saints. Objection 1. The saints, on account of their virtues, are to be honoured with the worship either of adoration, latria, or of veneration, lulia. But it is not in the former sense that they are to be worshipped, because this form of worship is due to God alone, inasmuch as it attributes to him universal power, providence, and dominion, which can be ascribed to God alone. Therefore veneration is due to the saints, or such worship as that which we ascribe to them for their holiness. Answer. We deny the consequence, because the major proposition is incomplete, for besides the worship of adoration and veneration, which is the distinction here made, there is another kind of veneration, such as is proper to the saints, which is the acknowledgement and celebration of the faith, holiness, and gifts, for which they were distinguished, obedience to the doctrine which they taught, and an imitation of their lives and piety, concerning which Augustine says, quote, They are to be honoured by imitation, but not by adoration, end quote. This veneration is due to the saints, and we have no desire to take it from them, whether living or dead, but, on the other hand, willingly attribute it to them according to the command of the Apostle, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation, Hebrews 13 verse 7. We also deny the minor proposition because the distinction which they make between the worship of adoration and veneration is of no force, inasmuch as these are not different forms of worship, but one and the same. Neither do they belong to the saints, or to any creature, but to God alone, because he knows and hears in all places, and at all times, the thoughts, the groans and desires of those who call upon him, and relieves their necessities. No one but God can hear those who call upon him. Therefore this honour must be ascribed to him alone, because he hears them that pray. This honour belongs also to Christ because it is on account of his merits and intercession that God grants unto us the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and all other good things. 
Hence this honour cannot be transferred to the saints without manifest sacrilege and idolatry, whether it be under the name of adoration or veneration or whatever name it may be. This distinction too which they make is of no account, since the words are used indifferently in the original to signify the same thing, both in the scriptures and in profane writers. Concerning God it is said, Matthew 4 verse 10, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Here the Greek word latarephsis is used. And in Matthew 6 verse 25 it is said, He cannot serve God and mammon, in which place the word lulevin is used which word is also used in the following places where it is said, Ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. They that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9, Romans 16 verse 18. Paul also everywhere calls himself the servant of God, dolon theu. In the Greek text, servile or slavish work is everywhere termed latarefton. Suidas writes that latarevin means the same thing as to serve for wages, Vala shows that this same word signifies to serve man as well as to serve God, adducing a passage from Xenophon, where a man says that he is ready to risk his life sooner than his wife should be made to serve. And the wife, on the other hand, says that she would rather lose her life than that her husband should serve, where the word luleve is used. Hence these words upon which the papists base the above distinction do not differ but express one and the same thing. Objection 2 we ought to honour those whom God honours. God honours the saints. You shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Matthew 19, verse 28. Therefore they are to be honoured by us. Answer, we admit the argument in as far as it has respect to the honour which God attributes to the saints. In this, however, invocation is never included. God himself says, I am the Lord, that is my name and my glory, I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Isaiah 42, verse 8. Objection 3. The hearing of our secret sighs and groans, which belongs to God by nature, is through grace communicated to the saints, therefore they are to be invoked. Answer. We deny the antecedent, for God does not communicate those properties by which he desires to be distinguished from creatures, such as immensity, omnipotence, infinite wisdom, seeing and knowing the heart, hearing prayer, etc. These are properties which God communicates to no creature, neither by nature nor by grace. For thou only knowest the hearts of the children of men. 2 Chronicles 6 verse 30. Objection 4. God has communicated to the saints the power of working miracles, which is nevertheless a property belonging to himself alone. Therefore he communicates to the saints at least some of the properties by which he is distinguished from creatures, so that they may have a knowledge of the thoughts and desires of those who pray unto them. Answer 1. The consequence which is here drawn is of no force, for it does not follow, even though it were true, which we do not admit, that God had communicated some of his properties to the saints, and that the hearing of prayer is included amongst them, if the scriptures do not teach the fact. 2. Nor is the reason which is assigned of any force that the saints have a knowledge of the desires of those who invoke them, because they have been endowed with the gift of working miracles. For the power of working miracles is not transfused into the saints, nor do they perform these miracles by their own power, but merely as ministers. Hence the saints are said to do these things in a figurative sense, when God employs them as ministers and joins the working of a miracle as the sign of his presence, power, and will. Objection 5. Some prophets seemed to know the thoughts and counsels of other men, so Ahijah knew the thoughts of the wife of Jeroboam, Elisha knew the thoughts of the king of Syria, Peter knew the thoughts of Ananias and Sapphira, etc., 1 Kings 14 verse 6, 2 Kings 6 verse 12, Acts 5 verse 3. Therefore God has communicated to the saints a knowledge of the hearts of men. Answer 1. Examples that are few in number and of an extraordinary character do not constitute a general rule. 2. These persons knew these things by the gift of prophecy with which they were endowed, but yet they did not know them always, but only at that time when the good of the church required it, nor was it by any power lodged within them by which they were enabled to know the heart, but by a divine revelation, nor did they know all things but only such as God was pleased to reveal to them. Hence it does not appear that the saints, after death, are also endowed with the gift of prophecy, since there is no need of it in eternal life. Objection 6. The angels in heaven rejoice over the repentance of sinners. Luke 15 verse 10. Therefore they know when men exercise true penitence, and must also have a knowledge of the desires of those who call upon them in prayer. Answer. 
a cause that is inferred from an effect, which may result from other causes, is not of much force or consequence. For it is not necessary that the angels should know the repentance of the sinner by looking into the heart, inasmuch as they may know it either from the effects and signs which accompany it, or from a divine revelation. Objection 7. The soul of the rich man, when in hell, saw Abraham in heaven, and addressed prayer to him, whom Abraham also heard. The rich man likewise knew the state and condition of his five brethren, who are still on earth. Therefore the saints in heaven see and know the desires and condition of those who are upon the earth, and are to be invoked. Answer. No doctrine can be established from allegories and parables. That that now is an allegory by which Christ desired to express the thoughts, torments, and condition of the ungodly who are suffering punishment is evident from this, that it possesses all the parts of a parable. Hence it establishes nothing in favour of the invocation of the saints, and even though all these things had been done as they are represented, yet they prove nothing as it respects the doctrine of the invocation of the saints, since Abraham is said to have known these things by speech, and not because he had a knowledge of the secret thoughts of the heart. Objection 8. Christ knows all things according to his human nature, therefore the saints also have a knowledge of all things. Answer. The examples are not the same. Christ's human understanding perceives and knows, and his bodily eyes and ears hear and see all things which he, according to his human nature, desires to perceive, either with his mind or external senses, on account of its personal union with the divine nature which reveals these things, or on account of his office as mediator. But it cannot be proven from the scriptures that all things are revealed to the angels and saints, which are made known to the human understanding of Christ by his divinity. Objection 9. The images of all things are reflected or appear in the vision and face of the Trinity. The holy angels and blessed men who have departed this life see the face of the deity, as it is said, In heaven the angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 18 verse 10. Therefore they, in this way, see and know all that we do, suffer, think, etc. Answer 1. The major proposition is uncertain and cannot be proven from the scriptures. 2. Nor can the minor be established, for it is said, No man hath seen God at any time. John 1 verse 18. 3. Although the angels and saints in heaven have a clear knowledge of God, yet we are not to suppose that they naturally know all things which are in God, for if this were the case, their knowledge would be infinite, or in other words, it would be equal to the knowledge of God, which is absurd, and contrary to the testimony of Scripture, which declares that the angels are ignorant of the day of judgment. God reveals to every one, both in heaven and on earth, as much as he will, according to his own good pleasure. Objection 10. The friendship and intercourse of the saints with God and Christ is so great that it is not possible that a revelation of those things which we ask at their hands should be withheld from them. Answer. That consequence which is drawn from an insufficient cause is of no force, for this friendship and intercourse will continue, although God does not reveal to the saints as much as they desire, but merely those things which it is profitable for them to know, for his glory and for their own happiness. Objection 11. Christ is the mediator of redemption. The saints are mediators of intercession. Therefore, there is nothing detracted from Christ if the saints are invoked as intercessors and as those who plead with God in our behalf. Answer. We deny the distinction that is here made because the scriptures teach that Christ is the only mediator and that he has not only redeemed us by once offering himself for us upon the cross, but that he also continually appears before the Father and makes intercession for us. See Hebrews 5, verses 7 and 9, chapter 7, verse 27, John 19, verse 9, Romans 8, verse 34, Hebrews 9, verse 24, 1 John 2. Objection 12. Christ alone is mediator by virtue of his own merit and intercession. The saints are mediators and intercessors by virtue of the merit and intercession of Christ, that is, their intercessions with God in our behalf avail for the sake of the merit and intercession of Christ, Therefore that which is peculiar to Christ is not transferred to the saints. Answer. Those who make intercession in this way detract from the honour of Christ as much as in the former case, which will appear by making in the antecedent a full enumeration of the ways in which the honour of Christ is transferred to others. For not only those who by their own virtue, but even those who by the virtue of Christ are said to merit for us from God those good things promised for the sake of Christ's merits alone are substituted in the place of Christ, and again, if the prayers of the saints are pleasing to God and heard on account of the merit and intercession of Christ, they cannot please God 
nor obtain anything for us in their own holiness and merits, as the papists teach. For he who stands in need of a mediator and intercessor cannot appear as an intercessor for others, although he may pray for others. Hence our adversaries overthrow by their own argument the doctrine which they vainly attempt to establish. Objection 13. Those who pray for us in heaven are to be invoked. These saints offer prayers in our behalf in heaven, therefore they are to be addressed in prayer. Answer. There is here an error in taking that as a cause which is none, for the mere fact that any one prays for another is not a sufficient reason why we should address prayer to him. We readily grant that the saints in heaven do ardently desire the salvation of the church militant, and that their prayers are heard according to the counsels of God, but that the saints know the misfortunes and business of every one in particular, and that they hear the prayers which may be addressed to them, we deny. Objection 14. God said, Jeremiah 15, verse 1, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be towards this people. Therefore the saints stand before God and make intercession for us. Answer 1. But even though we were to grant the whole argument, yet it does not therefore follow, as we have already shown, that we ought to pray unto them. 2. The language which is here quoted is figurative. It introduces the dead and represents them praying as though they were living, so that the sense is if Moses and Samuel were yet living, and would pray for this wicked people as they prayed for them and were heard when they lived upon earth, yet they could not obtain grace and pardon for them. There is a similar passage found in Ezekiel 14, verse 4, which must be explained in like manner. Objection 15. The Lord said through Isaiah, I will defend this city and save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. 2 Kings 19, verse 34. Therefore God confers benefits upon men upon the earth for the sake of the merits and intercessions of David and of other saints after death. Answer. But it was not in respect to the merits of David, but in respect to the promise of the Messiah, who was to be born from the house of David, that God promised to protect and defend the city referred to. And if anyone should object and say that the deliverance of the city of David from the assault of the Assyrians might have been effected without the benefit and promise of the Messiah, and was therefore promised on account of the merits of David, we reply that they err who imagine that the benefits of Christ extend merely to those things or promises upon the performance of which the promises made to David with reference to the Messiah could only be preserved and receive their fulfillment, for all the benefits of God, including those that are temporal as well as those that are spiritual, those that were granted before the coming of the Messiah as well as those which have been granted since, those without which the promise of the Messiah could, as well as those without which it could be fulfilled, are all conferred upon the church for the sake of Christ. For the promises of God in him, Christ, are yea, and in him are men, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. Objection 16. Jacob said of the sons of Joseph, Let my name be on them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. Genesis 48 verse 16. Therefore it is lawful to call upon the saints who have departed this life. Answer. This is to misunderstand the figure of speech which is here employed, which is a Hebrew phrase, meaning not adoration, but an adoption of the children of Joseph, so that the senses, Let them be called after my name, or let them take their name from me, that is, let them be called my sons and not my grandchildren. The phrase is similar to that found in Isaiah 4 verse 1, where it is said, And on that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, Let us be called by thy name, that is, let us be called thy wives. Objection 17. Eliphaz says to Job, chapter 5 verse 1, Call now, if there be any that will answer thee, and to which of the saints wilt thou turn? Therefore Job is commanded to implore help from some one of the saints. Answer. This passage is evidently at war with the doctrine of the invocation of the saints, for it affirms that the angels so far excel men in purity that they will not make answer or appear when addressed or invoked by men. Objection 18. Christ says, Matthew 25 verse 40, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Therefore the invocation of the saints is an honour which is showed to Christ himself. Answer, Christ does not speak of the invocation of the saints, but of the duty of love which it becomes us to perform towards the afflicted members of his church in this life. The passage therefore furnishes no proof in favour of the invocation of the saints. Objection 19. The angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast indignation these threescore and ten years? Zechariah 1 verse 2. Therefore the angels pray for men in their times of need and distress, and so are to be prayed unto. 
Answer 1. But this passage furnishes no proof that all the angels know the wants and afflictions of all men. The calamities of the Jews were manifest not only to the sight of angels, but also to men. 2. We deny the consequence which is here drawn from the angels to the saints who have departed this life. For the care and defence of the church in this world has been committed to the angels. They are therefore conversant with the things of this world, and see our wants and necessities, which the saints do not, inasmuch as this charge is not committed to their care. 3. The consequence which is here drawn, that we must pray unto the angels, because they pray for us, is in like manner of no force, as we have already shown. Objection 20. Judas Maccabeus saw in a vision the high priest, Onias, and Jeremiah the prophet praying for the people. 2 Maccabees 15 verse 14. Therefore the saints who have departed this life pray for us, and are to be invoked. Answer. No doctrine can be established by the authority of an apocryphal book. We also deny the consequence, which is here deduced, for not every one that prays for us is to be prayed to by us. Objection 21. Baruch says, Hear now the prayers of the dead Israelites. Baruch 3 verse 4. Therefore the saints pray for us and are to be invoked. Answer. We may return the same answer to this objection that we did to the preceding one, that an apocryphal book proves nothing. There is also a misunderstanding of the figure of speech here used, for those who are called the dead Israelites are not such as had departed this life, but such as were living and calling upon God, but who on account of their calamities were similar to those who were dead. Objection 22. It is not permitted to come into the presence of a prince without the intercession of someone, Therefore much less can we come into the presence of God without someone to appear before him as our intercessor. Answer, we grant the whole argument for without Christ, the mediator, no one can have access to God, as Christ himself says, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14 verse 6. Ambrose very appropriately and forcibly answers the above objection in his commentary on the epistle to the Romans, where he thus writes, quote, some men are wont to use a miserable excuse, saying that we obtain access to God through his righteous saints in the same way in which any one comes into the presence of a prince, which is through his attendants. Well, is any one so mad and unmindful of his own safety as to transfer the honour of the king to any of his attendants, since those who have been found to do this have been condemned as guilty of treason? And yet these persons suppose that those are not guilty of treason against God, who transfer the honour of his name to creatures, and forsaking their Lord, worship their fellow servants, as if this accomplished anything in the way of assisting them in the service of God. We come into the presence of a king through his nobles and attendants, because he is a man as we are, and does not know to whom he ought to entrust the affairs of his kingdom, but as it respects God, from whom nothing is concealed, and who knows the merits of all, we need no one to secure us an access to him but a devout mind, for wherever such an one speaks, he will answer nothing, etc. Chrysostom writes, quote, The Canaanitish woman did not ask of James, nor did she beseech John, nor did she go to Peter, nor did she come to the whole core of the apostles, nor did she seek any mediator, but instead of all these she took repentance for her companion, which repentance supplied the place of an advocate, and in this way she went to the chief fountain, end quote. So much concerning the sixth virtue comprehended in this commandment, which virtue we have defined as invocation or calling upon God. Seventh, lawful or religious swearing which is comprehended in calling upon God. By this, the person who takes an oath desires that God would be a witness to what he affirms, that he has no desire to deceive in the thing concerning which he makes oath, and that God may punish him if he practices any deception. This form of swearing is authorized by God, who designs that it may be a bond of truth between men, and a testimony that he is the author and defender of truth. That which is opposed to swearing religiously includes one, a refusing to take an oath when the glory of God and the safety of our neighbour require it at our hands. An oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Hebrews 6 verse 16. 2. Perjury or forswearing, as when any one knowingly and willingly deceives by an oath, or does not keep a lawful oath, for to forswear is either to swear to that which is false, as for instance, that thou art not guilty of murder when thou hast slain a man, or not to perform a thing lawfully sworn. 3. An idolatrous oath which is taken not by the true God alone. 4. An oath taken in regard to that which is unlawful, as the oath of Herod. 5. Oaths which are made rashly, and from levity without any necessity or sufficient cause. It is of this that the scriptures speak when they forbid swearing. See Matthew 5 verse 23, James 5 verse 12. 
The doctrine respecting the oath is contained and explained in the following questions of the Catechism. End of section 61. Section 62 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Doctrine of the Oath. 37th Lord's Day, question 101. May we then swear religiously by the name of God? Answer. Yes, either when the magistrates demand it of the subjects, or when necessity requires us thereby to confirm fidelity and truth to the glory of God and the safety of our neighbour. For such an oath is founded on God's word, and therefore was justly used by the saints both in the Old and New Testament. Question 102. May we also swear by saints or any other creatures? Answer, no, for a lawful oath is a calling upon God as the one who knows the heart, that he will bear witness to the truth and punish me if I swear falsely, which honour is due to no creature. Exposition. In these two questions, the doctrine respecting the oath is explained at large. The doctrine of the oath. Concerning this, we must inquire, first, what is an oath? Second, by whom are we to swear? Third, is it lawful for Christians to make oath? Fourth, what are the things concerning which we are to make oath? Fifth, are all oaths to be kept? First, what is an oath? An oath is often used in the scriptures for the whole worship of God, as thou shalt swear by his name. In that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan, and swear to the Lord of hosts. Every knee shall bow unto me, every tongue shall swear. Deuteronomy 10 verse 20, Isaiah 19 verse 18, chapter 45 verse 23. Concerning the worship of the New Testament, it is said, He who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth, and he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth. If they will diligently learn the ways of my people to swear by my name, then shall they be built in the midst of my people. Isaiah 65 verse 16, Jeremiah 12 verse 16. The reason of this is that we profess him as our God by whom we swear, an oath, properly speaking, is a calling upon God as the one who knows the heart, that he will bear witness to the truth and punish me if I swear falsely. It is in this way that the Catechism defines a lawful oath, which definition is taken from the form of swearing which the Apostle Paul uses when he says, I call God for a witness upon my soul that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 23. It is said in the definition just given that God will bear witness, viz. by preserving and doing good to him that swears, if he swear religiously, and by punishing and destroying him if he swear falsely. For the oath was instituted by God that it might serve as a bond of truth between men and be a testimony that God is the author and defender of truth. Second, by whom are we to swear? We must swear by the name of the true God alone, 1. Because God has commanded that we swear by him alone, as he alone is to be feared and worshipped. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave, and shalt swear by his name. Deuteronomy 10 verse 20. 2. God positively forbids us to swear by any other name. Make no mention of the names of other gods. Exodus 23 verse 13. 3. God wills that the worship of invocation be given to him alone, and condemns those who, in their oaths, join creatures with himself. The oath now, according to the definition, is one of the ways in which we call upon God, being comprehended in it. 4. An oath ascribes to him by whom it is taken a knowledge of hearts, omniscience, omnipresence, etc., and it is indeed necessary that he by whom we swear should be possessed of infinite wisdom, and have a knowledge of the heart, because when oaths are taken, it is not concerning things which are manifest and of which there is no doubt, but of things unknown and uncertain, and of which he only, who has a knowledge of all hearts, can judge whether men speak the truth or that which is false. But God alone knows the heart, is omniscient and everywhere present. And as Christ and the Holy Ghost are God, and know all things, as the following passages of Scripture sufficiently testify, we are also to swear by them. He knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. The Spirit searcheth all things. John 2, verses 24 and 25, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11. 5. We commit the execution of punishment to him by whom we swear, and also attribute such power to him as is necessary to maintain the truth, and punish those who are guilty of perjury. 
but God alone is possessed of such power, and inflicts punishment upon the wicked. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, verse 28. Men cannot be the avengers of those who are guilty of perjury, inasmuch as those who swear falsely may escape the judgment of men, either because they do not know the heart, so as to see whether those who swear are practicing a deception or not, or because those who perjure themselves are too powerful to be punished by men. It follows, therefore, that we must not take an oath except by the name of God alone. It is apparent, from what has now been said, that oaths which are taken by the saints and other creatures are idolatrous and prohibited by God. Objection. But Joseph swore by the life of Pharaoh, Genesis 42, verse 15, therefore it is lawful to swear by men and creatures. Answer. There are some who admit that Joseph sinned in following the custom of the Gentiles, who were wont to swear by things, that his brethren might not by this means recognize him, but we may give a different reply to the objection by maintaining that his language does not properly contain an oath, but merely a strong affirmation, so that the sense is as truly as Pharaoh lives, or is in safety, or as truly as I desire him to be in safety, so truly do I affirm these things. The same interpretation must be given to all other asseverations of a similar character, instances of which may be found in 1 Samuel 1 verse 27, chapter 15 verse 55, chapter 20 verse 3, chapter 25 verse 26, these forms of speech are not properly oaths, but strong declarations, made for the sake of placing something in the clearest light by comparing it with something known and manifest, so that we are to understand them as meaning that those things which are affirmed are as certain as that he liveth who is named by the person making the declaration. Third, is it lawful for Christians to take an oath? that it is lawful to swear religiously by the name of God, when the magistrates demand it, or otherwise, when necessity requires, may be proven by these four arguments. 1. That the glory of God may be promoted. Truth with its manifestation is glorious to God. 2. That it may contribute to the safety of others. Our safety consists in the maintenance of truth, especially heavenly truth. 3. The word of God authorizes and sanctions lawful swearing. 4. The saints have at different times taken oaths under a religious form. The Anabaptists take exceptions to what we have here taught respecting the oath, and maintain that whilst it was lawful for the fathers who lived under the Old Testament to swear, we who live under the New Testament are prohibited. Hence, in order to meet their objections, we must add to the reasons already given the following additional considerations. 5. Christ says, I am not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Matthew 5, verse 17. This now was spoken with reference to the moral law, to which the oath had respect. Hence Christ had not prohibited those who live under the New Testament to swear religiously, when necessity demands it. 6. The moral worship of God is perpetual. A lawful oath forms a part of the moral worship, being one of the ways in which we call upon God. Therefore it is perpetual. 7. The prophets, in describing the worship of the Christian church, call it a swearing by the name of God. He that sweareth in the oath shall swear by the God of truth. Isaiah 65 verse 16. Therefore those who live in the Christian church are not prohibited from swearing religiously. 8. The same thing may be argued from the design of the oath, which is a confirmation of fidelity and truth, and a removal of strife, which design is profitable, lawful, and necessary for the church and the state, and at the same time honorable to God. An oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, Hebrews 6 verse 16. Such now being the design of the oath, it is manifest that it is not only lawful but even necessary for Christians to take it. 8. From the examples of Christ and the saints in the New Testament, Christ on more than one occasion used a form of swearing for the confirmation of his doctrine. Verily, verily, I say unto you, etc. John 3 verse 3. Paul says, God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Ye are witnesses, and God also how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Romans 1 verse 9, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 23, Romans 9 verse 1, Philippians 1 verse 8, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 16. These and similar arguments and examples clearly demonstrate that it is lawful for Christians under the new covenant also to swear religiously. 
the Anabaptists bring forward by way of objection to what has now been advanced, the declaration of Christ found in Matthew 5, verses 34 to 38, where it is said, I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. They also bring forward for the same purpose the following passage from the epistle of James, chapter 5, verse 12, Above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest ye come into condemnation. But that these declarations do not forbid all oaths, but only such as are rash and unnecessary, is evident both from a comparison of other passages of the Old and New Testaments, and especially from the design of Christ, who in the first passage referred to, removing the corruptions thrown around the law and giving its true sense, and at the same time reproving the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, teaches that the third commandment of the Decalogue does not only condemn perjury, but also such oaths as are unnecessary and rash, and among these not only such as are direct, in which there is an express mention of the name of God, but also such as are indirect, in which when creatures are named, the name of God is dissembled and understood thereby which kind of oaths were then common in ordinary conversation. Hypocrites, or those who were in the habit of using these indirect forms of swearing, such as swearing by the temple, by the altar, by heaven, etc., excused these oaths, as if they did not profane the name of God when they swore in this way, inasmuch as they did not expressly mention the name of God, and did not suppose that they had perjured themselves if they violated the oath which they had taken in this indirect form. Christ now, in the passage referred to, shows that men swear also by the name of God, when heaven and earth are named, because there is no creature nor any part of the world upon which God has not stamped some mark of his glory. And when any one swears by heaven and earth in the sight and hearing of his Maker, the religious character of the oath which he takes is not in the creatures by whom he swears, but God himself alone is called upon to witness what is said, by the mention of those things which are the signs of his glory. Nor does God tenaciously cling to the words which are uttered, but looks more particularly to the mind and intention of him that swears, neither does the honour or dishonour of the name of God consist so much in the syllables or forms of expression used, as in the meaning and sense which they bear, as Christ elsewhere, Matthew 23, verses 16 to 23, teaches in express terms, which passage should be compared with the one now under consideration. The same interpretation must be given to the passage quoted from the epistle of James. Objection 1. But Christ says, Swear not at all, and James says, Nor by any other oath. Therefore Christians are not allowed to swear under any form. Answer. There is here a fallacy of composition, for when Christ says, Swear not at all, we are not to refer this language to the oath itself, but to the various forms of rash swearing which the Pharisees imagined lawful. It is therefore as if he would say, Swear not falsely or rashly at all, whether it be in a direct or indirect way. So when the Apostle James says, nor by any other oath, we must understand him also as referring to such oaths as are rash and false, of which kind he furnishes some specimens, and forbids all of a similar character. If this be not the proper interpretation of these passages, Christ himself has violated his own precept, which he here lays down, saying, Let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For he frequently, in his discourses, used this most emphatic form of expression, Verily, verily, I say unto you. And James would in this case condemn Paul, who called God for a record upon his soul. And the Holy Ghost would contradict himself by condemning all oaths by James, and commending them by another apostle, as a remedy useful and necessary to the preservation of society, for the purpose of putting an end to strifes and controversies, from which human life in this state of frailty and imperfection cannot be free. Objection 2. But such oaths as were permitted, together with the examples which are found in the Scriptures, have respect to public oaths, such as were exacted or given in the name of the public and for the public good. Therefore, at least private oaths, or such as pass between private individuals, are entirely prohibited. Answer 1. We deny the antecedent, because there is not only no such restriction as that which is here maintained, specified in the instances recorded in the Scriptures, where the saints make oath to God, but it is impossible to interpret them in this way, as a careful examination of the passages themselves will prove. 
Two, there are many oaths recorded in the scriptures, the private character of which cannot be doubted, such as that of Jacob and Laban, that of Boaz, Abida, Abigail, and David. Genesis 31 verse 53, Ruth 3 verse 13, etc. Three, the same thing may be proven by the design of the oath, which is a confirmation of fidelity and truth amongst men, and the putting an end to strife. These things now have respect to Christians also as private individuals, and hence the oath itself by which we establish truth and fidelity likewise has respect to them. Fourth, what are the things concerning which we are to make oath, or what oaths are lawful and what unlawful? Only such oaths are lawful, as are evidently not opposed to the word of God, and which are made concerning things true, certainly known, lawful, possible, weighty, necessary, useful, and worthy of such and so great a confirmation, or of such things as require a confirmation for the glory of God and the safety of our neighbor. It is only in reference to such things that it is lawful for us to make oath. Unlawful oaths are such as are plainly in opposition to the word of God, and made in reference to things which are either false, uncertain, unlawful, impossible, or light and trifling. Of such things no one should make an oath, for he who makes oath in reference to things which are false calls God to witness a lie. He who swears concerning things uncertain makes oath with an evil conscience and with contempt of God, inasmuch as he has the presumption to make God a witness of something of which he has no certain knowledge whether it be true or false. He who swears in this way has but little concern whether he makes God a witness of what is truth or falsehood, and yet at the same time he desires that God will either give testimony to a lie, or, if he will not be a witness of what is false, that he will punish him making an oath. He who makes oath concerning things unlawful calls upon God to approve and sanction what he has forbidden in his law, and so makes God contradict himself, because he desires that God may punish him if he does what he commands, or if he does not do what God has forbidden. And still further, he who swears in this way either purposes to act contrary to the command of God, or, if he swears sincerely, he calls God to witness a falsehood. He who swears in reference to things impossible is either beside himself or else trifles with God and men, since he cannot have a sincere purpose to do what he takes an oath to, or he swears hypocritically concerning a lie, viz. that he will do that which he neither will nor can do. Lastly, he who swears with levity is devoid of all proper reverence to God, and he who swears readily and thoughtlessly also readily forswears, or takes oath to what is false. The principal cause of an oath should be glory of God, and the public and private safety of our neighbor. Objection. We should not make oath concerning things that are uncertain, but future contingencies, such as those which men promise themselves that they will perform, are uncertain. Therefore, we should not swear in reference to things still future. Answer. As it respects future things, no one does, neither should he swear, respecting the event which is beyond our control. But, of our present will and purpose to do what is just and lawful, either now or hereafter, and of obligation, present and future, to do a certain thing, in reference to which every one may and ought to be certain. It was in this way that Abraham, Isaac, Abimelech, David, Jonathan, Boaz, etc., made oath, binding themselves to perform certain duties. Fifth, should all oaths be kept? Oaths which have been properly made concerning things lawful, true, certain, weighty, and possible, should necessarily be kept. For if any one once acknowledges and declares that he is justly bound to keep what he made oath to, and calls God to testify thereto, if he afterwards willingly or knowingly violates his faith or breaks his oath, he in so doing breaks a lawful bond, and so becomes guilty of perjury. The case, however, is different as it respects oaths which have been made unlawfully, either concerning things unlawful, or by error, or by infirmity, or against the conscience. These are not to be kept, but retracted and amended by repentance, and by not persisting in an evil purpose, and so adding sin to sin. He that sweareth to his own hurt, and changeth not. Psalm 15 verse 4. He who keeps an unlawful oath sins twice. He sins in the first place by making an oath wickedly, and in the second place by keeping that which was done unlawfully, according to the rule that which is sworn to wickedly, is worse when kept. What God forbids that he will not have us to keep, whether sworn to or not, and what he forbids us to promise, or to swear to, that he the more strictly forbids us to do, by as much as doing surpasses permitting. Those, therefore, who keep such oaths as have been wickedly made at sin to sin as Herod did, who put John the Baptist to death upon the pretext of keeping his oath, 
The same thing may also be said in reference to the vows of monks who have sworn to that which was idolatrous, or to an unholy single life. Objection 1. He who swears that he will do something which he has the power to do and yet does it not, makes God the witness of a falsehood. He now who makes oath that he will kill a certain person swears to what he has the power to execute. Therefore, he who takes an oath that he will kill anyone and yet does it not, makes God witness what is false. And as this ought not to be done, he should perform what he has sworn to do. Answer. We reply to the major proposition that it is true if it has respect to things which are lawful and possible, but it is false if it be understood of things which are unlawful, even though we may have the power to do them. The breaking of an oath which is unlawful is by no means making God witness a falsehood, inasmuch as it is right and becoming to retract or to refrain from doing what is evil, as is evident from the example of David who revoked the oath which he had made to destroy Nabal with his family, 1 Samuel 25 verse 22. Objection 2. The oath of peace which was made with the Gibeonites was contrary to the command of God. Joshua 9 verse 15. Therefore it is lawful to keep oaths which have been taken in reference to things which are unlawful. Answer 1. We deny that the oath which the princes of the children of Israel made was unlawful, for they were not forbidden to make peace with any of the nations which God had commanded to be destroyed. If it was desired by any of these nations, and they were willing to embrace the Jewish religion, which was the case as it respects the Gibeonites. 2. The objection also contains the fallacy of making that a cause which is none. The Israelites kept this oath, not because they felt themselves bound to do so, having been deceived when they made it, supposing that the Gibeonites had come from a far country, but one, that they might avoid offence, so that the name of God might not be reproached or evil spoken of among heathen nations, which might have been the case had they not kept the oath which they had made. Two, because it was lawful and proper to save those that sought peace and embrace the Jewish religion, even though there had been no oath taken in the case. From what has now been said in reference to keeping such oaths as are lawful, we may easily return an answer to the question, are such oaths as are extorted from persons by tortures, etc., to be kept? They are to be kept if they contain nothing that is unlawful, or, if they have the conditions which we have already specified as necessarily required in oaths that are proper, even though they may be disadvantageous and injurious to us. But no one should feel himself bound to keep such oaths as are evidently wrong, nor should we suffer such oaths to be extorted from us by any tortures, we should rather suffer death. Yet, if such unlawful oaths are extorted from anyone by fear, or by infirmity against the conscience, they bind no one to keep them, and should be retracted because what it is wrong for us to do, that it is wicked to swear to, nor must we add sin to sin. But if such oaths as are lawful are extorted from any one, that is, if they be concerning things lawful and possible, even though they be burdensome and disadvantageous to us, yet they should be kept. Should any impossibility, however, afterwards arise, they should in that case not be kept, but be revoked. But if no such impossibility arise, they should be kept, that so the greater evil may be avoided, for we are bound by the law of God to choose that evil which is less. If it is just for any one to do what he has promised, being compelled thereto, it is in like manner just to promise by oath to do it. For what it is lawful for any one to do, that it is also lawful for him to promise to do by oath, as if any one falling into the hands of a robber should find himself compelled to promise by oath a sum of money, and in addition to this take oath to keep the matter secret as a ransom for his life. Here it is not only lawful but also proper, if the thing is at all possible to be done, to make oath of both to the robber and to keep the oath that he may save his life. For what is lawful to take an oath in regard to, the same is also lawful to be done and contrarywise. Objection. No one should take an oath in regard to what would be injurious to the commonwealth, and if such an oath be taken, it should not be kept. But to make oath of secrecy to a robber is injurious to the commonwealth, therefore such an oath should not be made, and if made should not be kept. Answer. 1. What is injurious to the commonwealth should not be promised, in case the withholding of such a promise do not endanger our lives, and in case the person placed in such circumstances of danger be not rather bound to consult his own personal safety than to come to such a decision. 2. We also deny the minor proposition because to make such a promise to a robber and to keep it when made is rather profitable than injurious to the commonwealth, inasmuch as the life of him who promises secrecy by an oath under such circumstances is by this means preserved, which is an advantage to the commonwealth, 
whereas, if he had not by an oath promised secrecy to the robber threatening him with death, he might have been slain, and so have been lost both to the commonwealth and himself. Hence to promise secrecy by an oath to a robber should rather be preferred inasmuch as this is a less evil to the state than that a member thereof should be slain. End of section 62 Section 63 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fourth Commandment. 38th Lord's Day, Question 103. What doth God require in the Fourth Command? Answer, first, that the ministry of the Gospel and the schools be maintained, and that I, especially on the Sabbath, that is, on the day of rest, diligently frequent the Church of God to hear His word, to use the sacraments, publicly to call upon the Lord and contribute to the relief of the poor as becomes a Christian. Secondly, that all the days of my life I cease from my evil works and yield myself to the Lord to work by His Holy Spirit in me, and thus begin in this life the eternal Sabbath. Exposition. The fourth commandment consists of two parts, a commandment and a reason of the commandment. The commandment is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, in it thou shalt do no manner of work, etc., of this again there are two parts, the one moral and perpetual, as that the Sabbath be kept holy, the other ceremonial and temporary, as that the seventh day be kept holy. That the first part is moral and perpetual is evident from the end and the causes of the commandment which are perpetual in their character. The end or design of the commandment is the maintenance of the public worship of God in the church, or the perpetual preservation and use of the ecclesiastical ministry. God designs that there should at all times be a public ministry of the church and that there should be assemblies of the faithful to which his doctrine may be preached. The objects which God designs by this means to accomplish are one, that he may be publicly praised and worshipped in the world, two, that the piety and faith of the elect may be stirred up and confirmed by these public services, three, that men may by this means mutually strengthen each other in the faith of the gospel and provoke one another to love and good works. 4. That agreement in the doctrine of the Church and in the worship of God may be preserved and perpetuated. 5. That the Church may be visible in the world and be distinguished from the rest of mankind. Inasmuch now as these reasons do not have respect to any particular time, but to all times and conditions of the Church and world, it follows that God will always have the ministry of the Church preserved, and the use thereof respected, so that the moral part of this commandment binds all men from the beginning to the end of the world to observe some Sabbath, or to devote a certain portion of their time to sermons, public prayers, and the administration of the sacraments. That the other part of the commandment is ceremonial and not perpetual is evident from the fact that the Sabbath of the seventh day was, in the promulgation of the law, instituted of God for the observance of the Mosaic worship, and given to the Jews as a sacrament, or a type of the sanctification of the church, by the Messiah who was to come. As it is said, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you, throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify them. Exodus 31 verse 13 Ezekiel 20 verse 12. Hence the Sabbath, in as far as it has respect to the seventh day, was, together with other ceremonies and types, fulfilled and abolished by the coming of the Messiah. So much briefly concerning the commandment itself. The reason of the commandment is contained in these words, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, the reason which is here given is drawn from the example of God's resting on the seventh day from the work of creation which he had accomplished in six days. It has respect, therefore, properly to the circumstance of the seventh day, or to that part of the commandment which is ceremonial. Yet the intimating of that rest to which God invites us is not only ceremonial, and so having regard to the Jews, but also moral or spiritual, being signified by the ceremonial, in which respect it belongs to all men that the commandment itself, together with the reason that is annexed to it, may be better understood, we shall now explain very briefly the words of both, after which we shall explain those subjects which fall naturally under this part of the Catechism. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What and how manifold the Sabbath is will hereafter be explained. The language which is here used is most emphatic, 
God speaks as if the thing concerning which he gives a command were of the greatest importance. Remember that thou keep holy, as if he would say, Thou shalt observe the Sabbath day with great care and conscientiousness. God commands elsewhere that he who would violate the Sabbath should be put to death. The reasons on account of which God commands such a careful observance of the Sabbath are, one, because a violation of the Sabbath is a violation of the whole worship of God. A neglect of the ministry of the church leads most easily and directly to a neglect and corruption of the doctrine and worship of God. Two, God, in exacting such a rigid and careful observance of the Sabbath, which was typical, would indicate thereby the greatness and necessity of the thing signified, which was the spiritual Sabbath. 3. Because God will have the external Sabbath to contribute towards beginning and perfecting in us that rest which is spiritual. Keep holy. To keep holy the Sabbath is not to spend the day in slothfulness and idleness, but to avoid sin and to perform such works as are holy. God is said to sanctify the Sabbath differently from what men do. God is said to sanctify the Sabbath because he institutes it for divine worship. Men are said to sanctify it when they devote it to the purpose for which God instituted it. Six days shalt thou labor. God allots six days for labor, the seventh he claims for divine worship, not that he would teach that the worship of God and meditation upon divine things is to be omitted on all other days beside the Sabbath, but, one, that there might not only be a private worship of God on the Sabbath, as at other times, but that public worship might also be observed in the church, two, that all those other works which men ordinarily perform, on the other days of the week, might give place to the private and public worship of God. Thou shalt do no manner of work. When God forbids us to work on the Sabbath day, he does not forbid every kind of work, but only such works as are servile, such as hinder the worship of God and the design and use of the ministry of the church. That this is the true sense of the command is evident from what is expressly said in other portions of the scripture. Ye shall do no servile work therein. Leviticus 23 verse 25 it is therefore only servile works which are prohibited by this commandment. Hence Christ, in the twelfth chapter of Matthew, vindicates his disciples from the charge of breaking the Sabbath day, when they plucked the ears of corn as they passed through the fields and ate, being unhungered, and also himself healed on the Sabbath day the man who had a withered hand. And in another place, Luke 14 verse 5 says that if an ox or an ass fall into a pit, there is no sin in drawing them out on the Sabbath day. Maccabeus also carried on war on the Sabbath day, and in the first book of Maccabees, chapter 2, verses 40 and 41, there are reasons given in justification of this and similar works on the Sabbath day. If we all do as our brethren have done and fight not for our lives and laws against the heathen, they will now quickly root us out of the earth. At that time, therefore, they decreed, saying, Whosoever shall come to make battle with us on the Sabbath day, we will fight against him. Neither will we die all as our brethren that were murdered in secret places. So Christ defended his disciples and himself in the place already referred to, citing a passage out of the book of Hosea. If ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. Again, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Matthew 12 verse 7, Mark 2 verse 27. Christ here teaches that ceremonial works must yield to such as are moral, so that ceremonies should rather be omitted than works of love, which our own necessity or that of our neighbor requires. Hence he says, Have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Matthew 12, verse 5, John 7, verses 22 and 23. These declarations teach that such works as do not hinder or interfere with the proper use of the Sabbath, but which, on the other hand, rather carry out its true intention and so establish it, as all those works do which pertain to the worship of God, or religious ceremonies, or to the duty of love towards our neighbor, or to the saving of our own or the life of another, as that necessity will not allow them to be deferred to another time, do not violate the Sabbath, but are especially required in order that we may properly observe it. Neither thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter. God will have our children and families to cease from labor on the Sabbath for two reasons. One, chiefly, that they may be instructed and trained up by their parents in the worship of God, and may be admitted to the privileges of the church, for God will have them also to be members of his church. 
too, because he designs that love and benevolence towards our neighbour should especially be exercised and shown on the Sabbath day. Nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. God commands that even the strangers who might be found among the Israelites should not work on the Sabbath day, and this he does upon the ground that, if they were converted to the true religion, they were members of the church, and if they were unbelievers, he commands it, not on their own account, but on account of the Israelites, lest by their example they should give offence to the church, or lest their liberty might be an occasion to the Jews to accomplish through them the things which they themselves were not permitted to do on the Sabbath day, and in this way practice deception in relation to the law of God. We may here return an answer to the three following questions. 1. Were other nations also bound to observe the ceremonies which were instituted particularly for the Jews, if any of them lived among the Israelites? 2. Was it possible or proper to constrain those who were aliens from the church to embrace the Jewish religion? 3. Were the sacraments, among which the Sabbath was enumerated, to be given in common to the unbelievers and the church? To the first and second of these questions we reply that the strangers who lived among the Jews were not bound or compelled to conform to all these ceremonies, nor to the Jewish religion itself, but only to such external discipline as was necessary for the purpose of avoiding offence to the church in which they lived. A magistrate ought to be a defender of order and discipline among his subjects, as it respects both tables of the Decalogue, and to guard against and prohibit open idolatry and wickedness, and ought also to avoid, as far as it is possible, all offences and occasions to sin that may be given to his subjects by foreigners and sojourners. Furthermore, there was a peculiar reason calling for a particular observance of the Sabbath, inasmuch as it was not then for the first time given to the Israelites when God gave them the law by Moses, but had been enjoined upon all men from the very beginning of the world by God himself, although this precept had been lost sight of by other nations, so much so that it was regarded as the greatest reproach which they could cast upon the Jews to term them Sabbatarians, which appellation was given to them on account of the rigid and exact observance which they paid to the Sabbath. We reply to the third question proposed, that the Sabbath was no sacrament to unbelievers, although they ceased from labor as well as those who worshipped God according to the Jewish faith, because the promise that Jehovah would be their sanctifier did not pertain to them nor were they required to abstain from their ordinary labour for an acknowledgment and confession of this promise, but merely for the sake of avoiding offence and cutting off all occasion to sin which might be given to the people of God by their labouring on the Sabbath day. Nor thy cattle. This furnishes still stronger proof that the Sabbath was no sacrament for such as did not believe, because even the cattle were required to have rest. This rest, however, as far as it has respect to cattle, is neither the worship of God, nor is it a sacrament, but it was commanded in respect to men, one, that every occasion for working on the Sabbath day might be cut off from men by forbidding them to have their cattle at work on that day, two, that in sparing their dumb beasts they might also learn how God would have them to possess and exercise kindness and equality towards their fellow men. For in six days the Lord made... The reason which is added to this commandment is drawn from the example of God's resting from the work of creation, and has respect to the ceremonial part of the commandment concerning the seventh day, as we have shown before, and rested on the seventh day. This means that God ceased to create any new works, the world being now perfect, and such as God desired it to be. God set apart this day to divine worship, one, that the rest of the seventh day might be a monument of the creation which he had accomplished, and of the constant care, preservation, and government which he has exercised of the works of his hands from that day, for his own glory and for the salvation of his people, and so might excite us to a consideration of these his works, and to praise and glorify his name for his benefits to mankind, on whose account God created and preserves all things. 2. That by the example of himself resting on the seventh day, he might exhort men, as by a most effectual and constraining argument, to imitate him, and so abstain on the seventh day from the labours to which they were accustomed during the other six days of the week. This imitation of God resting on the seventh day is twofold, ceremonial and moral, as has been shown. So our works also, from which we are required to abstain on the Sabbath, are of two kinds. Some are indeed commanded by God, but are, nevertheless, not to be done when their performance would interfere with or hinder the worship of God. The labours and duties which belong to the peculiar callings of men are of this sort. Others, again, are prohibited by God as sins. These works are all prohibited on the Sabbath, but by a difference which is threefold. One, works are forbidden in respect to something, viz. in as far as they hinder the ministry of the church or give offence. Sins are positively forbidden. 
2. Works are required to be omitted only on the Sabbath day, sins at all times. 3. Resting from labor is a type of resting or ceasing from sin, which is the thing signified. Of the Sabbath, having now given a brief explanation of the words of the commandment, that the doctrine of the Sabbath and its true sanctification may be better understood, we must still further consider, first, what and how manifold is the Sabbath, second, in what respect does it belong to us, third, why was it instituted, fourth, how is it kept holy and how profaned, first, what and how manifold is the Sabbath. The word Sabbath in the Hebrew Shabbat, Shebet, and Shabbaton means quietness, rest, or ceasing from labor. God so called the day which he set apart to his own public worship, one, because he himself rested on this day, or ceased to create any new works, although he did not cease to preserve that which he had created. Two, because the Sabbath is an image or type of the spiritual rest from sin which the faithful shall enjoy in the life to come. Three, because we also ought on this day to cease from all servile work that God may perform in us his works. Four, because our family and cattle ought also to rest. The Sabbath is, therefore, a time appointed for rest from external works, whether morally or ceremonially forbidden, that is, from sins, and from the labours of our callings which have respect to this life, and is also a time set apart for the performance of those things which belong to the worship of God. The Sabbath may be viewed in a twofold aspect, either as moral and internal, or as ceremonial and external. The moral and internal or spiritual Sabbath includes the study of the knowledge of God and of His works, with a careful shunning of sin and worshipping God by confession and obedience. Or we may define it more briefly as a ceasing from sin and a giving of ourselves to God to do such works as He requires from us. The Sabbath, although it ought to be perpetual in those who are converted, is nevertheless only begun in this life, and is called the Sabbath both because it is even now a true rest from the labours and miseries of this life, with a consecration of ourselves to the service of God, and also because it was formerly signified by the ceremonial Sabbath. I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Ezekiel 20 verse 12. But in the life to come, this Sabbath will be enjoyed perfectly and forever, and will consist in perpetually praising and glorifying God, being entirely freed and released from the cares and labours with which we are now perplexed and occupied. And it shall come to pass, that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Isaiah 66 verse 23. The ceremonial or external Sabbath is a certain time set apart in the church for the preaching of the word and for the administration of the sacraments, or for the public worship of God, during which time there is a suspension or abstinence from all other works. This external Sabbath possesses likewise a twofold character, being immediate and mediate. The former or immediate Sabbath was that which was instituted immediately by God himself and enjoined upon the church under the Old Testament dispensation. This Sabbath was again viewed in different aspects, as one, the Sabbath of days. This was every seventh day of the week, which was more particularly and properly called the Sabbath on account of God's resting from the work of the creation of the world, and on account of the rest which the people of God were required to observe on that day. Hence the Hebrews were accustomed to call the whole seven days or week the Sabbath or Sabbaths by a synecdoche. Matthew 28 verse 1 so it was also in regard to other festival days, as the Feast of the Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, Trumpets, and Fasts, etc., because the Jews upon these days were required to abstain from labor, and rest as much so as on the seventh day. 2. The Sabbath of months were the new moons. 3. The Sabbath of years was every seventh year in which the Jews were required to intermit the tillage of their fields, during which time they neither sowed their fields nor pruned their vineyards, here also, as in the former instance, the whole seven years were by a synecdoche called Sabbaths. Leviticus 25 verse 4, chapter 26 verse 35, chapter 25 verse 8. The immediate external Sabbath is that which God has instituted through the church under the New Testament dispensation which belongs to the first day of the week, which is called Sunday, or more properly the Lord's Day, which the Christian church has observed in the place of the seventh day from the time of the apostles in view of the resurrection of Christ, as appears from what the Apostle John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Revelation 1 verse 10. Or to express it more briefly, we may say that the ceremonial Sabbath is twofold, the one belonging to the Old, the other to the New Testament. The Old was restricted to the seventh day, its observance was necessary and constituted the worship of God. 
the new depends upon the decision and appointment of the church, which, for certain reasons, has made choice of the first day of the week, which is to be observed for the sake of order, and not from any idea of necessity, as if this and no other were to be observed by the church, concerning which we shall presently speak. A table respecting the distinction of the Sabbath. The Sabbath, or an abstinence from work, is either 1. Internal, moral, and spiritual, as rest from sin, or 2. External and ceremonial, instituted by God, either 1. Immediately in the Old Testament, as the Sabbath, 1. Of days, as the seventh day, or feast days, as the Passover, Pentecost, etc., or 2. Of moons, as the new moons, or 3. Of years, as every seventh year, or Two, immediately through the church in the New Testament as the Lord's Day. Second, in how far does the Sabbath belong to us? The Sabbath of the seventh day was appointed of God from the very beginning of the world to declare that men, after his example, should rest from their labours and especially from sin. This commandment was subsequently repeated in the law as given by Moses, at which time the ceremony, which had respect to the observance of the seventh day as a day of rest, was made a sacrament of sanctification, by which God declared that he would be the sanctifier of his church, or that he would pardon the sins of such as would believe, and receive them into favour on account of the Messiah promised to the fathers, and who would, at the appointed time, make his appearance in the world. The reason why the ceremonial Sabbath of the seventh day is now abolished is because it was typical, signifying the benefits of the Messiah, and admonishing the people of God of their duty. It was for the same reason that all the other sacraments, sacrifices, and ceremonies instituted before and after the giving of the law, were abolished by the coming of Christ, who fulfilled all that was signified by these things. But although the ceremonial Sabbath has been abolished in the New Testament, yet the moral still continues, and pertains to us as well as to others, for there is now just as much necessity for a certain time to be set apart in the Christian church for the preaching of God's word, and for the public administration of the sacraments, as there was formerly in the Jewish church, Yet we must not suppose that we are restricted or tied down either to Saturday, Wednesday, or any other day. The Apostolic Church, to distinguish itself from the Jewish synagogue, chose in the exercise of the liberty conferred upon it by Christ the first day of the week in the place of the seventh, because on that day the resurrection of Christ took place, by which the internal and spiritual Sabbath is begun in us. In a word, we are bound to the Sabbath, whether considered morally or ceremonially, as it respects that which is general but not as it respects that which is particular, or, in other words, there is a necessity that we should have a certain day on which the church should be instructed and the sacraments administered, yet we are not bound or tied down to any particular day. The Jews present the following objections against the abrogation of the ceremonial Sabbath. 1. The Decalogue is a perpetual law. The commandment respecting the Sabbath is a part of the Decalogue, therefore it is a perpetual law and should not be abolished. Answer, the Decalogue is a perpetual law, in as far as it is moral, but those things which were added to it for the sake of signification, or which may be viewed as limitations of the moral precepts of the Decalogue, were to be preserved merely to the coming of the Messiah. Objection 2. The commandments of the Decalogue pertain to all men. This commandment is one of the precepts of the Decalogue, therefore it pertains to all men, and so ought not to be abolished. Answer, the Decalogue is a perpetual law in as far as it is moral, but those things which were added to it for the sake of signification, or which may be viewed as limitations of the moral precepts of the Decalogue, were to be preserved merely to the coming of the Messiah. Objection 2. The commandments of the Decalogue pertain to all men. This commandment is one of the precepts of the Decalogue, therefore it pertains to all men, and so ought not to be abolished. Answer, we grant the argument in as far as it respects that which is moral, but this commandment is in part ceremonial, and in this respect does not pertain to us, although that which is general does. The reasons of this are evident. 1. Paul says, Let no man judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day. Colossians 2, verse 16. 2. The apostles themselves changed the Sabbath of the seventh day. 3. From the design of the law. It was a type of things that were to be fulfilled by Christ, viz. of sanctification, etc. Every type now must give place to its antitype, or to that which is signified by it. Again, the Jewish nation was by this means separated from the other nations of the earth, which separation was removed or taken away by Christ. 
Objection 3. The Lord says of the Sabbath, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, and an everlasting covenant. Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17. Therefore the Sabbath of the seventh day is perpetual, and never to be abolished. Answer 1. The ceremonial Sabbath was perpetual until the coming of Christ, who put an end to ceremonies by fulfilling them. 2. The Sabbath is to continue forever, as it respects the thing which is signified, which is a ceasing from sin and a rest in God. In this sense, all the types of the Old Testament are perpetual, even the kingdom of David itself, which was, nevertheless, overthrown before the coming of Christ. We may here refer the reader to what has already been said respecting the abrogation of the law under the third general division of the law, particularly the first and second objections. Objection 4. The laws which were given before the time of Moses were unchangeable. The precept respecting the setting apart of the seventh day as the Sabbath was given before the time of Moses, therefore it is unchangeable, even though we may grant that the Mosaic ceremonies were to be changed. Answer. The major proposition is particular, being true only as it respects those laws which are moral and not concerning those which are ceremonial. For even the ceremonies which were instituted by God before the time of Moses, which were types of the benefits which the Messiah was to procure, have been abolished by the coming of Christ, as is true of circumcision given to Abraham, and of the sacrifices which our first parents were commanded to offer. Objection 5. The laws which God gave before the fall are binding upon all men, and were not types of the benefits of the Messiah, inasmuch as the promise respecting the Messiah was not then given, and there was one and the same condition pertaining to the whole human race. But God had already set apart the seventh day as a day of rest, before the fall of our first parents, therefore this commandment is universal and perpetual. Answer. The major proposition is true as it respects the moral law, some natural conceptions and principles of which were impressed upon the mind of man in his creation, but not as touching the observance of the seventh day, which after the fall was made in the law of Moses a type of the benefits of the Messiah, and was therefore, as other ceremonies which were then instituted or instituted at an earlier period, made changeable by the coming of Christ, for God will not permit the types and shadows of certain things to remain any longer in force, when the things which they signify become real. Hence, although we grant that the exercises of divine worship were to have been observed upon the seventh day, according to the command of the Decalogue, as well as if men had never sinned, as now, since they have sinned, yet after God had placed the observance of this particular day among those things which were shadows of the benefits of the Messiah which was to come, by the new law which was given to Moses, it became changeable with other ceremonies. Objection 6. If the cause of any law be perpetual, the law itself must be perpetual. The remembrance and celebration of the creation of all things, together with meditation upon the works of God, is a perpetual cause, calling for the observance of the seventh day as the Sabbath. Therefore the law respecting the observance of the seventh day as the Sabbath is unchangeable, even after the coming of Christ. Answer. We must here again make a distinction in replying to the major proposition that law is indeed unchangeable by reason of an immutable cause, provided that cause or end necessarily and constantly requires this law as an effect or as a means, but not if at other times the same end may be more successfully reached by other means, or in case the lawgiver may accomplish it as well by another law but we may meditate upon the works of God and magnify his power and goodness as they appear in them upon any other day, as well as upon the seventh day. Therefore this cause does not demand a perpetual law respecting the observance of the seventh day as the Sabbath. The Anabaptists bring as an objection against the observance of the first day of the week or the Lord's Day those passages of Scripture which forbid any distinction being made between days under the New Testament. Let no man judge you in respect to an holy day, Ye observe days and months and times and years. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it, etc. Colossians 2 verse 16, Galatians 4 verse 10, Romans 14 verse 6. Therefore, say they, the observance of the first day is as much condemned as that of the seventh. We reply to the antecedent that the scriptures do not simply or absolutely forbid Christians to make a distinction between days, but only when it is done with an idea of establishing ceremonial worship or of necessity. But it is not in this way that the church observes the Lord's Day or the first day of the week. The observance of the first day of the week on the part of Christians differs in two respects from the observance of the Jewish Sabbath. 
One, it was not lawful for the Jews, on account of the express command of God, to alter or change the Sabbath of the seventh day as being a part of the ceremonial worship. But the Christian church, in the exercise of her own liberty, sets apart the first or any other day to the ministry, without connecting with it any opinion of necessity or worship. Two, the ancient Sabbath was a type of things in the Old Testament which were to be fulfilled by Christ. But in the New Testament, that signification has ceased, whilst respect is had merely to order and propriety, without which the ministry of the church would either be no ministry, or at least not a properly constituted one. Third, for what was the Sabbath instituted? The ultimate ends for which the Sabbath was instituted are chiefly these. 1. The public worship of God in the church. 2. The preservation of the ecclesiastical ministry, which is an office divinely instituted, to give instructions to the church concerning God and his will, out of the holy scriptures delivered by the prophets and apostles, and to administer the sacraments according to divine appointment. This is a most important end, on account of which the Sabbath was instituted, inasmuch as the public and ordinary preaching of the gospel, in connection with the offering up of prayer, thanksgiving, and the use of divine rites, are public exercises, exciting and cherishing faith and repentance in the elect. 3. That it might be in the Old Testament a type signifying the spiritual and eternal Sabbath. I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Ezekiel 20 verse 12. 4. That the circumstance of the seventh day might remind and admonish men of the creation of the world, and of the duty of meditating upon the works which God made in six days. 5. That works of charity, liberality, and kindness might especially be performed towards our neighbour on this day. 6. For the sake of bodily rest, both to man and beasts, to beasts for the sake of man. 7. That men might by their example provoke one another to piety and the worship of God. I will declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Psalm 22, verse 22. 8. That the church might by this means be visible in the world, and be distinguished from idolaters and blasphemers, so that those who are yet out of the church may know to what communion they ought to attach themselves. The Sabbath now was a mark under the Old Testament by which the people Israel were distinguished and separated from other nations. Fourth, how is the Sabbath kept holy and how profaned, or what are the works commanded and forbidden on the Sabbath? The sanctification of the Sabbath consists in performing such holy works as God has commanded to be done on this day. So, on the other hand, the Sabbath is profaned either when holy works are omitted, or when such works are performed as hinder the ministry of the church, and as are contrary to the things which belong to the proper sanctification of the Sabbath. The works by which the Sabbath is sanctified, and those which are contrary thereto, being the ones by which it is profaned, are chiefly these. First, rightly to teach and instruct the church concerning God and his will. The teaching which is here enjoined is different from that required by the third commandment, for there the propagation of the doctrine of the church is made the duty of everyone privately, whilst here the office of teaching is committed to certain persons who, being divinely furnished with the gifts necessary for this calling, are lawfully called by the church to act in the capacity of teachers. This commandment now requires all those who are called to teach in the church faithfully to deliver and expound sound doctrine, both publicly to those who assemble together for the purpose of receiving instruction, and to everyone privately, as occasion and necessity may admit and require, all of which is done for public edification and for the salvation of each one individually. The following and similar passages of Scripture may here be appropriately cited. Leviticus 10 verse 11, Acts 13 verse 15, chapter 17 verse 2, 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, etc. The opposite of this includes one, an omission or neglect of the duty of teaching, whether privately or publicly, concerning which God complains through the prophet when he says, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Isaiah 56 verse 10, Ezekiel 34 verse 2. Second, to administer the sacraments according to divine appointment. This should likewise be performed by the ministers of the church, lawfully called for the purpose of attending to this duty. Yet we must not suppose that the administration of the sacraments is any more restricted and tied down to certain days and times than the preaching of the word. 
All that is necessary is that the administration should be public, that it should be done by the ministers of the church who bear a public character and represent God speaking with men. So circumcision was administered on any day which might be the eighth day after the birth of the child, whether it was the Sabbath or not. So baptism may be administered at any time, though the administration of the sacraments should take place chiefly on the Sabbath day. When ye come together in one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and prayers. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 20 and 33, Acts 2, verse 42. To the lawful administration of the sacraments is opposed an omission of this duty, or a neglect to exhort the church to a proper use of the sacraments. The same thing is also true in regard to such an administration of the sacraments as is unlawful, which is the case whenever anything is taken away from or added to those ordinances which have been divinely instituted, or when there is any change made in them, or when those are excluded from the sacraments who ought to be admitted and others are admitted who ought to be excluded, or when the people are not properly instructed in relation to their lawful use. Third, diligently to learn the doctrine of the church, which is to frequent the public gatherings of the saints for the purpose of hearing and learning the doctrine delivered from heaven, and having heard it, to meditate seriously upon it and inquire into its truth, but more especially to devote those days which have been set apart to the ministry and service of God in reading, in meditating, and discoursing upon divine things. These things are evident and follow naturally from their correlatives, for if God will have those whose duty it shall be diligently to teach on the Sabbath day, he also requires men diligently to hear and learn this doctrine which he reveals unto them through his servants, and to accompany this hearing with private meditation, as in the case of the Bereans, of whom it is said, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. Acts 17 verse 11. Such a study of the doctrine of the church is, however, especially necessary for those who either now or hereafter may be called to minister to the church in the capacity of teachers, Hence it is that the Apostle exhorts Timothy to give attendance to reading, to exhortation and doctrine. 1 Timothy 4 verse 13 The opposite of such a diligent study of the doctrine of the Church shows itself in the lowest and most common form, one in a contempt and neglect of this doctrine, which may be said to take place whenever men absent themselves from the public assemblies of the Church without any just hindrance or excuse, and attend to such things on the Sabbath day as could easily be deferred, or when they appear in the church among the worshippers of God, without giving a proper hearing or attention to the sermons which are delivered, or when they do not meditate upon and inquire into the truth of the doctrine of God's word. 2. A neglect to obtain a knowledge of the teachings of the church from those who are called of God to the study of this doctrine, or who may hereafter devote themselves to the work of spreading a knowledge of God and his will, and who may have a greater opportunity and ability of imparting a knowledge of this doctrine than others, for unto whomsoever much is given, of him much shall be required. Luke 12, verse 48. 3. Curiosity, which is a desire to know or hear those things which God has not revealed, which are unnecessary and new. For men to search their own glory is not glory. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. Proverbs 25, verse 27, 2 Timothy 2, verse 23, chapter 4, verse 3. See also 1 Timothy 4, verse 7, Titus 3, verse 9. Fourth, to use the sacraments according to divine appointment. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, etc. Acts 20, verse 7. So God commanded that the Passover should be observed in a solemn assembly of the people, and assigned certain sacrifices to the Sabbath and other holy days, and as God will have his word publicly preached and heard, so he will also have the true and lawful use of the sacraments observed and seen in the public assemblies of the church, inasmuch as both are marks by which the true church may be known and distinguished from all other religions and people. The sacraments also, just as the word, constitute a part of the public worship of God in the church, and are means to stir up and cherish faith and godliness in the faithful. 
Hence the use of the sacraments is most intimately connected with a proper observance and sanctification of the Sabbath. To such a lawful use of the sacraments there is opposed, one, a neglect and contempt of the sacraments, two, a profanation of the sacraments, as when they are observed in a manner different from what God has commanded, or by those for whom they were not instituted, three, a superstitious use of the sacraments, as when salvation and the grace of God are tied to the observance of the rites, or when they are directed to such ends as God has not appointed, the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man, he that sacrificeth a lamb is as if he cut off a dog's neck, etc. Genesis 17 verse 14, Isaiah 66 verse 3. Fifth, a public calling upon God in which we unite our own confession, thanksgiving, and prayer with the church, for God will not only be invoked by every one privately, but also publicly by the whole church, for his own glory and our comfort. It is for this reason that Christ has added a special promise to such prayers as are offered up publicly. If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Matthew 18 verses 19 and 20. It is not public prayer, but ostentation and hypocrisy, the counterfeit of true piety, that Christ condemns when he says, When thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Matthew 6 verse 6. That this is the true sense of these words is evident from what immediately proceeds, where Christ says, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street, etc. The difference between the invocation which is here enjoined and that which is enjoined in the third commandment consists in this, that this is public, having respect to the whole church, whilst that is private, having respect to each one individually. The extremes of this virtue are, one, a neglect or want of attention to the prayers of the church, Two, a hypocritical offering of prayer with the church when there is no heartfelt devotion. Three, a mere repetition of prayers without any edification to the church. For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 17. Sixth, charity and liberality to the poor, which consists in giving alms and performing works of love to the needy to sanctify the Sabbath in this way by showing our obedience to the doctrine of Christ. We may here appropriately cite the discourse of Christ concerning the Sabbath, in which he asked the Jews, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day, or to do evil? Mark 3 verse 4. And although God will have us to observe this Sabbath during our whole life, yet he desires that we give an example and evidence of it, especially at such times as are allotted for teaching and studying his word. For if anyone shows no disposition to obey God when the doctrine of God's word sounds in his ears, and when, free from other cares, God commands us to give ourselves to the contemplation of godliness and repentance. He declares by such indifference that he will much less do it at other times. Hence it has always been the practice of the church to bestow alms upon the Sabbath day and to perform acts of charity towards those who need our help and sympathy. Send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy unto the Lord. Nehemiah 8 verse 10 the opposite of this virtue shows itself in a neglect and contempt of the poor, and in giving our alms for the sake of being seen of men, which Christ condemns. Seventh, the honour of the ecclesiastical ministry, which embraces many particulars, among which we may mention, one, reverence, which consists in an acknowledgment of the divine order and will in the institution and preservation of the ministry, in gathering the church by means of it, and in the declaration of this our judgment concerning the ministry, both in word and deed. Let a man so account of us, as of the ministers of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20. 2. Love, by which we willingly frequent the gatherings of the church, hear and study the doctrine of Christ, and desire and pray for every needful blessing to rest upon the faithful ministers of the church, not merely in view of the duty of love which we owe to them, but also on account of the office which they discharge. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even thirsteth for the courts of the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go unto the house of the Lord. Psalm 84 verses 1 and 2, 
Psalm 122, verse 1. 3. Obedience in those things which belong to the ministry. Obey them that have the rule over you. Hebrews 12, verse 17. The works of love to God and our neighbor, including the entire life of the Christian, which is the spiritual Sabbath, fall properly under this head, for to observe the spiritual Sabbath is nothing else than to obey the voice of God, speaking to us through the ministry of the church, in regulating and directing the life. 4. Gratitude, which includes such duties as pertain to the preservation of the ministry and of ministers, for if God designs that there should be a ministry, he also designs that it should be perpetuated, and that everyone contribute to the extent of his ability to the accomplishment of this object. We may here appropriately cite the laws of Moses respecting the firstborns, the firstfruits, tithes, and many other offerings which were given to the priests and Levites, by way of compensation, that so they might give themselves wholly to their work without any distraction, and although the circumstances of these laws have been abolished, yet the general principle which lies at the bottom will continue forever, because God will have the ministry of the church maintained to the end of the world. Take heed to thyself, that thou forsake not the Levite as long as thou livest upon the earth, who goeth a warfare at any time at his own charges, who planteth a vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof, who feedeth a flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock, etc. Deuteronomy 12, verse 19, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 7, see also Galatians 6, verse 6, 1 Timothy 5, verse 17, Matthew 10, verse 14. The maintenance of schools may be embraced under this part of the honour which is due to the ministry, for unless the arts and sciences be taught, men can neither become properly qualified to teach, nor can the purity of doctrine be preserved and defended against the assaults of heretics. 5. Moderation and allowance in bearing such infirmities and imperfections of ministers as do not greatly and evidently corrupt and impede the objects of the ministry and injure the church by giving offence. Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. 1 Timothy 5, verse 19. The opposite of all this is embraced in a contempt of the ministry of the church, which takes place when this ministry is abolished or is committed to persons unworthy of such a trust, or when it is not acknowledged as the means which God will employ for gathering the church. The same thing is likewise true when the ministers of the church are treated with contempt and reproach, when their teachings are heard but not practised in the life, when acts of charity are overlooked, and when it is made ineffectual by things of a trifling and wicked character. So there is a contempt of the ministry of the church when a sufficient and necessary support is withheld, or when it is not protected and defended, and when other duties of gratitude are not performed towards the ministers of Christ, when schools are not maintained and supported, when learning is neglected, and when, instead of making proper allowance for such defects of ministers as result from our natural weakness and imperfection, they are treated with contempt and derision. It is also in opposition to the use of the ministry and at the same time a contempt thereof whenever any one, by his advice, example, or other means, prevents his own family or others from attending upon the public instructions of the sanctuary. End of section 63section 64 of commentary on the heidelberg catechism by zacharias osinus translated by g w williard this librivox recording is in the public domain the ecclesiastical ministry concerning the ministry of the church having now seen that this fourth command sanctions and authorizes the public worship of god and so by consequence the ministry of the church together with the honour and use connected with it, it is necessary that we should here make some remarks in reference to the ministry, and in so doing we shall inquire, first, what is the ministry of the church? Second, for what end has it been instituted? Third, what are the grades of ministers? Fourth, what are the duties devolving upon the ministers of the church? Fifth, to whom should the ministry be committed? First, what is the ministry of the church? The ecclesiastical ministry is that office which God has instituted in his church, to which he has committed the preaching of his word and the administration of the sacraments according to divine appointment. The ministry of the church includes, therefore, these two things, the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments. Second, for what has the ministry of the church been instituted? 
The reasons for which God instituted the ministry of the church are, one, the glory of God. God will not only be praised and called upon by men privately, but also by the public voice of the whole church. Bless ye God in the congregations, Psalm 68, verse 26. Two, that it may be a means or instrumentality by which men may be converted to God. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, etc. 3. That God might in this way accommodate himself to our weakness and infirmity in teaching men by men. 4. That men might provoke one another by their example to godliness and to the praise and worship of God. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. Psalm 22 verse 22. 5. That God may thus show his mercy, in that he commits to the hands of men that great work, the ministry of reconciliation, which the Son of God himself discharged. 6. That the church may be visible in the world, that so the elect may know to what they ought to attach themselves, and that the reprobate may be rendered perfectly inexcusable, in that they despise and endeavour to make ineffectual the voice and call which God addresses in their hearing. But, I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. Romans 10, verse 18. See also 2 Corinthians 2, verses 14, 15, and 16. Third, what are the grades or degrees of ministers? Some ministers are called immediately by God, whilst others, again, are called immediately by the church. Prophets and apostles have been called in the way first mentioned, Prophets were ministers called immediately by God for the purpose of teaching and expounding the doctrine of Moses and the promises respecting the Messiah, to reprove and do away with the corruptions and errors in the church and state, and to utter predictions respecting the church and the world, having the testimony and assurance that they could not err in the doctrines which they delivered in the name of God. Apostles were ministers called immediately by Christ to publish the doctrine respecting the Messiah already come in the flesh, and to spread it throughout the whole world, having a similar testimony from God that they could not err in the doctrine. Ministers, called immediately, are one evangelists, who were assistants to the apostles, and were sent by them to teach and establish various churches. Two, bishops or pastors are ministers called by the church to teach the word of God and to administer the sacraments in particular churches. Three, Doctors or teachers are ministers called by the church to teach in certain churches. 4. Governors are ministers chosen by the judgment of the church for the purpose of exercising discipline and for managing those things necessary for the order and prosperity of the church. 5. Deacons are ministers chosen by the church to take care of the poor and to attend to the distribution of the alms of the church. 4. What are the duties devolving upon the ministers of the church? The duties of the ministers of the church include in general, 1. A faithful and correct exposition of the true and uncorrupted doctrine of the law and gospel, so that the church may be able to understand it. 2. A lawful administration of the sacraments according to divine appointment. 3. To give the church a good example of what constitutes a Christian life and godly conversation in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, Titus 2 verse 7. 4. A diligent attention to their flocks. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, Acts 20 verse 28. 5. To give proper respect and submission to the decisions of the church. 6. To see that proper respect and attention be given to the poor. Fifth, to whom should the ministry be committed? The Apostle Paul plainly teaches in his epistles to Timothy and Titus to whom and to what persons the ministry ought to be committed by the church. To sum up the whole, in a few words we may say that the ministry of the church should be committed, one, to men and not to women, I suffer not a woman to teach, 1 Timothy 2 verse 12, two, to such as have a good report within and without the church, a bishop must be blameless, have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. 1 Timothy 3 verses 2 and 7. 3. 
to such as are able to teach, having a proper understanding of the doctrine, and possessed of such gifts as are necessary for its exposition, a bishop must be apt to teach, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, holding fast the faithful word, as he hath been taught, that he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers, 1 Timothy 3 verse 2, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, Titus 1 verse 9. End of section 64section 65 of commentary on the heidelberg catechism by zacharias asinus translated by g w williard this librivox recording is in the public domain concerning ceremonies a part of this fourth commandment being ceremonial as has been shown in the remarks we have made it seems proper that we should here make some remarks respecting ceremonies and for a better understanding of the whole subject we shall inquire first what are ceremonies second in what ceremonies differ from moral works third how many kinds of ceremonies are there fourth is it lawful for the church to institute ceremonies first what are ceremonies the romans were wont to call every form of divine worship by the name of ceremony from the town sere in which the images of the gods were kept from the gauls as livy testifies in his fifth book Macrobius derives the term from carenda, as understood by the church, all external and solemn actions instituted by the ministry for the sake of order or signification are termed ceremonies. Second, in what do ceremonies differ from moral works? Ceremonies differ from moral works in the following particulars. 1. Ceremonies are temporary, moral works are perpetual. 2. Ceremonies are always observed in the same way, moral works are not always performed in the same way three ceremonies signify moral actions are signified four the moral is to be viewed as the general the ceremonial as the particular five the moral is the end and design of the ceremonial the ceremonial contributes to the moral we may here refer the reader to what has already been said in regard to these differences under the subject of the law third how many kinds of ceremonies are there? There are two kinds of ceremonies, some that are commanded by God himself, and others that are instituted by men. Ceremonies which have been instituted by God are such as constitute his worship, and can only be changed by God himself. Sacrifices, by which we offer and render obedience to God, are ceremonies of this sort, being divinely instituted. So the sacraments, by which God testifies and bestows his benefits upon us, are also divinely instituted. Ceremonies instituted by the church are not the worship of God, and may be changed by the advice of the church, if there are sufficient causes to demand a change. Fourth, is it lawful for the church to institute ceremonies? The church may and ought to institute certain ceremonies inasmuch as the moral worship of God cannot be observed without defining and fixing the various circumstances connected with it. We may therefore say that it is proper for the church to institute ceremonies when the following conditions are observed. 1. They must not be unholy, but such as are agreeable to the word of God. 2. They must not be superstitious such as may easily lead men astray, so as to attach to them worship, merit, or necessity, and which may occasion offence when observed. 3. They must not be too numerous, so as to be oppressive and burdensome. 4. They must not be empty, insignificant, and unprofitable, but tend to edification. End of section 65 Section 66 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fifth Commandment. Thirty-ninth Lord's Day. Question, what doth God require in the Fifth Command? Answer, that I show all honour, love, and fidelity to my father and mother, and all in authority over me, and submit myself to their good instruction and correction with due obedience, and also patiently bear with their weaknesses and infirmities, since it pleases God to govern us with their hand. Exposition. The laws of the second table of the Decalogue now follow. 
the obedience of which has respect to God as well as the commandments of the first table. The works, however, which are herein joined are performed immediately towards men. The immediate object of the second table is our neighbor, whilst God is the immediate object. Christ embodies the sum of the obedience required by the second table of the Decalogue in these words, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, and lays down this rule for the better understanding of the precepts of this table, All things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Matthew 7 verse 12. Christ also says in reference to the whole second table, and the second is like unto the first, Matthew 22 verse 39, which must be understood, one of the kind of worship which is enjoined in each table, which is spiritual and more important than that which is ceremonial. Two, of the same kind of punishment which is threatened and inflicted upon all those who violate the commandments of either table, which punishment is eternal. Three, of the inseparable connection which exists between the love of God and our neighbor, which connection is like that of cause and effect, so that the one cannot be without the other. Obedience to the second table is therefore necessary and exacted from us by God, just as much as obedience to the first table. The reasons of this are such as these. 1. That God himself may be worshipped by this obedience, and that our love to him may be manifested by the love which we cherish towards our neighbour on God's account. 2. That our conformity with God may be made manifest by the love which we have towards our neighbour. 3. That human society may be preserved, which was formed and constituted by God for the praise and glory of his name. This fifth commandment, moreover, respecting the honour due to parents, which Jerome expressly calls the fifth in order, is placed first in the second table, one, because it is the foundation, cause, and bond of obedience to all the other commandments belonging to this table, for if the obedience can be maintained and enforced, which is due from those who are placed in subjection to their superiors, who should command and preserve in the name of God, obedience to the commandments which follow this precept of the Decalogue, then will obedience to all the other precepts necessarily follow. 2. Because God has connected with this commandment a special promise of long life, which is always regarded as a great blessing to those who render obedience to this precept of the Decalogue. This commandment consists of two parts, a command and a promise. The command is honour thy father and thy mother. The design or end of this commandment is the preservation of civil order, which God has appointed in the mutual duties between inferiors and their superiors. Superiors are all those whom God has placed over others for the purpose of governing and defending them. Inferiors are those whom God has placed under others that they may be governed and defended by them. Superiors are included in this commandment under the terms father and mother, and are 1. Parents themselves, from whom we have proceeded, 2. Tutors and guardians of children, 3. Schoolmasters, teachers and ministers of the gospel, 4. Magistrates, whether high or low, 5. Elders. All these persons now, together with all others who may be placed in positions of authority, are comprehended under the term parents, as used by this commandment, and are to be honoured by us because God gives them all to us in the place of parents, whose duties they discharge and are, so to speak, God's vice-regents in ruling and defending us, having been substituted by God in the room of parents when the wickedness of men began to increase in the earth. God, in this commandment, makes mention of parents in preference to other governors, and requires that they should be honoured, one, because the paternal power and government was the first that was established among men, two, because this is, as it were, the rule and pattern according to which all other forms of government should be formed and exercised, three, because this form of government is the most agreeable to men, so that they readily submit themselves to it, four, because any and every contempt or disrespect shown to parents is a sin of the most grievous and aggravated character, and therefore condemned by God and punished most severely, inasmuch as the obligation to honour and obey them is of peculiar force and strength. This commandment, therefore, does not merely require that we honour and respect our parents, but all who are in authority over us, and requires also, on the other hand, obedience not merely from children, but from all inferiors of whatever rank or grade. So the duties which these two classes of persons owe respectively to each other are in like manner enjoined in this precept of the Decalogue, for when God requires parents to be honoured, he at the same time demands that they so discharge the duties of parents as to be worthy of honour. And in thus enjoining the duties which are devolving upon parents, he also enjoins the duties of all others in authority, 
inasmuch as they are all comprehended in the term parents as here used. So God in like manner enjoins the duties of children when he commands them to honour their parents, and not only of children, but of all others in subjection, since God will have all those who are in positions of authority honoured by those who are under them. We may now, in view of what has just been said, easily return an answer to this objection. God in this commandment merely requires that parents should be honoured, which is the duty of inferiors. Therefore, he here commands nothing respecting superiors. Answer, we deny the consequence, for we may retort the argument of our opponents and say, because God commands parents to be honoured, he also enjoins the duties which are devolving upon all those who are in authority, for when God gives the name to those who occupy positions of authority, he also grants them that from which they have the name, and if he desires them to be honoured, he also requires them to do such things as entitle them to honour and respect. And although it may sometimes be the case that wicked men are elevated to positions of authority who are not worthy of honour, yet the office must be distinguished from the persons who are invested with it, so that whilst we detest the wickedness of the men, we should nevertheless honour their office on account of its divine appointment and as they are to be honoured on account of their office, which is to rule their subjects according to the will of God, whose ministers they are, it is manifest that we must obey them only in as far as they do not go beyond the proper limits of their office. The promise annexed to this commandment is, that thy days may be long in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. God added this promise, one, that he might invite and urge us the more strongly to obey this precept by placing before us so great a benefit as a reward. Two, that he might in this way declare how highly he esteems those who honour their parents, and how severely he will punish all those who withhold this honour and respect. 3. That he might teach us how necessary obedience to this commandment is, inasmuch as it is a preparation and constraining motive of obedience to all the commandments which follow. Hence Paul, in referring to this promise, says that it is the first commandment with promise, by which he means that it is the first commandment which has the promise of any special or certain benefit, which God promises to bestow upon those who render the obedience which it requires. The blessing which God here promises is a long life upon earth. Objection 1. The first table has also a promise annexed to it. Therefore this commandment is not the first with promise. Answer. This commandment has a special promise, whilst the promise of the first table is general. Objection 2. But a long life does not seem to be a blessing in view of the miseries which are connected with this present state of being. Therefore, it is a useless promise. Answer, that a long life seems not to be a blessing comes to pass by an accident, for in itself it is a great blessing, although it is connected with much misery and suffering. To this, the following objections are brought forward. 1. A good connected with great evils is rather to be deprecated than desired. A long life now is connected with great evils. Therefore, it seems, on account of this accident, rather to be deprecated than to be desired. We reply that a good is to be deprecated if the evils connected with it are greater than the good itself, but God promises to the godly in connection with a long life a mitigation of the calamities to which we are here subject, and a long enjoyment of his blessings even in this life. Then, too, the constant worship and praise of God in this life is a blessing of such great value that the various calamities to which we are here subject are not worthy to be compared with it. Objection 2 but the wicked and disobedient are also often blessed with a long life, therefore it is not a blessing peculiar to the godly. Answer, a few exceptions do not overthrow a general rule, for the wicked and disobedient, for the most part, perish prematurely and suddenly. The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pluck it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. Whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. Proverbs 30, verse 17, chapter 20, verse 20. Again, temporal blessings are bestowed upon the godly for their salvation, and are therefore evidences of God's favour towards them, whilst they are conferred upon the ungodly, partly that they may be rendered inexcusable, inasmuch as they have been in this way called to repentance, and partly that the godly and the elect, who are mixed with them, may enjoy these things. Objection 3. But many obedient and godly children die at an early age and do not live to enjoy the blessing of a long life, therefore the promise is not universal. Answer. We may here reply, as we did to the former objection, that a few exceptions do not destroy the force of a general rule. The godly, for the most part, have the truth of this promise verified in their case. 
promises of temporal blessings, too, must be understood as making an exception respecting chastisements and the cross, and still further, an early translation to another and better life, even a heavenly life, is a most ample recompense for a long life. The obedience required by this commandment comprehends three parts. One, the proper virtues of superiors, or those who are placed in authority. Two, the proper virtues of inferiors, or those who are in subjection. Three, the virtues common to both. The proper virtues of superiors, distinguished according to their respective offices. The office and duties of parents require, one, that they should nourish and cherish their children, Matthew 7, verse 9, two, that they should defend their children from injuries, 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, three, that they should instruct or give them over to others, that they may be instructed and properly educated, Ephesians 6, verse 4, Deuteronomy 4, verse 9, four, that they should govern them by such discipline as belongs to the domestic constitution, Proverbs 13, verse 1, chapter 19, verse 18. The same duties are devolving upon guardians or tutors who occupy the place of parents. The faults or sins of parents in opposition to the duties just enumerated are, one, not to seek or provide the support and nourishment necessary for their children, or to bring them up in luxury and extravagance. Two, not to protect them from injuries, or not to accustom them to patience and gentleness, or to sin by manifesting an imprudent zeal and passion when small, or even no injuries are inflicted upon our children. 3. Not to educate their children, or to have no care to have them educated according to their own or their children's ability, or to corrupt them by their own evil example or bad instruction. 4. To raise their children in idleness and licentiousness, or not to correct them when necessity requires it, or to chastise them with greater severity than duty or the nature of the offence demands, and so to alienate their affections by too great severity and cruelty. The office of schoolmasters or teachers requires them, one, faithfully to teach and instruct the pupils committed to their care, seeing that they occupy the place of parents in this respect. Two, to rule and govern them with proper and suitable discipline, the same faults and sins which we have just enumerated as often attaching themselves to parents in the education and government of their children are the ones which are found in connection with schoolmasters and teachers. The duties of magistrates may be reduced to these heads, one, to require from their subjects obedience and external propriety according to both tables of the Decalogue, two, to enforce the precepts of the Decalogue by defending those who yield obedience to it and punishing those as are disobedient, three, to enact certain positive laws for the maintenance of civil order. By positive laws we mean such as determine and prescribe those circumstances which are necessary for the preservation of the order and honour of the state, and which contribute to the obedience which the law of God requires. four, the execution of the laws which they prescribe from time to time. There are two extremes in opposition to the duties of magistrates. The first is remissness, or a want of proper attention to their duties, which shows itself either in not requiring from their subjects obedience to the whole decalogue, or in not enacting such things as are necessary for the preservation and order of civil society, or in not defending the innocent from the wrongs which may be inflicted upon them, or in not enforcing or punishing too lightly those who violate the law of God, or such positive laws as have been enacted from time to time. The other extreme is tyranny, which consists either in demanding from their subjects what is unjust, or in not punishing those who sin, or in punishing them more severely than the offence which they have committed calls for. The duties of masters are, one, to enjoin upon their servants such things as are just and possible, or to command such works as are becoming and lawful, and not such as are unlawful, impossible, oppressive, and unnecessary. 2. To afford them proper food and reward for their labour. 3. To rule and govern them with such discipline as is suited to their case. The whip, fodder, and burdens belong to the ass, bread and correction to the servant. The faults of masters are 2. To indulge their slaves in idleness, slothfulness, and licentiousness. 2. To command things which are unjust, and to oppress them by exacting too much from them. 3. To withhold from them proper food and wages. 4. To exasperate their household by the exercise of too much rigour and severity. The duty of elders and others who excel in wisdom and authority is to govern and assist others by their examples, counsels, and admonitions. These persons sin and act contrary to the duties of their calling. 
one, when they are guilty of folly or of giving improper counsels, two, when they show levity and a want of gravity in their manners and present a bad example to others, three, when they neglect by their counsels and authority to reprove and correct others who are under them when they see them sin and do that which is wrong. The virtues proper to inferiors, or such as are in subjection, the commandment which we are now considering comprehends the duties which are proper to inferiors under the term honour, which includes first reverence to those who are over them, which is one, an acknowledgment of the will of God, who has been pleased to institute such an office, and to endow those who are invested with it with necessary gifts, two, an approbation of this divine order, and of the gifts which God confers upon those whom he calls to serve him in this capacity, for if we are not convinced of the excellency of this order, we will not honour it. 3. Subjection to this order, on account of the will of God. 4. An outward declaration, both in word and deed, of this judgment and approbation. Secondly, love to those who are over us, in view of the office which they fill. This love is closely connected with reverence, inasmuch as we cannot reverence those whom we do not love. Thirdly, obedience to what those in authority command, by reason of their office and calling, which obedience should be voluntary, as children delight to do those things which are pleasing to their parents. Fourthly, gratitude to superiors, which requires that every one in his appropriate sphere aid and promote the interest of those over him according to his ability and as occasion presents itself. Fifthly, moderation and forbearance, which shows itself in bearing with the faults and infirmities of parents and superiors, which may be done without any reproach to the name of God, or which are not in direct opposition to the divine law. From these things we may easily infer what duties are enjoined upon inferiors and what things in accordance with their own callings they owe to the different grades or ranks of those who are in authority. Inferiors or those who are in subjection violate the honour which is due to those who are over them, either when they do not regard them as occupying the place to which they have been called of God, or when they ascribe to them more honour than is becoming to men, or when they hate them for executing that which their office requires them to do, or when they esteem them more highly than they do God, or when they refuse to yield obedience to their just and lawful commands, or when they obey them only in appearance, and also when they command things which are unjust and wicked, or when they heap upon them injuries and reproaches, and do not aid them in such ways and by such means as are in their power, or when they entertain them with flattery and in other ways which are unbecoming, or when they magnify their infirmities and faults, or when they flatteringly praise their faults and misdeeds, and do not admonish them with becoming reverence according to the position which they occupy of their pernicious and aggravated sins. The virtues which are common to superiors and inferiors, or to those who are in authority and in subjection. The duties which are devolving upon all men, or the virtues which are here required of all the different grades and ranks of men, whether they be in authority or not, with the vices which are opposed to these virtues, are, first, universal justice, which shows itself in obedience to all the laws pertaining to us in our respective callings. That this virtue is here enjoined is evident, inasmuch as those who are in authority should demand it from their subjects, and provoke them to such obedience by their own example whilst those who are in subjection are commanded to yield obedience to all those commands which are just and proper. The opposite of this universal justice includes 1. Every neglect of such duties as just and wholesome laws require from every one, whether he be a ruler or subject. 2. All obstinacy, disobedience and sedition. 3. Hypocrisy and eye-service. Second, particular distributive justice, which is a virtue contributing to and preserving a just proportion in the distribution of offices, rewards, and punishment. Or, it is a virtue giving to every one that which rightfully belongs to him. That now which belongs to every one is the office, the honour, or reward which is suited to him, and for which he is adapted. Render to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. Romans 13 verse 7. The opposite of this virtue includes error, want of judgment, and particularity in distributing offices, or conferring honours, and in bestowing rewards. Third, laboriousness, diligence, and fidelity, which consists in correctly understanding those parts which properly and perpetually belong to every man's calling in life, and in performing them according to the command of God, cheerfully, constantly, diligently, and with the attempt to discharge properly every known duty, omitting whatever is foreign to anyone's appropriate calling, 
and whatever is unnecessary, with this chief design that whatever is done may be pleasing to God and contribute to the salvation of our fellow men, and that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. He that ruleth, let him do it with cheerfulness. Be obedient, as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 11, Romans 12 verse 8, Ephesians 6 verse 6, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10. It is also proper that we should here remark that this virtue does not merely consist in knowing what are the different parts of our calling and duty, but also in inquiring continually whether there be not something still required of us in which we are ignorant, for he who is ignorant of his duty, and yet does not seek to know it, is guilty of neglecting his duty, inasmuch as his ignorance does not excuse him, being voluntary and coveted. There is opposed to this virtue, one, negligence or slothfulness, which shows itself either in not endeavouring to find out what is duty, or in willingly omitting what is plainly required in our calling in life, or in discharging the duties of our respective callings unwillingly, only in part and without becoming diligence. Two, a mere show of diligence or dissembled assiduity, which consists in doing that which belongs to anyone's calling in life from selfish motives or for the sake of our own praise and benefit. 3. Curiosity which shows itself in meddling with and attempting things which do not properly belong to anyone's calling. 4. Love to those who are joined to us by consanguinity as parents, children, and relatives, for when God command that parents should be honoured, he also desires that they should be loved, and that as parents. And so, on the other hand, when he blesses persons with children, he designs that they should love them, and that not as strangers but as children. The opposite of this virtue includes 1. Unnaturalness, which either hates or does not cherish those who are allied to us by the ties of nature, or is not concerned for their safety. 2. Excessive indulgence, which shows itself either in winking at the sins and follies of our children and friends, injurious alike to themselves and others, on account of the love which we have towards them, or in gratifying them in things prohibited by God. 5. Gratitude, which is a virtue consisting of truth and justice, acknowledging from whom, what, and how great benefits we have received, and at the same time having a desire or will to perform in return such things and duties as are becoming and possible. Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. Proverbs 17 verse 13. The opposite of this virtue includes one ingratitude which either does not acknowledge or does not profess the author and the greatness of the benefits received, or which has no desire to make suitable returns for the same. Two, such returns or acknowledgments of benefits as are unlawful. Sixth, gravity, which is a virtue arising from a knowledge of our calling and rank in society, observing what is becoming and proper to the person, and maintains a constancy and evenness in the words, carriage, and actions of the life, that so we may preserve the authority and good report which we have, and not bring a disgrace upon our calling, for seeing that God desires that those placed in authority should be honoured, he at the same time desires that they themselves should guard and maintain their own honour. Now glory, being that of which our own conscience and that of others approves, judging correctly, since it is a virtue necessary for the glory of God and the salvation of men, is greatly to be desired when these ends are regarded." A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. A good name is better than precious ointment. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. Proverbs 21 verse 1, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 1, Galatians 6 verse 4, Titus 2 verse 7. We may mention, as opposed to this virtue, one, levity, which shows itself in a want of regard to what is becoming and of good report in the words, carriage, and actions of the life, and which has no desire to retain a good name and opinion amongst men. Two, haughtiness or ambition, which consists in being elated and filled with pride on account of the office and gifts which any one possesses and holds, so as to despise and overlook others, and to aspire after still higher offices and greater honour and applause from men, being actuated thereto merely by a desire to excel and be above others, and not to advance the glory of God and the welfare of our fellow men. 
Seventh, modesty as a virtue closely allied with gravity, which, from a knowledge of our own weakness, and from a consideration of the office and position which we occupy by divine appointment, maintains a consistency and propriety in the actions and deportment of the life, regardless of the opinions and remarks which men may make and entertain respecting us, with this design that we do not arrogate to ourselves more than is becoming, or defraud others of the respect and honour due them, that we do not make a greater display of our apparel, walk, conversation, and life, than is proper and needful, that we do not esteem ourselves more highly than others, or oppress them, but maintain a deportment according to our ability and strength, with an acknowledgment of God's gifts in others, and of our faults and imperfections. This and the former virtue are, as has just been remarked, closely allied, for gravity, without being joined with modesty, soon degenerates into ambition and haughtiness. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Galatians 6 verse 3. Humility and modesty differ from each other in this, that modesty is directed towards men and consists in acknowledging our own faults and the gifts of which others are possessed, whilst humility has respect to God. The following vices are opposed to this virtue. 1. Immodesty, which transcends the bounds of propriety in the words, actions, and deportment of the life, both as it respects ourselves and those with whom we hold daily intercourse. 2. Arrogance, which, in conceit and outward declaration, takes to itself more than it really possesses, or admires its own gifts and attainments more than there is any necessity of doing, and so extols and boasts of them beyond measure. 3. A counterfeiting, or mere show of modesty, which evinces itself in the admiration which any one has of himself, whilst he, nevertheless, feigns to be backward in accepting of honours and offices, which he all the while desires in order that he may advance his own praise and conceit of modesty. 8. Equity, which is a virtue that mitigates, in view of some just and probable cause, the rigour of strict justice in punishing and correcting the errors of others, and which endures with patience such defects as do not seriously injure and endanger the safety of our fellow men, whether publicly or privately, and which studiously covers and corrects such vices whenever they are found in others. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. 1 Peter 2 verse 18. We may here also appropriately cite the example of the sons of Noah, as recorded in the ninth chapter of Genesis, and likewise the commandment of the Apostle Paul, respecting the moderation and gentleness which, par which parents should exercise towards their children in correcting them. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Ephesians 6 verse 4, Colossians 3 verse 21 and 4 verse 1. The opposite of this virtue embraces 1. Immoderate rigour in censuring and reproving those faults which proceed for the most part from infirmity, without any serious injury, either to their own or others' safety. 2. Too great lenity, which shows itself in not punishing or reproving great and aggravated sins. 3. Flattery, which, for the sake of gaining popularity or advancing personal interests, praises that which ought not to be praised, or attributes more to a certain one than is becoming. End of section 66. Section 67 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sixth Commandment. Fortieth Lord's Day. Question 105. What doth God require in the Sixth Command? Answer. That neither in thoughts, nor words, nor gestures, much less in deeds, I dishonour, hate, wound, or kill my neighbour, by myself or by another, but that I lay aside all desire of revenge, also that I hurt not myself or willfully expose myself to any danger. Wherefore also the magistrate is armed with the sword to prevent murder. Question 106, but this command seems only to speak of murder. Answer. In forbidding murder, God teaches us that he abhors the causes thereof, such as envy, hatred, anger, and desire of revenge, and that he accounts all these as murder. Question 107. But is it enough that we do not kill any man in the manner mentioned above? 
Answer, no, for when God forbids envy, hatred, and anger, he commands us to love our neighbor as ourselves, to show patience, peace, meekness, mercy, and all kindness towards him, and prevent his hurt as much as in us lies, and that we do good even unto our enemies. Exposition The end or design of this commandment is the preservation of the life and health of the body, and so of the safety both of ourselves and of others. All those things, therefore, which have respect to the safety and preservation of our own life and the lives of others, are here enjoined. Whilst, on the other hand, everything is prohibited which tends to the destruction of life, which may be said to include every unlawful injury and every desire of inflicting a wrong which any one may cherish with every expression of this desire. It is called murder in this prohibition or commandment, not because God prohibits this alone, but that in removing the effect he may at the same time remove all the causes which contribute to it, and that embracing under the term murder all the sins which are connected with it, he may, by showing its aggravated character, the more effectually restrain us from these sins according to the rule that when any particular virtue is commanded or vice forbidden, the general virtues and vices, or whatever is connected with it, is at the same time commanded or forbidden. We must here show, one, that this commandment enjoins and forbids not only what is external, but also what is internal. Two, that it prohibits any injury done to ourselves or others. Three, that it requires us to defend ourselves and others. One, that this commandment prohibits and requires what is internal is proven, one, by this rule that when an effect is commanded or forbidden, the cause is also understood as being commanded or forbidden. Two, from the design of the commandment. God does not will that we should injure anyone, therefore he also forbids the means by which we might inflict a wrong upon anyone. 3. From the interpretation of Christ, whosoever is angry with his brother, without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. Matthew 5 verse 22. Hence the external murder there is prohibited, at the same time every wrong inflicted upon our neighbor, together with all the causes, occasions, and signs of these injuries, such as anger, envy, hatred, and desire of revenge. 2. This commandment prohibits every injury or neglect, not only to the lives of others, but also to our own life, inasmuch as the same causes are found in us, on account of which God will have us to regard the lives of others. These causes are 1. The image of God, which we may not destroy either in ourselves or in others. 2. The likeness of nature, and our common origin from our first parents, for as our neighbor must not be injured and hurt by us because he is bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh, so we are to inflict no wrong upon ourselves, for the reason that no man ever yet hated his own flesh. 3. The greatness of the price by which Christ has redeemed us and others. 4. The union or conjunction which there is between those who are members of Christ. Inasmuch now, as these causes are in like manner found in us, it follows that this commandment forbids every injury or neglect which any one may inflict upon himself. 3. The commandment requires us to protect and defend our neighbor, for seeing that the law commands us not only to shun and avoid sin of every description, but also to practice that which is opposite thereto, it is evident that God does not only here forbid us to injure the life and safety of any one, but commands us at the same time, as far as it is in our power, to cherish and defend our neighbor. The sum and substance of this commandment is that we neither hurt by any external act our own life or the life of another, nor practice any injury upon our own or the bodily safety of another, neither by force, nor treachery, nor negligence, and that we do not desire, either in thought or will, any injury to ourselves or others, nor signify the same by any signs or words, but that we, on the other hand, as much as in us lies, preserve and protect our own, as well as the lives of others, and so prove ourselves a blessing to all. Hence, when this commandment declares, Thou shalt not kill, it signifies, 1. Thou shalt cherish no desire to kill either thyself or others, for what God does not will us to do, that he does not permit us to wish or desire. 2. Thou shalt not express or signify any desire to murder either thyself or others, for when God forbids any particular desire, he also forbids every expression of this desire, whether it be in the words, gesture, or countenance of the person. 3. Thou shalt not put this desire into execution, for what God forbids any one to desire or to signify by external signs, 
that he much more forbids to be executed. The opposite now of all this is, Thou shalt aid and assist thyself and others, one, in desire or heart, two, in the signification of this desire, three, in the execution of this desire. From this, all the virtues of this commandment, as well as all the vices which are opposite thereto, take their origin. The vices which are forbidden in this precept of the Decalogue tend to the destruction of life, whilst the virtues which it enjoins tend to the preservation of life or the safety of men. There are two ways in which we may contribute to the preservation of life, either by not injuring or by rendering assistance to men. Hence there are two classes of virtues growing out of this commandment, the former including those which do not injure the lives and safety of men, the other including those which contribute to the preservation of life and the safety of men. The virtues included in the former class consist of three kinds, for we may not injure anyone, viz. either being not injured or provoked, or being provoked, or in both respects, whether provoked or not. Particular justice, which does wrong to no one, is included in the first. In the second, gentleness and equity. In the third, peaceableness. The virtues contributing to the safety of man are twofold, for we may be said to aid either by repelling evils and dangers, or by doing good. The first method includes commutative justice, fortitude and indignation. The other includes humanity, mercy and friendship. The virtues which do not injure the safety of men. First, particular justice injuring no one is that which does not injure the life or body of any one, neither from design nor from negligence, by whom we have not been injured unless God require it at our hands, or it is a virtue which carefully avoids every injury which might be inflicted upon our own or upon the safety of our neighbour, whether it be by violence, deceit, or negligence. This is expressed in the words of the commandment, Thou shalt not kill. That which is opposed to this virtue and condemned by this commandment includes one every injury which may be inflicted, either by design or by negligence, upon our own or upon the life and body of another, two excessive lenity by which it comes to pass that they are not punished who ought to be punished by those who are vested with the power to do so, second gentleness or placability and readiness to forgive, which is a virtue governing and controlling anger, is not provoked without any cause, nor by one that is trifling in its character, and where there is a cause of just displeasure, it does not desire the destruction of the person inflicting the wrong, but is indignant at the reproach which is cast upon the name of God, or at the injustice and injury inflicted upon our neighbour. It indulges no desire of revenging any injury, however great it may be, but heartily desires the safety and well-being even of enemies, and those who deserve ill at our hands, and endeavours to contribute thereto, according to its own ability and their necessity. Or it is a virtue which moderates anger and shows itself in shunning all unlawful excitement, and so moderates that anger which is lawful, that it does not pass beyond the limits which God has prescribed, and does not burn with a desire of revenge, but extends pardon even to enemies, notwithstanding their offences and provocations have been great and heavy, so that the anger which is felt is not directed to the persons, but to the sins of the wicked, and that too in such a way that it desires the safety even of those who transgress under the most aggravated form. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5 verse 5. The opposite of this virtue comprises 1. Undue lenity, which is not to be indignant in view of shocking injuries, and which does not restrain or punish them, or is at least too remiss in prohibiting and suppressing them. 2. Hastiness of temper, with every form of unlawful and immoderate anger. 3. Desire of vengeance, grudging and animosity. 3. Equity is a virtue closely allied to gentleness. It is the governess of stern justice preserves a just proportion between punishment and crime, upon just and probable causes, as when, in view of the crime itself, or our own duty, or the public and private safety of those who sin, or, for the sake of avoiding offence, we yield somewhat of our right in punishing sins, or in demanding satisfaction for injuries received. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Philippians 4 verse 5. The first thing which we may mention as opposed to this virtue is immoderate severity or cruelty, as when there is no proper regard to the circumstances under which men do wrong, concerning which it is said extreme right is extreme wrong. 
too. Too great lenity, which shows itself in not being influenced by those things which ought to influence us, as when God commands, etc. 3. Partiality. 4. Peaceableness, or a desire of peace and harmony, is a virtue which consists in diligently and carefully avoiding all unnecessary occasions and causes of offence, discord, strife, and hatred, and in reconciling those who are offended, either at us or at others, and which for the sake of retaining or preserving peace does not shrink from troubles or from the endurance of injuries, so long as there is no reproach cast upon the name of God, or grievous wrong inflicted upon our own safety or that of others. In a word, it is a virtue avoiding all offences and occasions of anger and discord, and which at the same time endeavours to remove and bring to an end such strifes and misunderstandings as arise from time to time. There is opposed to this virtue one quarrelsomeness, which shows itself in giving and seizing occasions of strife, to which there is attached an eager desire or delight in contention, slandering, backbiting, whispering, etc. Hence all contentious persons, slanderers, backbiters, whisperers, etc., are here condemned. 2. Such a lenity as when any one desires to keep peace without any proper regard to the glory of God, or his own and neighbour's safety, this is a sinful gratification. The virtues which contribute to the safety of men. 5. Commutative justice in punishing is a virtue which preserves an equality between offences and punishments, inflicting either equal punishments or less in view of just and satisfactory causes, having a proper regard to the circumstances which should ever be taken into consideration in civil courts for the sake of maintaining the glory of God and the preservation of human society. For when God forbids the infliction of any wrong upon society, and wills that the magistrate be the defender and preserver of order according to the whole decalogue, he also designs that those who manifestly and grossly violate this order be restrained and kept within the proper bounds by just punishments. The magistrate, therefore, may be guilty of doing wrong, not only in being cruel and unjustly severe, but also in being too lenient, and in granting permission to certain persons to injure others. Because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. He that killeth any man shall surely be put to death, Ye shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer, which is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. 1 Kings 20 verse 42, Leviticus 24 verse 17, Numbers 35 verse 31. This form of justice, therefore, belongs to this commandment. Objection. It is here said, Thou shalt not kill, therefore no one must be put to death. Consequently, this justice is not comprehended in this commandment, inasmuch as it cannot be maintained without putting many to death. Answer. Thou shalt not kill, that is, not thou who art merely a private person, according to thy judgment and desire, when I do not command thee and give thee any warrant from this law. But this does not do away with the office of the magistrate, for he is the minister of God and does not bear the sword in vain. Romans 13 verse 4. Hence when the magistrate puts wicked transgressors to death, it is not man but God who is the executioner of the deed. We may also reply to this objection by reversing the argument thus, Therefore some are to be put to death, lest human society be destroyed by thieves and robbers. The opposite of this virtue is 1. Cruelty, or too great severity, 2. Private revenge, 3. Lenity, when those are not punished who ought to be punished, 4. Partiality. Or to express it more briefly, we may say that the opposite of commutative justice is injustice, which either does not punish at all, or else punishes unjustly. 6. Fortitude is a virtue which braves such dangers as sound reasons require us to meet and encounter for the glory of God, the salvation of the Church and Commonwealth, and for the preservation and defence either of ourselves or others against grievous wrongs and oppressions. The fortitude of the saints springs from faith, hope, and the love of God and our neighbour. Heroic fortitude is a special gift of God, as in the case of Joshua, Samson, Gideon, David, etc., Warlike fortitude is the defender of justice and the undertaker of just defense respecting ourselves and others, although it is not accomplished without great danger. War is either a necessary defense against such as are guilty of robbery, cruelty, or oppression, or it is a just punishment for wicked outrages, which is undertaken by the force of arms by the ordinary power. 
the opposite of this virtue comprises timidity, which shows itself in flying from necessary dangers, and presumption or foolhardiness in rushing into dangers unnecessarily. Seventh, indignation or zeal is, from a love of justice and from a regard to our neighbour, to be indignant on account of some grievous or outrageous wrong inflicted upon the innocent, and which, according to the ability which any one possesses, endeavours to repel and revenge the wrong according to the commandment of God. Or it is a virtue which is justly provoked and indignant on account of reproach cast upon the name of God and on account of some grievous wrong by which either God or our neighbour is injured. There is opposed to this, one, unjust anger, two, lenity or remissness which shows itself when there is no just grief or indignation felt in view of grievous injuries, and when there is no disposition to avenge them. Eighth, humanity, or philanthropy, specially and properly so called, is a true and sincere goodwill and desire to perform towards men what we desire others to perform towards us, with a declaration of goodwill in such words, actions, and duties as are fit and becoming. Or it is benevolence in the mind, will, and heart towards others, and a declaration of it in such words, actions, and duties as are possible and proper. This virtue is likewise called in the Holy Scriptures the love of our neighbour. Philosophy terms it humanity. All men by this virtue perform towards others what they would desire others to perform towards themselves. Let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Galatians 6 verse 10. The opposite of this virtue comprises one inhumanity or moroseness, which either omits doing those things which humanity requires, or does the opposite. 2. Ill will or envy, which shows itself in grief at the good and prosperity of others, and in a desire to secure this good to itself, or at least to avert it from others, mir nicht, dir nicht. 3. Self-love with a neglect of our neighbour. 4. Unlawful gratification. Ninth, mercy is a grief felt in view of the calamities and misfortunes of the innocent, or such as fall through weakness and infirmity, with a desire and attempt to mitigate these calamities, or it is a virtue which pities good men in their calamities, or those who sin through ignorance or infirmity, and which desires to remove their misfortunes, or at least alleviate them as much as justice will admit of, and which rejoices not in the calamities, even of such as are our enemies. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Matthew 5, verse 7. There is opposed to this virtue on the side of want, one, a want of mercy, or cruelty and hard-heartedness, which is seen in not having compassion upon those whom we ought to commiserate, two, rejoicing in the calamities of others, and on the side of excess we may mention lenity as that which spares those whom God wills to be punished, which is a cruel mercy by which society itself is injured and also the person that is spared. Tenth, friendship, a species of humanity, is a true and mutual goodwill between good men, formed by a knowledge which each party has of the other's virtues, or by the performance of such duties towards each other as are becoming and possible. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Proverbs 18 verse 24. The extremes of friendship are 1. Enmity 2. Neglect of friends 3. Readiness in contracting and breaking friendship 5. Flattery 6. Unjust gratification A table of the sixth commandment The sixth commandment Thou shalt not kill, divided into, one, forbids every unlawful injury inflicted upon our own or our neighbour's life and safety. Our neighbour may be injured either, divided into, one, by forsaking him or by not assisting him according to our ability, which includes a neglect of the duties which are required for the preservation of life, two, by wronging or injuring him, which is done either, divided into, one, by external force or violence, as by 1. Murder, 2. Slander, 3. Injuries of every description, 2. By internal affections, such as 1. Anger, 2. Hatred, 3. Desire of revenge. The sixth commandment, Thou shalt not kill, divided into 2, commands the preservation of our own and our neighbour's life and safety, 
This is done either, one, by not injuring anyone, those ought not to injure others who are, one, not provoked, which belongs to justice, two, who are provoked, which is the province of gentleness and equity, three, whether provoked or not, which is peculiar to peaceableness. Two, by rendering assistance to others. This is done either, one, by repelling injuries from our neighbour, which is done by, one, commutative justice in punishing, two, fortitude, three, indignation, or, two, by helping our neighbour, as, one, by humanity, two, by mercy, three, by friendship. End of section 67. Section 68 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Seventh Commandment. 41st Lord's Day. Question 108. What doth the Seventh Command teach us? Answer. That all uncleanliness is accursed of God, and that therefore we must with all our hearts detest the same, and live chastely and temperately, whether in holy wedlock or in single life. Question 109. Doth God forbid in this command only adultery and such like gross sins? Answer. Since both our body and soul are temples of the Holy Ghost, he commands us to preserve them pure and holy, therefore he forbids all unchaste actions, gestures, words, thoughts, desires, and whatever can entice men thereto. Exposition. God in this commandment enjoins and sanctions the preservation of chastity and marriage, and hence authorizes marriage itself, for whenever God forbids anything, he at the same time commands and authorizes the observance of that which is opposite thereto. God now in this commandment forbids adultery, which is a violation of conjugal fidelity. When God singles out adultery as the most shocking and debasing vice of all the sins which are repugnant to chastity, he at the same time prohibits and condemns all wandering and wanton lusts, whether they be found in married or unmarried persons, and prohibits all other sins and vices contrary to chastity, together with their causes, occasions, effects, antecedents, consequence, etc. And on the other hand, he enjoins all those virtues which contribute to chastity. The reasons of this are these. 1. When one thing is specified, all those are understood which are closely allied or connected with it. Therefore, when adultery is prohibited as the most shocking and debasing form of lust, we are to understand all other forms of lust as forbidden at the same time. 2. Where the cause is condemned, there the effect is also condemned, and where the effect is condemned, there the cause is condemned. Hence the antecedents as well as the consequence of adultery are here forbidden and condemned. 3. The design of this commandment is the preservation of chastity amongst men, and the guarding of marriage or keeping it holy. Whatever, therefore, tends to the preservation of chastity and the protection of marriage is enjoined by this commandment, whilst that which is opposed thereto is forbidden. There are three virtues which we may speak of under the seventh commandment, chastity, modesty, and temperance. 1. Chastity in general is a virtue contributing to the purity of body and soul, agreeing with the will of God and shunning all lusts prohibited by God, all unlawful intercourse and inordinate copulation in connection with all the desires, causes, effects, suspicions, occasions, etc., which may lead thereto, whether in holy wedlock or in a single life. The term chastity comes, according to some, from the Greek kaza, which means to adorn, because it is an ornament, both of the whole man and also of all the other graces or virtues. The name has therefore been given to this virtue by way of preeminence, inasmuch as it is one of the principal virtues which constitute the image of God, according as it is said, God is chaste and will be called upon by those who are of a chaste mind, and has regard to such prayers. Chastity is of two kinds, one of single life, the other of holy wedlock. The former is a virtue shunning all wanton lusts without marriage. Conjugal chastity is to preserve in holy wedlock the order instituted by the wonderful counsel and wisdom of God. The causes of chastity are, one, the command of God. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honour. Follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 and 4. Hebrews 12, verse 14. 2. The preservation of the image of God. 
3. A desire to avoid defacing or marring the image of God and the union between Christ and the Church, of which Paul speaks when he says, Flee from fornication, know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 15. 4. Rewards and punishments. We may mention as being in opposition to chastity, a dissembled chastity, an impure single life, whoredom, concubinage, incest, adultery, and all wanton and hateful lusts, in connection with their causes, occasions, and effects. All the various species of lust may be referred to these three classes. The first class or kind are those which are contrary to nature and from the devil, such as are even contrary to this our corrupt nature, not only because they corrupt and spoil it of conformity with God, but also because this our corrupt nature shrinks from them and abhors them. The lusts of which the Apostle Paul speaks in the first chapter of his epistle to the Romans are of this class, as the confounding of sexes, also abuses of the female sex. The magistrate should punish these heinous sins and abominable transgressions with extraordinary punishments. Incest is greatly opposed to this, our corrupt nature, although examples of it occurred in our first parents. These examples, however, were of necessity or by a divine dispensation, and are therefore to be regarded as exceptions to the general rule. The second class of lusts are those which proceed from this our corrupt nature, as fornication committed by such as are unmarried, adulteries by persons that are both married, and intercourse between such as are married and unmarried. If a married person have connection with another person that is unmarried, it is simple adultery. But if one married person have intercourse with another person that is married, it is double adultery, for he violates his own marriage and also that of another person. Fornication takes place when those that are unmarried have connection with each other. Magistrates ought, by virtue of their office, to punish severely fornication and adultery. God appointed and required capital punishment to be inflicted upon adulterers, and although he did not appoint death as the punishment of fornicators, yet when he frequently declared in his word that no whore should be found among his people, he signified that it should be punished according to its heinousness and aggravated nature. There are other lusts which are committed by this our corrupt nature with an evil conscience, such as those evil desires to which we give indulgence, or with which we are delighted, and which we do not study and endeavour to avoid, which, although they are not punished by civil power, are nevertheless joined with an evil conscience and punished by God. The third class of lusts are the corrupt inclinations to which good men give no indulgence, but which they resist and from which they cut off all occasions, so that their consciences are not troubled because they call upon God, seek the grace of resistance, and have in their hearts the testimony that their sins are graciously forgiven them. Marriage was instituted after the fall as a remedy against these sins. It is therefore said, in view of these inclinations, it is better to marry than to burn, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 9. Yet Paul does not, in these words, approve of such marriages as are premature, injurious to the state, entered into before a suitable age, or which are against good customs and manners. Second, modesty or shamefacedness is a virtue abhorring all uncleanness, joined with shame, grief, and sadness, either on account of past impurity, or on account of fear of future uncleanness, having also a desire and purpose to avoid not only uncleanness itself, but everything that might lead to it. It is called by the Greeks erdos, which means bashfulness or shame, which Aristotle defines to be a fear of disgrace. This virtue is necessary for chastity as a help, a cause, effect, consequent, and sign of chastity. The extremes or vices which are repugnant to modesty are 1. Immodesty or imprudence, which makes light of impurity, 2. Stupidity or unrefined and perverse bashfulness, when any one is ashamed of that of which he ought not to be ashamed, as of a thing proper and becoming which calls for no shame, 3. Obscenity and scurrility. Third, temperance is a virtue observing such limits as are becoming to nature, propriety, sound reason, and the order of persons, places, and times, according to the law of nature in things pertaining to the body, as meat, drink, etc. This is the mother and nurse of all the other virtues, and is the cause of chastity, without which there can be no chastity, for without temperance we cannot be chaste. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness, and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, 
Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Luke 21 verse 34, Ephesians 5 verse 18, Romans 13 verses 13 and 14. The extremes of temperance are 1. Intemperance in meat and drink, gormandizing, gluttony, drunkenness, inebriation, which signifies properly not the excess itself of drinking, but the nausea and reeling of the head which are felt the day following. 2. Luxury, which is too much prodigality and profusion in food, clothing, equipage, etc. 3. Hurtful temperance, or too great abstinence, and such as does not agree with our nature, as the temperance of hermits and superstitious fasts. End of section 68. Section 69 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Asinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Marriage Since this commandment sanctions and authorizes marriage, it is proper we should here introduce some remarks in reference to it, and in doing so we shall consider, first, what marriage is, second, why it was instituted, third, what marriages are lawful, fourth, whether it be a thing indifferent, fifth, what duties devolve upon married persons, sixth, what things are contrary to marriage. First, what is marriage? Marriage is a lawful and indissoluble union between one man and one woman, instituted by God for the propagation of the human race, that we may know him to be chaste, and to hate all lust, and that he will gather to himself out of the whole human race, thus lawfully propagated, an everlasting church, which shall rightly know and worship him, and that it may be a society of labours, toils, cares, and prayers between persons living in a state of matrimony. Second, why was marriage instituted? God himself is the author of marriage. It is therefore no human device or invention, but was invented by God himself in paradise before the fall of man. The causes on account of which it was instituted are, as we may learn from the definition which we have just given, 1. That it might be the means of perpetuating and multiplying the human race in a lawful manner. 2. The gathering of the church. 3. That it might be an image or resemblance of the union between Christ and the church. 4 that wanton and wandering lusts might in this way be avoided, 5. that there might be a society of labour and prayer between those who are married, this society or connection is closer and more intimate than that which exists between men generally, hence the prayers of those who are living in this state are more ardent, inasmuch as we more earnestly desire to help those by our prayers, to whom we are united in the closest relations of life, as parents pray more fervently for their children than the children do for their parents, for the reason, as it is commonly said, love descends, not ascends. Third, what marriages are lawful? That the union constituted by marriage may be lawful, the following things are necessary. 1. That it be a union contracted between persons fit to be joined together. 2. That it be contracted by the consent of both parties. 3. That it meet the approbation of parents, or those who are in the place of parents, and whose consent is required by the law. 4. That no mistake or error be made in the persons. 5. That suitable conditions, propriety and lawful means, be observed in the contract. 6. That it be contracted between two persons only. The twain shall be one flesh. Genesis 2 verse 23, Matthew 19 verse 5. The fathers who lived under the Old Testament had many wives, but we must judge of the propriety and lawfulness of a thing, not by examples, but by law. 7. That it be contracted in the Lord, that is, between the faithful and with prayer. 8. That it be not contracted between persons who are forbidden, or who are of such near relationship or degrees of kindred, as are forbidden by God and wholesome laws. Kindred or relation by blood is either consanguinity or affinity. There are some, however, who regard kindred and consanguinity as one and the same thing. Consanguinity is between persons having sprung from the same stock or family, being closely allied by blood. Affinity is the relation between a man and his wife's kindred arising from marriage. The stock is the person from whom the rest proceed or spring. Those now who are related by blood are distinguished by lineage and degree. 
lineage is the order or line of kinsfolk descending from one stock. The degree which distinguishes them is the distance of kinsfolk, whether on the side of the father or mother from the original stock. This common rule is to be observed in reference to these degrees. There are as many degrees as there are persons who have sprung from the stock. The law of God forbids the second degree in marriage. Wise and wholesome political laws forbid also the third degree. Lineage is either of ascendants or of descendants, or of collaterals. Ascendants include the ancestors, descendants include all the posterity. Collaterals are those who are not born one from another, but from the same persons. The lineage of collaterals is either equal or unequal. It is equal when the distance of the common stock is equal, and unequal when the distance is unequal. The degrees of consanguinity which God forbids to be united in the marriage relation may be found in the 18th chapter of Leviticus, and that these degrees are natural and moral is proven, one, because the Gentiles are said to have committed abominations on account of having violated them, and to have been rejected of God on this account. The Gentiles now had not the civil and ceremonial laws of Moses. Two, because God punished or destroyed the world by the waters of the deluge for the violation of these laws, or for indulgence in wanton lusts and incestuous marriages. 3. From the design of this commandment, which is the prohibition of incest, which design is universal, perpetual, and moral. 4. Paul most severely reproved the incestuous man who had married his father's wife, of whom we have an account in the fifth chapter of his first epistle to the Corinthians, and commanded that he should be excommunicated. So John the Baptist also reproved Herod for having married his brother's wife, in that it was unlawful for him so to do. Mark 6, verse 18. Fourth, is marriage a thing indifferent? Marriage is lawful for all who are fit or proper persons to enter into this state. It is a thing indifferent, by which we mean that it is neither commanded nor prohibited by God, but left to the will and pleasure of those who possess the gift of continency. It is different, however, with those who do not possess this gift. To them it is not merely permitted, but commanded by God himself, that they marry in the Lord. Hence to these persons it is not a thing indifferent but necessary, as is evident from what the Apostle says, It is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. I say to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them, if they abide even as I, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. 1 Corinthians 7 verses 1, 2, 8 and 9 a proper regard should be had to time both in first and second marriages, nor should we give loose reins to our lusts and passions, but rather curb and restrain them by prayer and earnest efforts to the extent of our power, so as not to wound our consciences or violate that which is proper and just. Plutarch, in his life of Numa, testifies how carefully the Romans guarded against this and all improprieties in reference to marriage when he says, quote, Woman remained widows ten months after the death of their husbands, and that if any one married before the expiration of ten months, the laws of Numa required her to sacrifice a cow heavy with calf, end quote, etc. The want of a proper regard to time in marriages is a cause of many evils, both in civil and ecclesiastical affairs. Yet those who have once lawfully and in the Lord contracted marriage may not break or violate their vow except for adultery. Fifth, what are the duties of married persons? The common and mutual duties of married persons include 1. Mutual love, 2. Conjugal fidelity, which requires that each one love the other only, and that constantly, 3. A community of good, together with sympathy in each other's sorrows and misfortunes, 4. The training and education of children, 5. Bearing one another's infirmities with a desire to remove them. It is the duty of the husband, 1. To nourish and cherish his wife and children, 2. To govern them. 3. To defend them. It is the duty of the wife. 1. To assist her husband in providing and preserving what pertains to the family. 2. To obey and reverence her husband. When these duties are not performed, there is a great breach of what tends to the lawful use of marriage. 5. What things are contrary to marriage? The things which are contrary to marriage are the same as those which conflict with chastity. 1. Fornication and adultery, by which conjugal faith and chastity are violated by one or both parties. Also, incest, unlawful copulation and abuse of marriage. 2. Hasty and rash divorces, which in former times were common among the Romans and Jews, 
and which are even at this day frequent among uncivilized nations. The divorces of which we here speak are not such as take place on account of adultery, but from one person deserting or leaving the other. 3. Forbidding to marry. End of section 69. Section 70 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Eighth Commandment. Forty-second Lord's Day, question 110, what doth God forbid in the Eighth Command? Answer, God forbids not only those thefts and robberies which are punishable by the magistrate, but he comprehends under the name of theft all wicked tricks and devices whereby we design to appropriate to ourselves the goods which belong to our neighbour, whether it be by force or under the appearance of right, as by unjust weights, ills, measures, fraudulent merchandise, false coins, usury, or by any other way forbidden by God, as also all covetousness, all waste and abuse of his gifts. Question 111. But what doth God require in this command? Answer, that I promote the advantage of my neighbour in every instance I can or may, and deal with him as I desire to be dealt with by others, further also that I faithfully labour, so that I may be able to relieve the needy. Exposition. This commandment sanctions and authorises a distinction in property or possessions. The end or design of this commandment is the preservation of the property or possessions which God has given to every one for the support of life, for if it is not lawful or becoming for us to steal, it is necessary that every man should possess that which lawfully belongs to him. God, therefore, in this commandment, forbids all frauds, together with all the cunning devices and arts by which the goods and possessions of our neighbour are injured, diminished, or confounded, so as to lose his right in them, or to make it doubtful. In forbidding these things, God at the same time enjoins all those virtues which contribute to the preservation of our neighbour's goods and possessions. Thou shalt not steal, that is, thou shalt not desire, or attempt to take to thyself thy neighbour's goods by fraud. Therefore thou shalt defend, preserve, and increase them, and give unto thy neighbour what belongs to him. God calls the things that are forbidden theft, in order that he might comprehend and condemn unto this, as being the grossest kind of fraud, all other sins of a kindred nature, with their antecedents and consequence. The Virtues of the Eighth Commandment First, commutative justice is a virtue in the acquisition of goods which does not desire the possessions of another and contributes to an arithmetical equality in contracts and in the ordinary traffic amongst men in the purchase and exchange of goods according to just laws. Commutative justice then consists in preserving an equality between merit and reward, wages and labour, etc., whether it be in the acquisition or disposition of goods. Justinian, the Roman emperor, writes in relation to the possession and division of things, that some things are common to all by natural right, as the air, water, the sea, the shores of the sea, etc. Some things are public, as rivers, ports, the use of the banks of rivers, etc. Some belong to no one as things sacred, religious, and holy. The largest amount of things, however, belong to persons privately and singly, and are acquired in various ways. Those things, therefore, which are transferred to another owner, or which any one takes to himself, belong either to no one or to someone. Those which belong to no one become the property of the persons who acquire them. Those things which belong rightly to someone can only pass into the hands of others, either by violence or against the will of the rightful owner, or by captivity in war, or with the consent of the owner, as by inheritance or contract. Possessions pass into the hands of others by inheritance, either by will or without any will, a contract is an agreement between certain persons in reference to the transfer, giving, or exchange of possessions, according to just and wholesome laws. All contracts are included under commutative justice, and may be comprehended under ten classes. 1. Buying and selling, when an article passes from the vendor to the purchaser, in such a way that the purchaser gives a just and equivalent price for it. This is sometimes accompanied with a condition of selling it again, or it may be without this condition. The buying of revenues, or the receiving an income belongs to this, and is no more to be regarded as usury than the letting out of land for which a certain yearly rent is required. 2. Borrowing is a contract according to which the use of a certain thing is transferred to another in such a way that he returns that which is equivalent. There is something given in borrowing, not that the same thing may be returned but only that which is similar or of equal value. Lending is that which takes place when the use of a certain thing is granted to someone for a certain length of time when he is to return the self-same thing whole and without any injury, without having to pay any remuneration for the use of it. 4. 
donation, where a certain thing is transferred to another person without recompense by the rightful owner, who alone has the right to give it by free will. But should someone say that justice demands that like should be given for like, and that inasmuch as this is not done in what is given as a donation, it must conflict with justice, we would reply that this is true only in case the things are given with the intention that a compensation be made. 5. Exchange, where things are exchanged by the consent of those who are lawful owners, or when one thing is given for another which is equal in value. 6. Leasing or letting out is a contract according to which the use of a certain thing, without any right of possession, is given over to another person by the rightful owner for a certain length of time, upon the condition that he to whom it is leased pay a given sum for its use and return it again in a proper state at the expiration of the time for which it was let. 7. Pledging or mortgaging is when a certain thing is transferred to another person which gives him a right to it as long as certain things which are due him are not paid or it is a contract which takes place when a certain thing is delivered to another person upon this condition, that he has the right of using it according to his own pleasure, in case it is not redeemed within a certain time. 8. Committing in trust is a contract according to which neither the use nor possession, but only the keeping of a certain thing is entrusted to another person. 9. Partnership is a contract between certain persons who associate themselves together in business, according to which one person gives his funds, and the other his attention or labour, upon the condition that they receive or bear an equal proportion of the loss or gain, and that neither one reap the entire gain or sustain the whole loss. 10. There is lastly a contract according to which the use or possession of a piece of land is transferred by the owner to a farmer, to till, upon the condition that he cultivate it and be bound to render to the owner thereof some particular service. These different kinds of contracts are to be observed for the better understanding of commutative justice. There is opposed to this virtue every unjust and unlawful transfer of property, whether it be effected by violence as robberies, or by fraud and deceit as theft. Theft is the taking of that which belongs to another without his knowledge and will, with the intention to deprive him of it. There are many ways in which theft is practiced both in public and private life, of which we may mention the following. 1. Embezzling or taking that which belongs to the state or commonwealth. 2. Sacrilege which consists in taking some sacred or holy thing. 3. The various deceptions which are practiced in merchandising, as when anyone uses fraud and artifice in effecting contracts or sales, together with all the wicked tricks and devices by which anyone designs to appropriate to himself what belongs to another. 4. Usury is the gain which is received in view of that which has been borrowed or loaned. All just contracts, the contracts of paying rent, a just compensation for any loss, partnership, buying, etc., are exempted from usury. There are many questions respecting usury concerning which we may judge according to the rule which Christ has laid down. Whatever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. Second, contentment is a virtue by which we are satisfied and contented with our present possessions, which we have honestly acquired, and by which we quietly endure poverty and other inconveniences, not desiring what does not belong to us, nor what is unnecessary. The extremes of this virtue are, on the side of want, avarice and theft, and on the side of excess, a feigned refusal, as when any one would make it appear that he is unwilling to receive that which he nevertheless would and greatly desires. Also inhumanity, which is not to receive anything. Third, Fidelity is a virtue which has a concern and anxiety in regard to the losses and privations of another, and endeavours to avert them, willingly and diligently performing all the different duties which are devolving upon us in our appropriate callings, in order that we may have what is necessary to sustain us and ours, and that we may also have that with which we may supply the wants of others, all of which is done with the design that we may glorify God thereby. The extremes of this virtue are 1. Unfaithfulness, which has no care in regard to the losses and injuries of others, and does not diligently perform what duty requires. 2. Negligence and slothfulness, which merely desires to reap public good without contributing anything thereto. Objection, but mention has already been made of fidelity in the fifth commandment, therefore it does not properly belong here. Answer, it is not absurd that one and the same virtue should be placed under different commandments for different ends and in different respects, for the ends and designs of different actions and virtues make a difference in the things themselves. Fidelity is placed under this commandment in as far as it includes a desire to guard against the disadvantages and losses of others, and to do those things by which we may acquire for ourselves food, raiment, and such things as are necessary. And it is placed under the fifth commandment in so far as it includes obedience in doing our duty. Fourth, 
liberality is a virtue which contributes of its substance to those who are in want, from right considerations and motives, or it is a virtue by which those who are possessed of it communicate of their own possessions to others, without being urged thereto by any civil constraint or enactment, but by the divine and natural law, or for the sake of godliness and charity with a liberal heart, according to their ability and the necessity of others, knowing where, to whom, when, and how much they are able to give, and at the same time preserve a medium between penuriousness and prodigality. The extreme of this virtue on the side of want are penuriousness, meanness, and covetousness, which may be said to consist in a desire on the part of any one to increase his possessions by right or wrong, or which by a want of confidence in God and a trust in the possessions of fortune is not contented with those things which God gives by lawful means, but desires more and more, and seeks to take to itself, even by unlawful means, what it has no right to, and does not give where God requires that we should exercise our liberality. The other extreme of this virtue shows itself in prodigality, or in a lavish expenditure of what God has committed to our trust, which gives beyond the bounds of propriety, and without any necessity, being actuated thereto by delight in an excessive use or waste of our gifts and possessions. Fifth, hospitality is a species of liberality, and is that by which we entertain strangers and travellers, and especially those who have been banished on account of the profession of the doctrine of the gospel, with true Christian charity, and with all the duties of hospitality. Or it consists in liberality and kindness towards strangers, especially towards Christians, who are driven into exile on account of religion, or are forced to travel for the confession of the truth. The extremes of this virtue are, on the one side, a want of hospitality towards strangers, and on the other, extravagance in entertaining them, so exhausting the fountain of our beneficence that we are not left with those things which are necessary for ourselves. Sixth, parsimony is that virtue by which we guard against all unnecessary expense, and by which we take care of that which we have honestly acquired for ourselves, and for those who are connected with us in the relation's life, not desiring more than what is necessary for our comfort. Liberality has parsimony connected with it, for liberality without parsimony runs into prodigality, and parsimony without liberality soon degenerates into covetousness. They are therefore virtues which are closely allied, and are two means between the same extremes, viz. covetousness and prodigality. Neither can any one be liberal who is not parsimonious or frugal, nor can any one who is not frugal be liberal. Liberality enlarges our contributions according to sound reason, whilst parsimony restricts the same according to sound reason, retaining as much as propriety will admit of, and giving as much as is needed. It is in this way that these two virtues are exercised in regard to the same object, and are between the same extremes, so that the same vices which stand in opposition to liberality are repugnant to parsimony, which vices are prodigality and covetousness. Seventh, Frugality is a virtue having respect to household affairs, disposing of what has been honestly acquired, properly and profitable, and for things necessary and useful, or which incurs expense merely for such things as are necessary and useful, it is closely allied to parsimony, and yet it is evidently not the same. Parsimony consists in giving moderately, frugality in a proper disposition of things. They are both referred to and comprehended under this commandment, because their opposite, which is prodigality, is here forbidden, the extremes of this virtue are the same as those which we mentioned under parsimony. Objections against the distinction which we have made in reference to possessions. Objection 1. The apostles had all good things in common, therefore we ought to have all things in common. Answer 1. The examples are not the same, for a community of goods in the time of the apostles was easy and necessary. It was easy because the disciples were few in number. It was necessary because there was great danger that if they did not sell them they would be wrested from them by violence. It is different, however, as it respects the church at the present time, for such a community of goods would now be neither easy nor necessary. The apostles were therefore led, for just and sufficient reasons, to have such a community of goods which causes are now no more in existence. Two, they did it freely, and not by any law constraining them to adopt such measures, each one did it of his own accord, hence Peter said to Ananias, While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Acts 5 verse 4. It was therefore voluntary. 3. It was a particular custom, not having respect to the whole church, for it was not observed in all the churches. Alms were collected in Macedonia and Archaea, and sent to Jerusalem. For it was temporary, for it was afterwards abolished, when the causes which first gave rise to it passed away. 
Objection 2. Things which are natural are unchangeable. Community of goods is natural, therefore it is unchangeable, and is to be observed at this day. Answer. Natural things are unchangeable in respect to the moral law, but not in respect to natural benefits and utility. Objection 3. Christ said to the young man in the gospel, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor. Matthew 19, verse 21. Answer. There is a difference in the examples. 1. Because the calling of a disciple was special, having respect to the apostleship. 2. Christ designed by this to show this young man how far he was from the perfection of the law of which he boasted. 3. Christ did not say give it in common or cast it in the common treasury, but give to the poor. Objection 4. All things belong to Christ, therefore all things belong to Christians. Answer. All things are ours as it respects the right to the thing, but not as it respects our right in the thing. All things are due to us, but it is not proper for us to lay hold upon anything before the time. Objection 5. Friends have things in common. Answer. Friends have things in common not as it respects the ownership and possession of property, but only in their use and enjoyment, according to just laws, or they have them in common as touching the use and duties of propriety, advantage, and necessity, according to sound reason, for we ought to desire those things from our friends which we desire them to ask from us. All things, however, are not common among friends as touching their possession and right, because every one has a distinct possession and right to his own goods. This possession of goods or distinction of rights is recognized and sanctioned by this commandment, as we have already remarked. For if we may not steal, it is necessary that we should possess what properly belongs to us, and that for these reasons, one, that we may honestly maintain and support ourselves and those who are depending upon us, two, that we may have something to contribute towards the preservation of the church, three, that we may assist in upholding the interests of the state according to our ability, four, that we may be able to confer benefits upon our friends and contribute to the relief of the poor and needy. End of section 70. Section 71 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ninth Commandment. 43rd Lord's Day, Question 112. What is required in the Ninth Commandment? Answer. That I bear false witness against no man, nor falsify any man's words, that I be no backbiter or slanderer, that I do not judge or join in condemning any man rashly or unheard, but that I avoid all sorts of lies and deceit, as the proper works of the devil, unless I would bring down upon me the heavy wrath of God. Likewise, that in judgment and other dealings I love the truth, speak it uprightly and confess it. Also, that I defend and promote as much as I am able the honour and good character of my neighbour. Exposition the design or end of this ninth commandment is the establishment and preservation of truth amongst men. It forbids, therefore, the bearing of false witness and all other things which are closely allied to it, the genus of which is lying. Thou shalt not bear false witness of or against thy neighbour. There is in this negative precept an affirmative, which is, Thou shalt bear true witness of or for thy neighbour, that is, if thou wilt be true, love to learn and speak the truth. The head, the fountain, and genus, as it were, of the virtues which are here enjoined, is truth, or rather veracity, in our words, thoughts, judgments, contracts, and in our doctrine. For by truth, as it is here used, we are to understand the agreement or correspondence which our knowledge or words have with the thing of which we affirm something. We call that speech or declaration true which harmonizes and agrees with the thing itself. So, on the other hand, falsehood, in the premises which we have laid down is the fountain, the genus of all the vices which are here condemned. Virtues of the Ninth Commandment 1. Truth or veracity is a firm purpose or choice in the will, by which we constantly embrace true thoughts and opinions, and profess and defend the same according to a sense of duty and the circumstances in which we are placed, keep contracts and promises, and avoid both in our speech and deportment all deceitful dissemblings for the glory of God and the safety of our neighbour. According to this end, the devil cannot be true, even though he may at times speak that which is true, for he alone is true who speaks and loves the truth, and has a desire to promote it for the glory of God and the safety of his fellow men. 
Aristotle reasons in his ethics briefly, but most learnedly, concerning this virtue. He refers truth in contracts to justice, and calls him properly a true man, who, when it profits him nothing, is nevertheless true in his speech and life, and is habitually such. From which it appears again that the devil and men are liars, and not true, although they may sometimes speak the truth. Truth comprehends liberty of speech or boldness, which is a virtue by which we profess the truth fearlessly and willingly, to as great an extent as is required by the time, place, and necessity of the occasion. The confession of the truth is enjoined both in this and in the third commandment, as the same virtue is often regarded and included in the obedience of different commandments, yet it is required here in a different respect from what it is in the third commandment. There it is required, as it is the immediate worship and praise of God. Here, as we are unwilling to deceive our neighbour, but desire that his character and safety be preserved. There is opposed to this virtue on the side of want, one, falsehood or lying, which comprehends all the various kinds of fraud, deceit, dissembling, lies of courtesy, slanders, backbitings, and evil speaking, which forms of lying are also opposed to candour. The same thing may also be said of such negligence as does not seek to obtain a true knowledge of things, together with willful ignorance, which is a lie in the understanding. 2. Vanity or levity, which is a readiness for lying. He is a vain person who lies much, often and readily, and that without any shame. He is a liar who has a desire and fondness for lying. A lie is when anyone speaks or declares by outward signs differently from what he thinks, and from what the thing itself is. To lie is to go against one's own mind and knowledge. All lies now which clearly dissemble and cover the truth are here condemned, nor are those lies which are uttered for politeness' sake excused, because we may not do evil that good may come. Lactantius very correctly says, quote, we should never lie because a lie always injures and deceives someone, end quote. Truth, however, which is uttered by a sign is no lie, whether he to whom the sign is made understands it or not. Yet we may here remark that we should not be too severe and rigid in passing sentence upon the actions of the saints, neither should we make an apology for those things which need none. Officious lies are often defended by bringing forward the Egyptian midwives who lied to the king, and were nevertheless blessed of God, but God did not bless them because they lied, but because they feared him, and would not slay the children of the Israelites. Objection. That which profits another without injuring any one may be done. Lies which are uttered out of respect, or for fear of giving offence, do not injure any one, but may result in good. Therefore, they may be uttered without any sin. Answer, we deny the minor proposition, because that which God prohibits always injures someone, and if such lies ever profit anyone, it is by an accident, on account of the goodness of God. See Augustine, Liber de mendatio ad consentium. There is opposed to truth as it respects the other extreme, one, an untimely profession of the truth, which is to cast pearls before swine, and to give that which is holy to the dogs, as Christ says, who by these words forbids such a profession of the truth, as not made at the proper time, and when no necessity demands it, for it is correctly said, he who admonishes at the wrong time injures. 2. Curiosity, which is to inquire into what is not necessary or impossible. Let these remarks suffice respecting truth, the principal virtue comprehended under this commandment. All the other virtues which are here commended wait upon truth, or contribute to it, and are, as it were, certain appendages of it. Second, candor is a virtue which understands in a proper light things correctly and honestly spoken or done, and puts the most favourable construction upon such things as are doubtful, in as far as there are any just reasons for doing it, and does not readily entertain suspicions or indulge in them, although there might be sufficient cause for doing so, and does not base any actions upon these suspicions, nor resolve anything in consequence thereof. Or, it is a virtue closely related to truth, sanctioning other conclusions when there are probable reasons for them, not indulging any ill will, understanding in the most probable light things that are doubtful, and hoping that which is good, but yet thinking, concerning things changeable, that the minds of men may be changed, and that a man may err respecting another's intention, since the inmost recesses of the human heart are never brought fully to light. There is opposed to candour, as it respects the want of it, calumny and suspiciousness. Calumny is not only to criminate and find fault with the innocent, where there is no reason for it, but it is also to put the very worst construction upon things spoken indifferently, 
or to propagate and coin what is false. Suspiciousness is to understand things spoken correctly or ambiguously in the worst light, and to suspect evil things from those that are good, or to entertain suspicions where there is no just cause for so doing, and where there are any proper reasons for suspicions, to indulge in them to too great an extent. It is lawful for us at times to have suspicions, unless we wish to be the dupes and fools of others. Hence the Saviour says, Beware of men, be ye wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Matthew 10, verses 16 and 17. But it is one thing to have suspicions, and another to indulge them. Suspicion now is the entertaining of an evil or unfavourable opinion of someone, on account of some probable and sufficient cause, whether true or apparent. It is twofold, good and evil. 1. It is evil when it proceeds from a cause altogether false or insufficient, as when a certain cause is imagined which is groundless, or when our neighbour is innocent. It is good when our suspicions are based upon just and sufficient grounds. 2. It is an evil suspicion when any one resolves upon something merely upon suspicion. It is good when the matter is left in suspense as long as there are probable causes on both sides. 3. It is evil when any one conceives the design to injure a certain one merely upon the ground of suspicion. It is good when the contrary takes place. 4. It is evil when any one is led to indulge hatred to another upon the ground of suspicion. Good suspicions proceed differently. There is, on the other side of this virtue, as it respects the extreme of excess, one, foolish credulity and flattery. Blind or foolish credulity is to interpret anything rashly or hastily, and to assent to it without just and probable reasons. Or it is to believe a thing upon the declaration of another, when there are evident and sufficient reasons to the contrary. Flattery consists in praising and admiring things which should not be praised for the purpose of obtaining the fortune or favour of someone. Candour is an assistant or species of truth, and is therefore here enjoined and commended in simplicity with truth. Third, simplicity is truth in its nakedness, without any shiftings, prevarication, or quibbles, and it is a virtue which honestly and openly speaks and does what is true, right, and understood in arts and common life. Truth is regulated and tempered by candour and simplicity. The extremes of this virtue are a feigned simplicity and duplicity in manners and conversation. Fourth, constancy is a virtue which does not depart from the truth in as far as it is known, and which does not change its purpose and design without a necessary and sufficient reason, but constantly says and does what is true, just and necessary. Or, it is a virtue holding fast to the truth once discovered, known and approved of, with a profession and defence of it in the like manner. Constancy is necessary for the preservation of truth, and is therefore here enjoined. The extremes of this virtue are, on the side of want, inconstancy, which is to change one's mind and opinion without any sufficient reason, and on the side of excess, it is obstinacy or stoical rigour which clings to false opinions, and persists in doing what is unjust and unprofitable, although convinced to the contrary. It is a vice which arises from the confidence which any one has in his own wisdom, or from pride and ostentation, and shows itself in an unwillingness to yield its own judgment or opinion, which is seen to be false from many solid arguments. Fifth, docility is a virtue which investigates the reasons of those opinions which are true, readily yields and assents to those who teach or show things which are better, and that for reasons sound and convincing, and at the same time disposes the will to fall in with and assent to those reasons which are true and satisfactory, and to abandon what was before received and entertained. The extremes of this virtue are the same as those of constancy. Docility is also necessary to constancy, for constancy without docility would degenerate into obstinacy, and docility without constancy would degenerate into fickleness and inconstancy. The virtues, which we have thus far enumerated under this commandment, are naturally and closely connected together, for it is necessary that truth should be tempered and regulated by simplicity and candour, that it should be perceived and acknowledged by docility and preserved by candour. In this way, the preceding virtues are necessary to the existence of truth. The three following virtues are necessary in order that it may be profitable in the world. Sixth, taciturnity, or a discreet observance of silence, is a virtue which keeps to itself things not known and not necessary to be told, where, when, and in so far as it is proper to do so, and at the same time avoids an immoderate use of the tongue in uttering such things as prudence would require not to be told. Or, it is such a profession of the truth 
as that which keeps to itself things that are secret, whether true or false, and which avoids conversation that is unnecessary and useless, especially that which is untimely, baneful, and calculated to give offence. The extremes of this virtue are, on the one side, gossiping, foolish talking, and treachery. Gossiping or prattling is not to be able to retain anything, even things which should be kept secret. Foolish talking is to speak unseasonably, immoderately, and foolishly. Treachery is to betray honest enterprises and plans to the injury of those whose friend the betrayer seems and ought to be, and not to defend nor have any regard to the danger of another when it is proper and possible to do so, and still further to relate things not worthy of being told, the narration of which is an injury to him to whom it is told, and to disclose such things as must necessarily be spoken with no good intention or design, and lastly to utter anything by perjury or falsehood, that which is opposed to this virtue, as it respects the extreme of excess, may be included in moroseness and undue reservedness. Moroseness consists in being silent and keeping back the truth when it ought to be declared. Wenn man einem die Wort muss abkaufen. Undue reservedness is to dissemble the truth where the glory of God and the salvation of our fellow men require a profession of it. Seventh. Affability or readiness of speaking is a virtue which hears, answers, and speaks willingly, and with evidence of good will, where it is proper by reason of some necessary or probable cause. Or it is a virtue which makes others feel easy in their interviews with those who are possessed of this grace, and at the same time gives evidence of good will in conversation, speech, and gesture. Or it is a virtue which consists in hearing and answering with a declaration and evidence of good will. Taciturnity without affability becomes moroseness or peevishness, whilst affability without taciturnity degenerates into gossiping, prattling, and foolish talking. 8. Urbanity, being that which seasons and recommends truth and speech under every form, is the truth figuratively spoken, for the purpose of moving, exhorting, and delighting others, having a proper regard to the circumstances of the person's time and place, or... It is a facility and power of speaking the truth with a certain degree of grace, so as to teach, comfort, cheer, excite, and move others, without being accompanied by any unpleasantness or bitterness. The extremes of this virtue are, on the one side, scurrility, raillery, and backbiting. Scurrility consists in obscene and low jesting, especially in holy things. Scura, which means a person who jests in the manner just described, is so called from the Greek skor, which means filth because he speaks what is obscene and filthy. Raillery is a vice which consists in bitter jesting or scoffing, and in deriding and vexing others, especially those who ought to be pitied. Backbiting is that which puts false reports into circulation in regard to others, and puts the worst construction upon what is spoken doubtfully, with a desire of revenge, and of injuring and exciting prejudice and opposition against someone. Foolishness and a want of taste constitute the other extreme of urbanity, Foolishness is an affectation of urbanity which is altogether inappropriate and out of place, whilst a want of taste shows itself in a silly imitation of urbanity. End of section 71. Section 72 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Tenth Commandment. Forty-fourth Lord's Day. Question 113. What doth the Tenth Commandment require of us? Answer, that even the smallest inclination or thought, contrary to any of God's commands, never rise in our hearts, but that, at all times, we hate sin with our whole hearts, and delight in all righteousness. Exposition. That this commandment, which has respect to lust or concupiscence, is one and not two, is evident, one, from the fact that Moses repeats it in a different order in Exodus 20, verse 17, and Deuteronomy 5, verse 21, as we have already shown. Two, from the fact that Moses comprehends it in one verse in both of the places to which we have just referred. Three, from the interpretation of Paul, who comprises in one commandment all that Moses says in relation to this subject when he says, I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Romans 7, verse 7. 
for, from the fact that the papists and others are accustomed in their expositions of this part of the Decalogue to join together the coveting of our neighbour's house and wife, because they without doubt perceived that the coveting of our neighbour's wife, house, and all other things which belong to our neighbour are here forbidden, and for one and the same reason. It follows, therefore, either that there is but one precept touching concupiscence, or that there must be as many commandments enumerated as there are things belonging to our neighbour which we are forbidden to covet. 5. From the authority of the best ancient writers, both among the Jews and Christians, to whom we have referred in our remarks upon the division of the Decalogue, the design and end of this commandment is the internal obedience and regulation of all our affections towards God and our neighbours and his goods, which must also be included in all the other commandments. Should someone object and say, therefore this commandment is superfluous inasmuch as it requires nothing new, or which has not been expressed in the foregoing precepts, we reply that it is not superfluous, seeing that it is added to the other commandments as a general rule and interpretation, according to which the internal obedience of all the other commandments must be understood, because this is spoken of the whole Decalogue generally. This commandment, therefore, enjoins original righteousness towards God and our neighbour, which consists in a true knowledge of God in the mind, with an inclination in the will to obey the will of God as known. It also forbids concupiscence, which is an inordinate desire or corrupt inclination, coveting those things which God has forbidden. It properly, however, commands original righteousness towards our neighbour, which is a desire and inclination to perform towards our neighbour all the duties which are required from us, and to preserve and defend his safety. There are two extremes of this original righteousness here forbidden. One, original sin towards our neighbour, which is called concupiscence, which consists in desiring and wishing those things which would be an injury to our neighbour. Two, an inordinate love of our neighbour, which leads to the neglect of God for his sake. There are some who hold that concupiscence and original sin are one and the same thing, but they differ in the same way in which an effect differs from a cause, or as a part of a thing differs from the whole. Concupiscence is a propensity to those things which are prohibited by the divine law. Original sin is the state of condemnation in which the whole human race has become involved by the fall, and a want of the knowledge and will of God. We must here observe that not only are corrupt and disordered inclinations sins, but the thinking of evil, in as far as it is concerned with an inclination and propensity to pursue it, or with a desire to practice it, is sin. Concupiscence, although it is without doubt born in us, is both an evil and sin, for we are not to judge according to nature, but according to the law whether a thing be sin or not. Whatever is opposed to the law is sin, whether it be born in us or not. The Pelagians denied that concupiscence is sin. The law, on the contrary, declares thou shalt not covet. And Paul says, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Romans 7 verse 7. The Pelagians were condemned in many councils, which were called together on account of the errors of Pelagius and Celestius about the year of our Lord 420, and subsequently. The Principal Arguments of the Pelagians Objection 1. Natural things are not sins. Concupiscence is natural, therefore it is no sin. Answer. There is here a fallacy of the accident in the minor proposition, for inordinate concupiscence was not before the fall, but became joined to our nature after the fall. It is therefore not natural in itself, but is by an accident, inasmuch as it is now, since the fall, born with us, or it is natural in the sense that it is an evil accident, connecting itself inseparably with a nature good in itself. Or, we may reply to the objection thus, there are four terms in this syllogism arising from the ambiguity of the word natural. In the major, it signifies a thing created good by God naturally, viz. a natural desire of man before the fall, which was not contrary to the will of God. But in the minor it signifies a thing which does not properly belong to us by creation, but which we have brought upon ourselves by the fall. To this it is objected, a natural desire or inclination which works those things which contribute to the preservation of man, and avoids those which are injurious, is not sinful, even though it belongs to a corrupt nature, because it is created by God, and is a desire good in itself. Such now is concupiscence, therefore it is no sin. Answer. We reply to the major proposition that appetites and desires are good in themselves in as far as they are mere desires. 
It is different, however, with those desires which are inordinate and which are directed upon objects prohibited by God, as in the case with all the appetites and desires of our corrupt nature, because they are either not directed upon such objects as they ought, or not in the manner and with the design with which they should be, so that they are all corrupt and sinful. An evil tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Matthew 7 verse 18. To desire the fruit of a tree was natural, but to desire it contrary to the express command of God, as Eve did, was in its own nature wicked and sinful. Objection 2. That which is impossible for us to produce in ourselves or to prevent is no sin. Concupiscence now is in us in such a way that we can neither throw it off nor produce it in ourselves. Therefore it is no sin. Answer. The major proposition is false, for sin is not to be estimated by any liberty or necessity of our nature, but by the law and will of God. Whatever is in opposition to the law is sin, whether men have power to avoid it or not. Nor does God do any injustice to us by requiring from us that which we cannot perform, because he demanded these things of us when they were possible, and gave us the power to perform them. And although we have now lost this power, yet God has not lost his right to demand what he committed to our trust. For further remarks upon this subject, we would refer the reader to what has been said in the exposition of the ninth question of the Catechism, page 66. Objection 3. Sin renders man obnoxious to the eternal wrath of God. Concupiscence does not expose those who are regenerated to the wrath of God, for there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8 verse 1, Therefore, concupiscence is no sin, at least not in the regenerate. Answer. There is a fallacy of accident in the minor proposition, for that concupiscence does not condemn the regenerate comes to pass by an accident, which is the grace of God, which does not impute it to the faithful. This, however, does not occur in this way, as though concupiscence were no sin, for other sins in like manner do not condemn the regenerate, not because they are no sins, but because they have obtained the pardon of them through Christ. Objection 4. Original sin is removed in baptism, therefore concupiscence is no sin in those who are baptized. We reply to the antecedent that original sin is not simply and wholly removed in baptism, but merely as it respects its guilt. Corruption and an inclination to sin remain still in those who are baptized. This is what the schoolmen mean when they say, quote, the formal part of sin is removed, but the material remains, end quote. Should anyone reply that where the formal part of sin is removed, there the thing itself is removed, inasmuch as the form gives being to the thing, so that original sin itself must be removed in baptism. We answer that there is here an error in understanding that to be spoken generally, which is true only in a certain respect. The formal part of sin is removed, not simply, but in respect to the guilt of sin, for the formal part of sin is twofold, and includes, one, opposition to the law and an inclination to sin, 2. Guilt or desert of punishment. The guilt of sin is removed, but the inclination remains. I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. Romans 7 verse 23. End of section 72. Section 73 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus. Translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Possibility of Obedience to the Law Question 114. But can those who are converted to God perfectly keep these commands? Answer. No, but even the holiest men, while in this life, have only small beginnings of this obedience, yet so that with a sincere resolution they begin to live, not only according to some, but all the commands of God. Exposition the question which here claims our attention is, how is obedience to the law possible, and can those who are regenerated keep the law perfectly? Which is the seventh division proposed under the general subject of the law of God. That this question may be the better understood, we shall distinguish the nature of man as it was when it first came from the hands of God, pure and holy, as fallen and as regenerated. Perfect obedience to the whole law was possible to the nature of man before it was corrupted by sin, and that, as it respects every part and degree of obedience, as it is to the angels, for man was created good and after the image of God, in righteousness and true holiness. The nature of man in its corrupt state, since the fall, is entirely unable to fulfill what the law demands, 
yea, it cannot so much as commence acceptable obedience to God, according to the following declarations of Scripture, the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots, then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. A corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Ye were dead in trespasses and sins, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Genesis 8 verse 21, Jeremiah 13 verse 23, Matthew 7 verse 18, Romans 4 verse 23, Ephesians 2 verse 13, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 5. The obedience of the law is possible in the regenerate, one, as touching external propriety and discipline, two, as it respects the imputation of Christ's righteousness, or by the benefit of justification and regeneration which we obtain by faith, three, as it respects the commencement of internal and external obedience in this life, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5 verse 3. He that boasts that he knows and worships God without the commencement of obedience or regeneration is a liar. But the law is impossible to the regenerate in respect to God, or the perfect internal and external obedience which it requires. Enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. Psalm 143 verse 2. 1. Because the regenerate do not fulfill the law perfectly, but do many things in opposition to it. 2. Because even those things which they do according to the law are imperfect, for there are still many sins remaining in the regenerate, as original sin and many actual sins, neglects, omissions, and infirmities, which sins the godly acknowledge and bewail in themselves. We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Isaiah 64 verse 6. There is, however, a great difference between the regenerate and the unregenerate when they sin. 1. God has a purpose to save the regenerate. 2. There is a certain final repentance on the part of the regenerate. 3. Even with the sins of the regenerate, there is always remaining some beginning or seed of true faith and conversion. It is different, however, as it respects the unregenerate, for in regard to them God has no purpose, as in the case of the godly, neither is there any certain final repentance in their case, nor any beginning of new obedience, but they sin willingly and persist in their opposition to God, and at length perish unless they are converted. Objections against the imperfection of works in the regenerate. Objection 1. The works of the Holy Spirit cannot be imperfect. The good works of the regenerate are the works of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it must needs be that they are perfect, considered even in themselves. Answer. There is here an error in regarding that to be absolutely true, which is true only in a certain respect. Those works which are wrought simply by the Holy Spirit must needs be perfect and pure. But the works of the regenerate are of the Holy Spirit not absolutely, but in such a way that they are at the same time the works of the regenerate themselves. Hence this is all that follows, that the works of the saints are pure in as far as they are suggested and wrought by the Holy Spirit, but in as far as they are also of men, who are as yet imperfect and fallible, they are works accompanied with many defects and with much that is evil. Objection 2. The works of those who are conformed to the image of Christ cannot be imperfect. The saints are in this life conformed to Christ by their regeneration and adoption into the family of God. Therefore their works cannot be imperfect. Answer, there is here the same error which we noticed in replying to the former objection. The major proposition is spoken in reference to those who are perfectly conformed to the image of Christ, whilst the saints, of whom the minor proposition speaks, are conformed to Christ only in part, as long as they continue on earth. For, as our knowledge is, so is our love and conformity with Christ. But here we know only in part, and prophesy only in part, as the Apostle says. Hence, our conformity with Christ is not perfect. Objection 3. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1. The saints are in Christ, therefore their works are perfectly good, considered even in themselves. Answer. There is here a fallacy in regarding that as a cause which is none, for it is not the perfection of the works of the regenerate, but the satisfaction of Christ imputed to them by faith, which is the cause on account of which there is no condemnation to them. Hence, this is all that follows, that the works of the regenerate are perfect, either in themselves, or in respect to the satisfaction of God imputed to them, and not condemned as impure in the judgment of God. Objection 4. The severity of divine justice does not render good according to works which are not perfectly good, but Christ in the final judgment will render to every one, and so to the saints also, according to their works. 
Therefore the works of the saints are so perfect that they will in themselves stand in the judgment of God. Answer. There are here four terms, because the major must be understood of a legal reward of works, whilst the minor must be understood of a reward which is evangelical, or to express it differently, we may say that the justice of God does not render good according to works which are imperfect, if he judges according to the covenant of perfect obedience to the law. But Christ, in rewarding the works of the saints, will not judge according to the covenant of perfect works, but according to the covenant of faith, or of his own righteousness imputed and applied to them by faith. And yet he will judge them according to their works, as according to the evidences of their faith, from which their works have proceeded, and which they, as the fruits of this faith, declare them to be. Objection 5. The Scriptures attribute perfection to the works of the saints. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, and that seek him with the whole heart. With my whole heart have I sought thee, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. The heart of Asa was perfect all his days. Psalm 119, verses 1 and 10, Genesis 6, verse 9, 2 Chronicles 15, verse 17. Testimonies of a similar character are found in every part of the Scriptures, therefore the works of the saints are perfect. Answer. These and similar declarations of Scripture speak of that perfection which consists in parts of true sincerity as opposed to hypocrisy and a feigning of piety, and not of that perfection which consists in the degrees of obedience which the saints ought to render to God. For the saints do not in this life attain to that degree of perfect obedience which the law requires, yet they nevertheless have the commencement of perfect obedience to the divine law, and of subjection to God according to all his commandments. And although there is much hypocrisy and sin still remaining even in the most holy, as it is said, let every man be a liar, Romans 3 verse 4, yet there is, notwithstanding, a great difference between those who are altogether hypocrites, whose hypocrisy is pleasing to themselves, having no commencement or sense of true piety in their hearts, and those who, acknowledging and lamenting the remains of hypocrisy in themselves, have, at the same time, the commencement of true faith and conversion to God. The former are commended of God, whilst the latter are received into favour, not on account of this commencement of obedience which is in them, but on account of the perfect obedience of Christ imputed unto them. We must therefore add that those who are converted are perfect in the sight of God, not only as it respects the parts of true piety which are all begun in them, but also in the degrees of the true and perfect righteousness of Christ imputed unto them. As it is said, Ye are complete in him. Christ is made unto us of God wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Colossians 2 verse 10, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. But, say our opponents, the scriptures also attribute the perfection of degrees to the saints, as when it is said, We speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Be not children in understanding, till we all come, in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 6, chapter 14 verse 20, Ephesians 4 verse 13. But these and similar declarations of scripture do not mean by the term perfect, such as are absolutely or wholly conformable to the law, but such as have more knowledge, assurance, and readiness, confirmed by exercise, to obey God, resist carnal desires, and to bear the cross, than others who are not so fully confirmed and established in the principles of piety. For so this perfection is elsewhere explained, where it is said, that we be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but follow after, that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. To will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Ephesians 4 verse 13, Philippians 3 verse 12, Romans 7 verse 18. Hence this perfection is relative, having respect not to the divine law, but to such as are weaker and less confirmed in the faith of the gospel. It is also proper that we should here refer to the passage found in 1 John 4 verses 17 and 18, which our adversaries are wont to bring forward against what we have just said. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because, as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. But John does not mean that our love to God, but his love to us, is perfect, that is, fully expressed and made known unto us by the effects or benefits which God has bestowed upon us in Christ, as Paul declares in the fifth chapter of his epistle to the Romans, that the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. 
is the cause why we look for the day of judgment without fear and with assurance, and that we are assured of this love and mercy of God by this sign or testimony because we are in this life conformed to his image by the Holy Spirit. For we are assured of our justification by our regeneration, not as by the cause of the effect, but as by the effect of the cause. And although regeneration is not perfect in this life, yet, if it be indeed begun, it is sufficient to confirm the truth of our faith to our consciences. And indeed that which John adds when he says, Love casteth out fear, is a proof that love is not as yet perfect in us, because we are not in this life perfectly delivered from fear of the wrath and judgment of God, and of eternal punishment. For the fear and love of God, which are contrary to each other, are here in small degrees in the saints at the same time, their fears decreasing and their love and comfort or joy in God increasing, until joy gains a complete triumph, and perfectly casts out all agitation and fear in the life to come, when God shall wipe away every tear. Objection 6. David says, I have not declined from thy law, I have kept thy law, I have done judgment and justice, judge me according to my righteousness. Psalm 119, verses 50 and 51, and verse 121, Psalm 7, verse 8. Therefore the regenerate may declare their good works in the judgment as being perfectly conformable to the divine law. Answer. These and similar declarations do not claim for the saints absolute conformity to the law in this life, or else they would contradict those passages which speak of the imperfection of the righteous already referred to, but of the righteousness of a good conscience, without which faith cannot stand, just as a good conscience cannot be without faith, as it is said, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. 1 Timothy 1 verses 18 and 19. The saints now do not dread to come before the tribunal of God and comfort themselves with a consciousness of having acted correctly, not indeed because they would oppose this to the judgment of God, or because they are conscious of no sin, for they exclaim in view of their sins, O Lord, enter not into judgment with thy servant. If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, who should stand? But because they have a sincere and not a hypocritical desire to obey God, and have the full assurance that their sins are covered and washed away by the blood of Christ, and that the obedience which is begun in them is pleasing to God for Christ's sake, and that they shall be graciously rewarded by Christ according to the promises of the gospel. Objection 7. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. 1 John 3 verse 9. Therefore new obedience in the saints is perfect and without sin. Answer. But this is to misunderstand the figure of speech which is here used. Not to commit sin is not, according to John, to be without sin, for this he had taught in the first and second chapters of this same epistle, does not take place even in the most holy, but it is not to have reigning sin, nor to persevere in it, which is not inconsistent with true faith and piety in the saints. End of section 73. Section 74 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Use of the Law Question 115. Why will God then have the Ten Commands so strictly preached, since no man in this life can keep them? Answer, first, that all our lifetime we may learn more and more to know our sinful nature, and thus become the more earnest in seeking the remission of sin, and righteousness in Christ. Likewise, that we constantly endeavor and pray to God for the grace of the Holy Spirit, that we may become more and more conformable to the image of God until we arrive at the perfection proposed to us in a life to come. Exposition. When we inquire concerning the use of the divine law, it is necessary that we should keep in view the differences of each part of the law. The use of the ceremonial laws of Moses was one that it might serve as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ and his kingdom. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Galatians 3 verse 24. 2. That it might distinguish the Jewish church from all other nations. 3. That it might be an exercise of piety and a declaration of obedience to the moral law. 4. A confirmation of faith. There were among the ceremonial laws certain sacraments or signs of the covenant and seals of grace as circumcision and the Passover, which declared what benefits God would give to the faithful by the Messiah which was to come. The use of the judicial or civil laws was, one, that they might contribute to the preservation of the mosaic polity, two, that they might be types of the government of the church in the kingdom of Christ, 
inasmuch as the princes and kings of the Jewish nation were no less than the priests, a type of Christ, the high priest and king of the church. These uses, together with the laws themselves, were done away with when the ceremonies of the former dispensation were fulfilled and abrogated by the coming of Christ, and the Mosaic polity overthrown by the Romans. The uses of the moral law are different according to man's fourfold state. First, in nature uncorrupted, or not as yet depraved by sin, as our nature was before the fall, there are two principal uses of the divine law. One, the entire and perfect conformity of man with God. The mind of man before the fall possessed a perfect knowledge of the law, which produced a conformity and correspondence of all the inclinations and actions with the will of God. Two, a good conscience or a consciousness of the divine favor and certain hope of eternal life. The law, according to the order of divine justice, promises life to those who render a perfect obedience to its requirements which if a man do, he shall live in them. Leviticus 18, verse 5. Second, in nature corrupted, and not as yet renewed by the Holy Spirit, there are also two uses of the law, one, the preservation of discipline and external propriety in the church and the world, the law being engraven upon the minds and hearts of all men by God himself, and speaking by the voice of ministers and magistrates, curbs and restrains even the unregenerate, so that they shun those flagrant and open forms of wickedness which are in opposition to the judgment of sound reason, as it utters itself even in persons unrenewed by the Spirit of God, and which must be removed before regeneration. When the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing, or else excusing one another. Romans 2, verses 14 and 15. 2. The knowledge of sin. The law accuses, convinces, and condemns all those who are not regenerated, because they are unrighteous before God and subject to eternal condemnation. We know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Romans 3, verses 19 and 20, chapter 7, verse 7. This use of the law, which consists in a knowledge of sin and of the judgment of God against sin, produces in itself, in the unregenerate, hatred of God, and an increase of sin, and if they are reprobate it drives them into despair, as it is said, The law worketh wrath. Sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. Romans 4 verse 17, chapter 7 verse 8. This knowledge of sin, however, is by an accident, a preparation to conversion as it respects the elect, seeing that God by this means leads and constrains them to acknowledge their unrighteousness, to despair of any help in themselves, and to seek by faith righteousness and life in Christ the Mediator. If there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Galatians 3 verses 21 and 22. Third, in nature restored by Christ, or as it respects the regenerate, there are many uses of the law. One, the preservation of discipline and outward obedience to the law. For although this use has respect chiefly to the unregenerate, as we have already shown, who do not refrain from sin, from love to God and righteousness, but only from a fear and dread of punishment and shame, as the poet says, O derunt peccare mali forme dine poene, they hate to sin from a dread of punishment, yet in like manner has its use in relation to the godly, because, on account of the weakness and corruption of the flesh, it is useful and necessary even to them that the threatenings of the law and the examples of punishment set before them may keep them in the faithful discharge of their duty. For God threatens severe punishment even to the saints if they become guilty of sins of a shameful and grievous nature. When the righteous turneth away from his unrighteousness and committeth iniquity, he shall die in his sins. Ezekiel 18 verse 24. 2. A knowledge of sin. This use of the law, although it likewise has reference chiefly to the unregenerate, nevertheless belongs to the godly also, for the law is to the regenerate as a mirror in which they may see the defects and imperfections of their own nature, and also leads them to true humility before God, that so they may continually advance in true conversion and faith, 
and that whilst the renewing of their nature is going forward, they may become more earnest in prayer and supplication, that they may become more and more conformed to God and the divine law. I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Romans 7, verses 22, 23, and 24. The declaration of the Apostle Paul that the law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ must be understood of both these uses of the law of which we have just spoken, and that in the elect still unregenerate, as well as in those who are already regenerated. To the former it is a preparation to conversion, whilst in the latter it is the carrying forward or increase of conversion, since faith cannot be kindled or remain in the heart unless open and grievous offences, and such as wound the conscience be hated and shunned. Let no man deceive you, he that committeth sin is of the devil. 1 John 3 verse 7. 3. Another use of the moral law is that it may be a rule of divine worship and of a Christian life. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and cause you to walk in my statutes. Psalm 119 verse 105. Jeremiah 31 verse 33. Ezekiel 36 verse 26. This use of the law is peculiar to the regenerate. For although the law be also a rule of life to the unregenerate before their conversion, yet it is not to them a rule of worship and gratitude to God, as in the case of the regenerate. For that the exposition of the law delivered to the church may teach that God is and what he is. 5. The voice of the law sounding in the church is an evident testimony teaching what the true church is and in what true religion consists. It is in the church alone that the law is delivered and taught in its purity and rightly understood, for all other systems of religion have manifestly corrupted it in different ways by approving of manifest errors and heresies which they have mingled more or less with it. 6. It admonishes us of the image of God in man, or, we may say, it is a testimony of the excellency of human nature before the fall and of the original righteousness which was in Adam and is again restored in us by Christ. 7. It is a testimony of eternal life, still future, in which we shall perfectly fulfil the law. The law was given to be observed by man, but it is not observed in this life. Therefore there is another life remaining, in which we shall yield a perfect obedience to the law. 4. In nature perfectly restored and glorified after this life, the law will also have its use, for although the preaching of it and the whole ministry of the church shall then cease, yet there will still remain in the elect a knowledge of the law, whilst perfect obedience to all its demands and full conformity with God will be wrought in them. The law will, therefore, accomplish the same ends in the life to come, when we shall be fully transformed in the image of God that it did in our nature before the fall. The principal arguments of the antinomians, libertines, and other profane heretics of a similar caste who affirm that the law is not to be taught in the Church of Christ. Objection 1. That which cannot be kept is taught to no purpose. The law cannot be kept. Therefore, it is to no purpose that it is taught in the Church of Christ. Answer. There is here a fallacy in urging that as a cause, which is no sufficient reason, for the mere fact that it is impossible for us to render perfect obedience to the law in this infirm state of our being is not of itself a sufficient reason why the preaching of the law should be regarded as useless in the Church, since there may be, and indeed are, other reasons why it is not only useful but even necessary to teach and enforce the law. For we have already shown that the law accomplishes many objects even in respect to the regenerate. It is not necessary, therefore, that when one end or use of the law is removed, that the others should likewise be removed. If it cannot be perfectly obeyed, it should at least be taught and enforced, that we may be led to acknowledge this imperfection and defect, in order that we may the more ardently desire and seek the remission of our sins, and that righteousness which is in Christ and may the more earnestly strive to reach and attain the mark set before us even our perfection in Christ. We may also reply to this objection that it is of no force, inasmuch as it assumes that to be true generally, which is true only in part, for the law may, to a certain extent, be kept by the regenerate, as we have just shown. Hence the minor proposition, if it be understood generally, is not true. Objection 2. He who commands impossibilities commands things which are not profitable. God commands impossibilities in his law, therefore he commands things which are useless, and so by consequence the law itself is of no use. Answer. This argument is nearly the same as the one we have just answered. We reply, however, to the major proposition, 
that he commands things unprofitable who commands impossibilities, one, if the things enjoined be absolutely impossible, two, if they be always impossible, three, if the command have no other objects than that the things which are enjoined be perfectly complied with. But there are many ends on account of which God commands and enforces the law, and requires that it be taught in the church, as may be seen from the remarks which we have already made upon this subject. There is also here the same error which we noticed in the former objection, in regarding that as a cause which is no sufficient reason. Objection 3. We ought not to desire that which God does not desire to give us in this life, and which we cannot obtain. But God does not desire to give us perfect obedience to the law in this life, therefore it is in vain that we desire it, and strive for it by the doctrine of the law. Answer. We ought not to desire that which God does not desire to give us, unless he commands us to desire it, and there be weighty reasons why we should seek to obtain it. But God commands us to seek and to desire the perfect fulfillment of the law in this life, and that one, because he purposes at length to accomplish it in those who desire it, and to grant it to us after this life, if we here truly and heartily desire it. Two, that we may here make progress in true piety, and that the desire to conform our lives to the requirements of the divine law be daily more and more kindled and confirmed in us. Three, that God may, by this desire of fulfilling the law, exercise in us repentance and obedience. Objection 4. Christ is not the lawgiver, therefore his ministers should not teach and enforce the law. Answer. Christ is not the lawgiver as it respects the principal office of the mediator, but he was and is lawgiver, one, in as far as he is God and the author of the law, together with the Father, two, in as far as it belonged to the mediator to free the law from the errors with which it had been corrupted, and to restore its true sense, not indeed chiefly, but that he might be able to accomplish the principal parts of his office, which are comprehended in the reconciliation and salvation of the human race. We may give the same answer to the objection as it relates to the ministers of the gospel, inasmuch as they are to teach and expound no other doctrine to the church than that which Christ himself delivered. Objection 5. He who makes satisfaction to the law by punishment is not bound to obedience according to the rule the law binds to obedience or punishment, but not to both at the same time. We now make satisfaction to the law by the punishment of Christ, therefore we are no longer bound to obey the law. Answer. We must make a distinction in reference to the major proposition he who makes satisfaction by punishment is not bound to obedience, that is, he is not bound to render the same obedience, for the omission of which he suffered punishment, but after it is made he is bound to yield obedience anew to the law, or to suffer new punishment in case he disobey the law. Again, he who makes satisfaction to the law by punishment which is not his own but another's, and is received into favour by God without his own satisfaction, ought still to render obedience to the law, even though it be not to make satisfaction for his sins, but that he may in this way show his gratitude to his Redeemer. We ought, therefore, since Christ has satisfied for our sins by his death, to feel ourselves bound to render obedience, not indeed for the time past, but for the time to come, and this too for the purpose of showing our gratitude for the benefit of our deliverance. He that is dead is freed from sin. We thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Romans 6, verse 7, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15. Objection 6. Christians are not governed by the law, but by the spirit of regeneration, according as it is said, the law is not made for a righteous man. 1 Timothy 1, verse 9. Therefore the law ought not to be taught among Christians. Answer. Christians are indeed not governed by the law, or, in other words, they are not constrained and driven to such a cause of conduct as is right and becoming by the law, and by fear of punishment as the ungodly are. Yet they are, nevertheless, ruled in this sense by the law, that it teaches them what worship is pleasing to God, and the Holy Ghost likewise uses the doctrine of the law for the purpose of inclining them to true and cheerful obedience. The doctrine, therefore, that we are bound to give obedience to the law remains, although there is no condemnation or constraint as far as Christians are concerned. For to this we are bound, that our obedience be most free and cheerful, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, but to the spirit. The law is not given for a righteous man, that is, to constrain and bind him. Romans 8 verse 12, 1 Timothy 1 verse 9. Objection 7. Ye are not under the law, but under grace. Romans 6 verse 14. Therefore the law does not bind us. 
answer. This, however, is to misunderstand the words of the apostle, for the expression, not to be under the law, does not mean that we are not to yield obedience to the law, but that we are freed from the curse and constraint of the law, just as to be under grace is to be justified and regenerated by the grace of Christ. But, say our opponents, those who are bound to obey the law, and yet do not comply with its demands, are subject to condemnation. But we are not exposed to condemnation, for there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1. Therefore we are not bound to obey the law. We reply that the major of this syllogism is true, one, in case he who is bound to yield obedience to the law be bound to yield it in his own person. But we are bound to yield obedience, and do yield it, not in ourselves, but in Christ. Two, in case he be bound to obey the law in himself always, or at all times perfectly, but we are not bound in ourselves to yield perfect obedience to the law in this life, but only to begin this obedience according to all the commandments of God. In eternal life we shall be bound to a perfect conformity to the law. Objection 8. The law is the letter which killeth, and is the ministration of death and condemnation. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 6 and 7. But there is no condemnation to Christians, therefore the law does not have respect to Christians who are in Christ Jesus. Answer. There is here a fallacy of accident, for the law is not in itself the letter which killeth, since this comes to pass by the fault of men, who, the more clearly they perceive the difference between themselves and the law, the more fully do they give themselves over to despair in reference to their salvation, and are therefore slain by the law. Again, the law alone without the gospel is the letter, that is, it is the doctrine which merely teaches, demands obedience, denounces the wrath of God and death to such as are disobedient, without producing the spiritual obedience which it requires. But when it is joined with the gospel, which is the spirit, it also commences to become the spirit which is effectual in the godly, inasmuch as those who are regenerated commence willingly and cheerfully to yield obedience to the law. The law, therefore, is the letter, one, by itself and without the gospel, two, in respect to those who are unregenerated. On the other hand, the gospel is the spirit, that is, it is the ministration and means through which the Holy Ghost, which works spiritual obedience in us, is given, not, indeed, as though all who hear would receive the Holy Ghost and be regenerated, but because faith, by which our hearts are quickened, so that they begin to yield obedience to the law, is received by it. It does not follow, therefore, that the law is no longer to be taught in the church, for Christ himself says, I am not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, Matthew 5, verse 17. And Paul also says that we establish the law through faith, Romans 3, verse 31. Christ fulfilled the law in two respects, by obedience and suffering, he was just and holy in himself, and did not violate the law in a single instance, but partly performed in our behalf those things which he was not bound to do, and partly sustained the punishment of the law. He also fulfills the law in us in two ways, by teaching it and granting unto us his spirit, that so we may commence obedience to it, as we proved when speaking of the abrogation of the law. Objection 9. That is not to be taught in the church which increases sin. The law increases sin, Romans 7 verse 8, therefore it is not to be taught. Answer. There is here a fallacy of accident in the minor proposition. The law increases sin by an accident, or on account of the corruption of man, and that in two ways. First, because the nature of man is so depraved and alienated from God, that men do not perform what they know to be pleasing to God. And, on the other hand, what they know to be prohibited by God, that they desire and do with the greatest willingness. Secondly, because it works wrath, when men fret and murmur against God, hate and turn away from him, and rush into despair according as the law reveals to them a knowledge of their sins, and the punishment which they deserve in consequence thereof. The law in itself produces righteousness, conformity with God, love to God, etc. The law also in itself increases sin, if we understand the word increase in a different sense, viz. that it shows unto us and brings it to pass that we acknowledge the greatness and magnitude of our sins, but not that it so increases sin as that that which in itself is small is made greater and more aggravated. There are, therefore, four terms in this syllogism in consequence of the ambiguity of the word increase in the minor proposition. Objection 10. The law is not necessary to salvation, therefore it should not be taught in the church. Answer. But even though the doctrine of the law is not necessary in order that we may be saved by obedience to it, yet it is nevertheless necessary on account of other causes, as has been already proven. Objection 11. We have all things in Christ according to what is said, and of his fullness have all we received, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 
and ye are complete in him, John 1 verse 16, Colossians 2 verses 3 and 10. Therefore we must not go back from Christ to Moses, nor is there any need of the law in the church of Christ. Answer, there is here a fallacy of the consequent, which proceeds from a statement of the whole to a denial of a part. The whole wisdom and knowledge or doctrine which has been delivered unto us by Christ is sufficient and necessary for the church. But the moral law is also a part of this doctrine, because Christ does not only command that faith, but that repentance also should be preached in his name. Hence the doctrine of the law is not excluded from the perfect wisdom which we have in Christ, but is rather included in it. End of section 74section 75 of commentary on the heidelberg catechism by zacharias ursinus translated by g w williard this librivox recording is in the public domain of prayer 45th lord's day of prayer question 116 why is prayer necessary for christians answer because it is that chief part of thankfulness which god requires of us and also because god will give his grace and holy spirit to those only who with sincere desires continually ask them of him and are thankful for them exposition there are many questions which may be agitated in reference to prayer the chief and most important of which are the following first what is prayer second why is it necessary third what are the things necessary to acceptable prayer Fourth, what is the form of prayer prescribed by Christ? The first and second of these propositions belong to this 116th question of the Catechism, the third to the 117th, and the fourth to the 118th question. First, what is prayer? Prayer consists in calling upon the true God, and arises from an acknowledgment and sense of our want, and from a desire of sharing in the divine bounty, in true conversion of heart and confidence in the promise of grace for the sake of Christ the Mediator, asking at the hands of God such temporal and spiritual blessings as are necessary for us, or in giving thanks to God for the benefits received. The genus or general character of prayer consists in invocation or adoration, Adoration is often used in the sense of the whole worship of God, since we regard him as the true God whom we worship. Prayer is a species or part of invocation, for to call upon the true God is to ask of him such things as are necessary both for soul and body, and to render thanks to him for benefits received. It is here used in the sense of the general character of prayer. There are therefore two species or parts comprehended in prayer, petition and thanksgiving. Petition is a prayer asking of God those blessings necessary both for the soul and body. Thanksgiving is prayer acknowledging and magnifying the benefits received from God, and binding those who receive these gifts to such gratitude as is pleasing to God. Thankfulness in general consists in acknowledging and professing what and how great is the benefit received, and in binding those who are the recipients thereof to the performance of such duties as are mutual, possible, and becoming. It comprehends, therefore, truth and justice. The Apostle Paul, in his first epistle to Timothy, chapter 2, verse 1, enumerates four species of prayer, saying, I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. The first includes prayers against evil things, the second petitions for good things, the third intercession for others, and the fourth thanksgiving for benefits received and evils warded off. This distinction is drawn from the end or design of prayer. Prayer is also distinguished into public and private prayer from the circumstances of person and place. Private prayer is the intercourse which a faithful soul has with God, asking, alone and apart from others, certain blessings for himself or for others, or giving thanks for benefits received. This form of prayer is not restricted to any particular words or places, for oftentimes the heart, when burdened and distressed, gives utterance to nothing more than sighs and groans, and the Apostle commands that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. 1 Timothy 2 verse 8. Public prayer is that which, by the use of certain words, is offered up to God by the whole church in the congregation, the minister leading, as it is right and proper that he should, in the public gatherings of the church. Language, or the use of the tongue, is necessary for this form of prayer. Hence Christ said, When ye pray, say, Our Father, etc., it was also chiefly for this that the tongue was made, that God might be praised and magnified by it, and it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaketh. Lastly, by this others are also invited to praise and worship God. Second, why is prayer necessary for Christians? 
The reasons on account of which prayer is necessary for Christians are these. 1. The command of God. God has commanded that we call upon him and desires that we in this way chiefly worship and praise him. Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee. Ask, and it shall be given you. When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven. Psalm 50 verse 15, Matthew 7 verse 7, Luke 11 verse 2. 2. Our necessity and want. We do not obtain the blessings which are necessary for us, except we ask them at the hands of God, for he has promised them to none but such as ask. Prayer is therefore just as necessary for us as it is necessary for a beggar to ask alms. The same thing must be understood respecting the necessity of thanksgiving, which is said concerning the necessity of prayer. For without the giving of thanks we lose those things which are given, and do not receive those which are necessary and should be given. And the necessity of both will readily appear, whether we consider the effects or cause of faith, and so also faith itself. Faith is neither kindled nor increased in any one who does not desire or ask it. No one has faith who is not thankful for it, for all those who are possessed of true faith taste the grace of God, and those who have tasted of the grace of God show themselves thankful to God for it, and desire it more and more. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Romans 5 verse 5. The Holy Ghost is also obtained by prayer, for he is given to none except those who seek and desire him. Objection 1. But the wicked receive many of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, who nevertheless do not ask or desire them. Therefore these things are not merely given to such as desire them. Answer. The wicked do indeed receive many gifts, but not such as are principal or peculiar to the elect, as faith, repentance, conversion, remission of sins, and regeneration, and still further the gifts which they do receive do not contribute to their salvation, but to their destruction. And should any one reply and say that infants do not desire the Holy Ghost, and yet receive him, so that he must be given to more than those who ask and desire, we answer that the Holy Ghost is not given to any, except such as desire him, which is to say, to adults who are capable of asking and seeking him. And yet even infants desire the Holy Ghost after their manner, in that they have, in possibility, an inclination to seek him just as they, according to their manner, believe, or have an inclination to faith. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength. Psalm 8 verse 2. Objection 2. The effect is not prior to its own proper cause. Prayer is the effect of the Holy Ghost, inasmuch as no one who does not possess the Holy Ghost can desire him, and he alone indicts prayer within us. Therefore, the Holy Ghost is not received by prayer, but is in us before we give utterance to prayer, and is consequently given not merely to such as desire him. Answer. The effect is not prior to its own cause in order and nature, but in time they both exist together. So the Holy Ghost and our desiring him are both in us at the same moment in respect to time, although it is different according to nature. For the Holy Ghost is in us according to nature before we give utterance to prayer, inasmuch as we then for the first time begin to desire him and to ask him of God when he is given unto us, but according to time he is simultaneous with our prayers. For we begin to desire the presence of the Holy Ghost as soon as he is given unto us, and he is also given just as soon as he is desired and sought. Or in other words, God effects in us a desire of the Holy Ghost, and gives him unto us in the very same moment. Yea, it may be said that he produces in us a desire of the Holy Ghost by commanding us to pray for him, and in producing this desire he at the same time gives him unto those who ask and desire him. God does not so work in us, therefore, as when a ray of the sun falls upon a vessel, because the Holy Ghost is a gift of such a character that he is given, received, and prayed for at one and the same time. We might also make a distinction between the beginning and increase of the Spirit within us, inasmuch as we do not desire the latter before we have the former. No one desires the Holy Ghost except he in whom the Spirit dwells, but the first solution or answer which we have given must suffice. For that which Christ says in Luke 11 verse 13, How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? is not to be understood merely of the increase, but also of the beginning of the gifts and graces of the Holy Spirit. Question 117. What are the requisites of that prayer which is acceptable to God and which he will hear? Answer. First, that we from the heart pray to the one true God only, who hath manifested himself in his word, for all things he hath commanded us to ask of him. Secondly, that we rightly and thoroughly know our need and misery, that so we may deeply humble ourselves in the presence of his divine majesty. 
Thirdly, that we be fully persuaded that he, notwithstanding that we are unworthy of it, will, for the sake of Christ our Lord, certainly hear our prayer, as he has promised us in his word. Question 118. What hath God commanded us to ask of him? Answer. All things necessary for soul and body, which Christ our Lord has comprised in that prayer he himself has taught us. Exposition. The conditions of acceptable prayer are 1. That it be directed to the true God, or that the true God be called upon who has revealed himself in the church by the word delivered by the prophets and apostles, and by the word of creation, preservation, and redemption. This true God now is the eternal Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Quote, as we have received, said Basil, so have we been baptized, and as we have been baptized, so do we believe, and as we believe, so do we worship the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. End quote. 2. The second requisite of acceptable prayer is a knowledge of the divine commandment. Without the commandment of God we doubt in regard to our being heard. The person, however, that has an eye to the divine command rests fully assured that his prayers are acceptable to God, because the worship which God requires of us in his word cannot be otherwise than pleasing to him. When we pray, therefore, we ought so to think and resolve, I called upon thee because thou hast commanded me. 3. A knowledge of the things which we ought to ask at the hands of God is also necessary to effectual prayer. God does not desire us to direct vague and wandering petitions to himself, being uncertain what we would pray for. A king would consider himself derided and mocked if any one were to kneel before him without knowing what to ask at his hands. So God will have us consider and think what things we should ask of him if we would pray unto him and not mock him when we come into his presence. We, however, do not know what we should ask. It is for this reason that Christ has prescribed a form of prayer which contains the sum and substance of the things which we should pray for. To sum up the whole in as few words as possible, we would say we should pray for things which we are certain are approved of by God and promised. These consist of two kinds, such as are spiritual and temporal, both of which God desires us to ask at his hand. Spiritual things, because they are necessary to our salvation, and temporal things, one, that the desire of them may exercise our faith and confirm our confidence in regard to our obtaining such things as are spiritual. The reason is because no one can expect good things of God except he be reconciled to him. 2. That we may consider and reflect upon the providence of God, knowing that these small and comparatively unimportant things do not come fortuitously. 4. There must be a true desire for those things which we ask of God if our prayers are heard. God will not have our prayer to be feigned or hypocritical. They must come from the heart and not merely from the lips. God wills us to pray with an earnest desire of the heart, for it is not the words of the mouth but the sighs and groans of the heart that constitute true prayer. As the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? When Moses nevertheless said nothing. Exodus 14 verse 15 Hence an ardent desire is to be made the general and chief thing in the definition of prayer. 5. A knowledge and sense of our own want. This should be the spring or fountain from which all our desires should proceed, for what any one does not feel himself greatly in need of, that he will not ardently desire. All of us now stand in need of God. 6. True humility with an acknowledgement of our want. We should cast ourselves before the Divine Majesty as humble suppliants, God is under no obligation to us. All of us, too, were the enemies of God before our conversion. God now does not hear sinners, that is, such proud sinners as the Pharisee was, who prayed standing in the highest seat in the temple. Hence true humility, penitence, and conversion are necessary to acceptable prayer. The promises of God, too, have respect merely to such as are converted. No one can pray in faith without conversion to God, and without faith no one can have any assurance of being heard, nor does he receive what he desires. 7. A knowledge of Christ the Mediator and trust in Him are likewise necessary in order that we may rest assured that both we and our prayers please God, not on account of any worthiness on our part, but only for the Mediator's sake. It was in this way that Daniel prayed and asked to be heard for the Lord's sake. Daniel 9 verse 17. Christ also commands us to pray to the Father in His name. Our prayers should be placed upon our altar, even Christ. So shall they be acceptable to God. 8. Confidence of being heard. As it respects the former condition, faith is necessary in order that we may be fully persuaded that we are just before God, and that He is reconciled to us in Christ. 
Here, faith or confidence of being heard is necessary, inasmuch as this cannot exist independent of the former, because ye are sons, God hath put forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Galatians 4, verse 6, Hebrews 11, verse 6. We must, however, here observe in respect to this confidence of being heard, that there is a difference in the things which are to be prayed for. Some gifts are necessary to salvation, as are those which are spiritual, whilst there are others, such as are temporal, without which we may be saved. The former are to be simply and positively desired with full confidence that we shall as certainly receive them, as we ask them specially at the hands of God. The latter are indeed to be sought and desired, but with the condition of the will of God, that he will confer them upon us if they contribute to his glory and are profitable to us, or that he will confer upon us other and better things, either now or hereafter, as may seem best in his sight. We should, in praying for these things, imitate the example of the leper who said, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Matthew 8 verse 2 It is in this way that the faithful present their prayers before God and desire to be heard, inasmuch as we oftentimes pray for things which perhaps be more injury than advantage to us if God were to hear and grant our requests. Objection. He who asks doubtingly does not in faith, and is not heard. We seek temporal things with doubt inasmuch as we pray for them conditionally, therefore we do not ask them in faith. Answer. The major proposition is either particular, or else is not true. For the nature of faith does not depend that we be fully assured in reference to temporal blessings, but merely in reference to spiritual blessings, such as the forgiveness of sins and eternal life, which are necessary to salvation. Respecting temporary benefits, it is sufficient if faith submit itself to the word of God, and to desire and pray for such things as are profitable for us. We also deny the truth of the minor proposition, for, although we do pray conditionally for temporal blessings, yet we do not simply doubt in regard to our obtaining them. We believe that we shall obtain from God the temporal blessings which we ask at his hand, if they contribute to our salvation, and do not desire to be heard if they would be injurious to us. We therefore, notwithstanding, ask in faith, when we submit to the word of God and acquiesce in his will, and pray to be heard according to the good pleasure of our Heavenly Father. For faith submits itself to every word and desire of God, but the will and pleasure of God consist in this, that we desire and pray for spiritual things simply, and for temporal things conditionally, and that we be fully persuaded that we shall receive the former particularly, and the latter in as far as they contribute to the glory of God and our salvation. Praying in this way we do not doubt in regard to our being heard. 9. A knowledge of the divine promise with confidence in it. God promises that he will hear those who call upon him, observing the conditions which we have now specified. Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee. And it shall come to pass, that before they call I will answer, and while they are yet speaking I will hear. Psalm 50 verse 15, Isaiah 65 verse 24. Without this promise that we shall be heard in what we ask of God, there is no faith, and without faith prayer is of no avail. Except we have faith in the divine promises, and have a regard to them in our prayers, they will not avail us anything, neither can we desire anything with a good conscience. Confidence in the divine promise produces an assurance of being heard, and of our salvation, which assurance kindles in us a desire of calling upon God, and of making supplication to Him. From the conditions which we have specified as being necessary to constitute acceptable prayer, it readily appears what a great difference there is between the prayers of the godly and the ungodly, the godly desire to observe all these conditions in drawing near to God in prayer. The ungodly, on the other hand, either neglect all of them, or else they observe one or two of these conditions, and fall short as it respects the rest. Some commit an error, as it were, in the very threshold, having an incorrect knowledge of the nature and will of God, and so violate the very first condition necessary to acceptable prayer. Some err in things which they pray for, in that they pray for things that are evil, uncertain, and not approved of by God. Some ask blessings of God hypocritically, some ask without any consciousness or sense of the want of the blessings for which they pray. Some have no confidence in Christ the Mediator, some ask that they may be heard in the things which they pray for, and yet persist in sin. Some ask things necessary for salvation, and yet do it with distrust. 
Some others again address prayers to God, and yet never think of the divine promise, and therefore ask without faith, and so receive no answer to their prayers. Question 119. What are the words of that prayer? Answer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever. Amen. Exposition. The form of prayer prescribed by Christ is recited by two of the evangelists, Matthew and Luke. It is, without doubt, the best and most expressive and perfect form of prayer that ever has been delivered. It was delivered by Christ, who is the wisdom of God, and whose words were always heard and answered by his heavenly Father. It also contains, in the most condensed form, all things which are to be sought as necessary for soul and body. It is, in like manner, a rule or pattern with which all our prayers ought to conform and agree. It is sometimes asked, are we so bound down to this form of prayer as not to be permitted to use other and different words when we pray? We reply to this question that Christ delivered this form, not that we should be restricted to these words, but that we might know what things we should ask of God and how we should ask them. It is a general form respecting the manner and the things which we should pray for. It is likewise frequently the case that there are particular benefits necessary to us, which we should particularly ask of God, according as it is said, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, John 16, verse 23, James 1, verse 5, Matthew 24, verse 20. But these things are not to be found in this prayer, as far as the words are concerned. There are also many examples of prayers, both in the Old and New Testament, which, as to the words at least, are different from this prayer, as the prayers of Jehoshaphat, Solomon, Daniel, of Christ himself, of the apostles, etc. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 6, 2 Kings 8, verse 15, Daniel 9, verse 4, John 17, verse 1, Acts 4, verse 24. These prayers, too, were heard and answered of God. It follows, therefore, that this form of prayer prescribed by Christ is a thing indifferent in as far as it respects the words. Objection 1. But we must not pretend to be wiser than Christ. Therefore, since he has prescribed a certain form of prayer for us, we should be satisfied with it and are chargeable with doing wrong whenever we use other forms of prayer. Answer. We should indeed do wrong in departing from this form of prayer if Christ had intended to restrict us to its use. But he did not design to restrict us to the very language of this prayer, for his purpose was, when he gave this form to the disciples, and taught them thus to pray, to give them a summary of the things which we should ask of God in our prayers. Objection 2. That should be retained than which no better can be invented, but it is not possible for us to invent any better form of prayer, nor to select more suitable words than we find in the Lord's Prayer. Therefore we should retain both the form and the words of Christ. Answer. We cannot invent a better form nor more suitable words for the purpose of expressing the same summary, which is, as it were, the general of all those things which we ought to seek in prayer. These kinds or classes of benefits which Christ has prescribed in this form of prayer as the ones to be prayed for cannot be presented in a better form, but then Christ will have us to descend into particulars and to pray for special benefits according to our necessity. The form which Christ has prescribed is nothing else than a series of certain classes or heads under which may be comprehended and referred all spiritual and temporal blessings necessary for us. Hence, when Christ commands us to pray for these general benefits, he at the same time commands us to pray for every special benefit included in that which is general. And still further, those things which are here expressed generally, we ought to specify particularly that we may in this way be led to a consideration of our necessity and to a desire of asking God to help us in our necessity. But it is necessary, in order that we may do this, that we should have special forms of prayer, for the explanation of that which is general by that which is special necessarily requires other forms of expression. Hence Augustine declares that all the prayers of the saints which we have in the Scriptures are contained in the Lord's Prayer. Augustine also adds that we are at liberty to express the same things in other words when we pray, but are not allowed to pray for things different from those comprehended in this prayer. 46th Lord's Day Question 120 Why hath Christ commanded us to address God thus, our Father? Answer 
that immediately, in the very beginning of our prayer, he might excite us in a childlike reverence for and confidence in God, which are the foundation of our prayer, namely that God is become our Father in Christ and will much less deny us what we ask of him in true faith than our parents refuse us earthly things. Exposition. The Lord's Prayer consists of three parts, a preface, petitions, and a conclusion. The preface is contained in the words, Our Father, which art in heaven. This again consists of two parts, a calling upon the true God contained in the words, Our Father, and a description of the true God expressed by the words, Who art in heaven. Christ will have us to pray in this way because God desires to be called upon with due honor, which consists, one, in true knowledge, two, in confidence, three, in obedience. Obedience comprehends true love, fear, hope, humility, and patience. Our Father. God is our Father, one, in respect to our creation, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Two, in respect to our redemption and reception into divine favor through Christ our Mediator. Christ is the only begotten and natural Son of God. We are by nature the children of wrath and are adopted as children by God for Christ's sake. 3. In respect to our sanctification or regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Christ will have us call God Father, and so to address Him, 1. That we may direct true prayer to God, who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2. On account of true knowledge, that we may know and acknowledge Him to be our Father, who, for the sake of the Son of God, our Mediator, adopted us as His children, when we were His enemies. I ascend unto my Father and your Father. John 20, verse 17. This same God also regenerates us by the Holy Ghost, and confers upon us all necessary good. 3. On account of reverence, or that we may be led to cherish true reverence towards God, for since He is our Father, we therefore conduct ourselves as it is proper for children to do, and cherish such reverence for Him as children ought to have for a Father, especially those who have been adopted, and are undeserving of the benefits of God. 4 on account of confidence, or that we may have such a confidence wrought in us as that by which we may be assured of being heard, and that God will grant us all things which pertain to our salvation. For since God, whom we call upon, is our Father, and loved us so greatly as to give his only begotten Son to die for us, how shall he not with him give us all things necessary to our salvation? Romans 8 verse 32. 5. For a remembrance of creation. God now will hear none but those who thus pray unto him, because it is in them only that he obtains the end of his blessings. Objection 1. We call upon the Father according to the command of Christ, therefore we are not to call upon the Son and Holy Ghost. Answer. We deny the consequence which is here drawn, for it is no just conclusion which infers that certain attributes are withdrawn from the other persons of the Godhead when they are attributed to one of the persons. Again, the name of the Father, as the name of God, when it is opposed to creatures must be understood essentially, and when it is used in connection with the other persons of the Godhead, it must be understood personally. The name Father must, therefore, here be understood essentially, the reasons of which are evident, one, because the name of Father is not here put in opposition to the other persons of the Godhead, but in opposition to creatures by whom he is called upon. It is in this way that Christ is called by the prophet Isaiah, the everlasting Father, Isaiah 9 verse 6, 2, because when one of the persons of the Godhead is named, the others are not excluded when mention is made of their external operations or works. 3. We cannot think of God the Father and draw near to Him except in His Son, our Mediator. The Son has also made us the sons of God by the Holy Spirit, who is for this reason called the Spirit of Adoption. 4. Christ commands us to call upon Him likewise, saying, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, He will give it you. John 16, verse 23. 5. Christ gives the Holy Ghost. It is, therefore, He Himself from whom we are to ask the Holy Spirit. Objection 2. Christ is called and is our brother. Therefore, He is not our Father. Answer. He is our brother in as far as He is man, and our Father in as far as He is God, our Creator and Redeemer. He is the Everlasting Father. Isaiah 9, verse 6. Objection 3. He who receives us into favor for Christ's sake is not Christ himself. But the Father, whom we hear so call, receives us into favor for Christ's sake. Therefore he is not Christ. Answer. He who receives us into favor for Christ's sake is not Christ himself, viz. in the same respect. Christ, as mediator, is he on account of whom we are received into divine favor, but as God he is the person who receives us. Our Father. 
Why does Christ direct us to say our Father and not my Father? He does this, one, that he may excite in us a confidence of being heard, for since we do not pray alone, but seeing that the whole church unites its voice with ours, God will not reject the prayers of the whole church, but hears them according as it is said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. But someone may perhaps be ready to say, it is often the case that Christians pray at home when the church is ignorant of it. But then Christians and the whole church always pray for themselves and for all the members with desire and affection. Love is an habitual quality, abiding even when we are asleep, and is not an affection or passion quickly passing away. Hence, when anyone prays alone in his closet, the whole church prays with him in affection and desire. 2. That he might admonish us to mutual love. Christians possessing mutual love should pray one for another. It is for this reason that Christ, by placing the word our in the very commencement of this prayer, would admonish us of the duty of cherishing mutual love. 1. Because where there is no true love to our neighbor, there is no true prayer. Neither can we have any assurance that God will hear us. For if we come into the presence of God, having no regard for our brethren, the sons of God, he will not regard us as his sons. 2. Because where there is no love to our neighbor, there is no faith, and without faith there is no prayer. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Romans 14, verse 23. Objection. It belongs to a father to withhold nothing from his children. But God withholds many things from us. Therefore he is not our father. Answer. It belongs to a father to grant his children everything necessary and proper for them, and to withhold from them whatever is unnecessary, useless, and hurtful. It is in this way that God deals with us giving us all good things, temporal and spiritual, which are necessary and profitable, and contribute to our salvation. Question 121. Why is here addeth, which art in heaven? Answer, lest we should form any earthly conceptions of God's heavenly majesty, and that we may expect from his almighty power all things necessary for soul and body. Exposition. The second part of the preface of the Lord's Prayer is contained in the words, who art in heaven, that is heavenly. The term heaven, as here used, signifies the abode or habitation of God, of the holy angels and blessed men, concerning which God says in the prophecy of Isaiah, Heaven is my throne, and of which Christ says, In my Father's house are many mansions. Isaiah 66 verse 1, John 14 verse 2. God is indeed everywhere by his immensity, but he is said to exist and to dwell in heaven, because he is there more glorious than in the world, and there manifests himself immediately. Christ now commands us to address God as our Father who art in heaven, one, that he might show what a contrast and difference there is between earthly parents and his Father, or that he might separate him from earthly parents, and that we might regard him as such a Father, one, who is not earthly but heavenly, dwelling gloriously in heaven, two, who rules everywhere with heavenly glory and majesty, presides over all things, and who governs by his providence the whole world which he himself created. 3. Who is free from all manner of corruption and change. 4. Who even there, that is, in heaven, manifests himself gloriously to angels, and declares what a father he is, how good, how great and rich. 2. That he might excite in us a confidence that God hears us, because if he is our father and is possessed of infinite goodness, which he especially displays in heaven, then he will also give us all things necessary for our salvation, and if this our Father be also Lord in heaven and possessed of infinite power, so that he can help us in our need, then he can also easily grant unto us what we ask at his hands. 3. That he might excite in us reverence, for since our Father is so great a Lord, even one that is heavenly, who rules everywhere, and has power to cast both soul and body into hell, we ought to reverence him and come into his presence with the greatest humiliation of soul and body. 4. That we may call upon him in fervency of spirit. 5. That the minds of all those who worship him may be elevated and fixed upon heavenly things. 6. That we may be led to desire heavenly things. 7. That we may not fall into the error of the heathen who imagine that God can be adored and worshipped in creatures. 8. That we might be admonished not to direct our prayers to any particular place as under the Old Testament. End of section 75. Section 76 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Asinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
the first petition. 47th Lord's Day, question 122, what is the first petition? Answer, hallowed be thy name, that is, grant us rightly to know thee, and to sanctify, glorify, and praise thee in all thy works, in which thy power, wisdom, goodness, justice, mercy, and truth are clearly displayed, and further also that we may so direct and order our lives, our thoughts, words, and actions, as that thy name may never be blasphemed, but rather honoured and praised on our account. Exposition The second part of the Lord's Prayer now follows, containing six petitions. The petition, Hallowed be thy name, is placed first in order, because it comprehends the end and design of all the rest, inasmuch as the glory of God should be the end of all our affairs, actions, and prayers. The end, too, is the first thing in the thoughts and intention of any one, and the last in execution. Therefore, the end of the other petitions should be sought in the first place, if we would seek them aright, according to the command of Christ, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things shall be added unto you. Matthew 7, verse 33. We must consider, in reference to this petition, first, what is the name of God, second, what is holy, and what is it to hallow the name of God. First, what is the name of God? The name of God signifies, one, God himself. Let them that love thy name be joyful in thee. I will sing praise to thy name. I will call upon the name of the Lord. I purpose to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God. Psalm 5 verse 11, 9 verse 2 and 11, 116 verse 13, 1 Kings 5 verse 5. 2. The attributes and works of God. The Lord is his name. The Lord whose name is Jealous. Exodus 15 verse 3, 34 verse 14. 3. The command, will, and authority of God. I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. 1 Samuel 17 verse 45, Matthew 28 verse 19. 4. The worship, trust, praise, and profession of God. I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. In which place, as also in Matthew 28 verse 19, the name of God signifies both the command and profession of God. Acts 21 verse 13, chapter 2 verse 38. Here the term is to be understood according to the first and second signification, as being taken for God himself, and for all his attributes and works in which his majesty shines. Second, what is holy and what to hallow. The term holy signifies one, God himself, who is most holy and pure, or it signifies essential and uncreated holiness which is God himself, for all the virtues and properties of God constitute his essential holiness. So the angels exclaim in reference to God, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, Isaiah 6, 3. 2. The holiness which is in creatures, which consists in their conformity with God, which, as it respects the godly, is merely begun, but is perfect in the angels. 3. The setting of anything apart to a holy use. In this sense, whatever is consecrated to a sacred purpose is called holy, as the temple in Jerusalem, the altar, the vessels, the priests, etc., etc. The word to sanctify or hallow has these three significations. First, to hallow or to sanctify means to acknowledge, to reverence and praise that as holy which is already in itself holy. In this sense of the term, we are said to sanctify God, who is holiness itself, one, when we acknowledge him to be such as he has revealed himself in his word and works, or when we know and think concerning his essence, will, works, omnipotence, goodness, wisdom, and all his other attributes, what he commands us in his word to know and think respecting them. Two, we do not only acknowledge God to be holy, but also profess and praise him, and that by our words and confession, as well as by our actions and purity of life. 3. When we refer the true doctrine, knowledge, and profession of the holiness of God, together with all our praises and actions, to the end to which God will have them referred, which is to his glory and praise. Secondly, to sanctify is to separate that which in itself is not holy from all uncleanness and make it holy. It was in this way that the word sanctified that nature which he assumed, which in us is corrupt and unholy. 
preserving it in himself from all the contagion of sin, and at the same time adorning it with perfect holiness. So also God and Christ sanctify the church, by remitting unto us all our sins, and sanctifying us by the Holy Spirit, and at the same time keeping us in the enjoyment of this pardon and holiness. So we are commanded to sanctify ourselves, which is to keep ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh. Be ye holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter 1 verse 16. Thirdly, to sanctify is to ordain and to direct to a holy end that which in itself is either holy or indifferent. It was in this way that the Father sanctified the Son, that is, he ordained him to the office of a mediator and sent him into the world. So God sanctified the Sabbath day, the temple, the sacrifices, the priests, etc. Christ also sanctified himself in this way for his people, that is, he offered himself a sacrifice holy and acceptable to God. It is in this way also that bread is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Of these significations, the first and second are here in point, for when we pray, Hallowed be thy name, we do not merely desire that the name of God be hallowed by us, but also in us, or in other words, we desire, one, that God would enlighten us with the knowledge of his holiness and most holy name, or in the language of the Catechism, we desire that God will grant us rightly to know him, and to sanctify, glorify, and praise him in all his works, in which his power, wisdom, goodness, justice, mercy, and truth are clearly displayed. Two, that his name may be sanctified in us, and that he would regenerate us and make us more and more holy, so that in our whole life we may prevent his most holy name from being blasphemed, and may magnify and declare it with honour and praise in every conceivable way. In a word, we desire, one, that God would enlighten us with the true knowledge of his holiness, two, that he would grant us true faith and repentance, and renew us by his Spirit, that we may be holy as he is holy. 3. That he would give us a disposition to profess this holiness of his divine name in word and deed, to his own praise and glory, that we may in this way glorify him by acknowledging and professing him, and by conforming our lives to his holy will, so as to distinguish him from all idols and profane things. Objection 1. That which is holy in itself cannot be sanctified. The name of God is holy in itself, therefore it cannot be hallowed. Answer. It cannot be sanctified according to the second signification of the term, as above explained, but it may be sanctified according to the first and third signification of the term, according to which that which is holy or indifferent in itself may be acknowledged, praised and celebrated, and directed to a holy end. It is in this way now that we desire the name of God to be hallowed, that that which is holy in itself may also be acknowledged and praised as holy. God sanctifies us by making us holy. We, on the other hand, sanctify God, not by making him holy, but by declaring and acknowledging concerning him what he desires us to know and declare. Objection 2. We ought not to desire another to do for us what belongs to us to do. We now ought to sanctify and hallow the name of God, therefore we should not desire that God would hallow his name, for in so doing we seem to act like a scholar, who, being commanded by his preceptor to apply himself diligently to his studies, desires his preceptor himself to do it for him. We reply to the major proposition by making a distinction. We should not desire another to do what is devolving upon us, provided we have the ability of ourselves to do it. But what we are unable of ourselves to perform that we properly desire God to grant us the ability to do. But we cannot of ourselves sanctify and hallow the name of God. Therefore we must needs pray to God to grant unto us the strength by which we may hallow the name of God. Yea, and that he himself would hallow his holy name in us. End of section 76「Section 77 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Second Petition. 48th Lord's Day, Question 123, which is the Second Petition. Answer, Thy Kingdom come, that is, rule us so by thy word and spirit, that we may submit ourselves more and more to thee, preserve and increase thy church, destroy the works of the devil, and all violence which would exalt itself against thee, 
and also all wicked counsels devised against thy holy word, until the full perfection of thy kingdom takes place, wherein thou shalt be all in all. Exposition, thy kingdom come. The sense is, let thy kingdom grow amongst us and increase by continual advances, and always by new accessions, O God, let thy kingdom which thou hast in thy church be enlarged and multiplied. The questions which chiefly claim our attention in connection with this petition are the following. First, what is the kingdom of God? Second, how manifold is the kingdom of God? Third, who is the head and king of this kingdom? Fourth, who are the subjects of this kingdom? Fifth, what are the laws of this kingdom? Sixth, what are the benefits enjoyed in this kingdom? Seventh, who are its enemies? Eighth, where is it administered? Ninth, how long will it continue? Tenth, how it comes to us? Eleventh, why should we pray that it may come? First, what is the kingdom of God? A kingdom in general is a form of civil government in which some one person possesses the chief power and authority, who, being possessed of greater and more excellent gifts and virtues than others, rules over all according to just, wholesome and certain laws by defending the good and punishing the wicked. The kingdom of God is that in which God alone rules and exercises dominion over all creatures, but especially does he govern and preserve the church. This kingdom is universal. The special kingdom of God, that which he exercises in his church, consists in sending the Son from the Father, from the very beginning of the world, that he might institute and preserve the ministry of the church, and accomplish his purposes by it, that he might gather a church from the whole human race by his word and spirit, rule, preserve, and defend it against all enemies, raise it from death and at length, having cast all enemies into everlasting condemnation, adorn it with heavenly glory, that God may be all in all, and be praised eternally by the church. From this definition we may infer and specify these particular parts of the kingdom of God. 1. The sending of the Son, our mediator, into the world. 2. The institution and preservation of the ministry by Him. 3. The gathering of the church from the whole human race, by the preaching of the gospel and by the power of the Holy Ghost, working true faith and repentance in the elect. 4. The perpetual government of the church. 5. The preservation of it in this life, notwithstanding all the fierce assaults of enemies. 6. The casting of all the enemies of the church into everlasting punishment. 7. The raising of the church to everlasting life. 8. The glorification of the church in eternal life when God will be all in all. Of this kingdom it is said, I have set my king upon the holy hill of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. My kingdom is not of this world. Psalm 2 verse 6, Psalm 110 verse 2, John 18 verse 36. From these things it is apparent that this kingdom is not a worldly but a spiritual kingdom. This is taught in many of the parables of our Lord, as well as in the declaration which he made to Pilate, saying, My kingdom is not of this world. We are here taught and commanded to pray that this kingdom may come, increase, and be defended. Second, how manifold is the kingdom of God. This kingdom is only one in reality, but differs in the mode of its administration. It is administered differently here from what it is in heaven. It is commonly spoken of and distinguished as the kingdom of grace and of glory. The same distinction is sometimes expressed in this way. The kingdom of heaven is twofold. The one is begun in this life, the other is perfected in the life to come. When we pray, Thy kingdom come, we desire both that it may be established among and in us in this life, and that it may be brought to its highest and ultimate development in the life to come. Yet it is the same kingdom, distinct only by degrees and in the mode of administration. This kingdom, as it exists in this world, has need of means, but in its ultimate state of development there will be no need of means, because the church will then be perfectly glorified and delivered from the evil of guilt and punishment when God shall be all in all. This may be regarded as furnishing an explanation of what the Apostle says in reference to this kingdom, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 24, where he declares that Christ shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, by which we are to understand that what pertains to the form of the administration of this kingdom, Christ will deliver up to the Father after the glorification of the church, and will then cease to discharge the office of mediator. There will then be no need of conversion, of abolishing of sin, of defense against enemies, of gathering the church, of raising the dead and glorifying them, because the saints will then have been perfected and glorified. Christ, 
will not then teach his people, for they shall all be taught of God. Prophecies shall be abolished, tongues shall cease, and knowledge shall vanish away. For when that which is perfect shall come, then that which is in part shall be done away. The means, therefore, by which the church is now gathered and preserved in the world will then be no longer required. There will then be no enemies to subdue, but the church will reign gloriously with Christ, and God shall be all in all, that is, he will manifest and communicate himself immediately to the blessed. And I saw no temple therein, viz. in this kingdom, in its state of ultimate development, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it, and the city shall have no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Revelation 21, verses 22 and 23. Third, who is king and head in this kingdom of God? The head and king of this kingdom is one, because there is one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The Father reigns by the Son and Holy Ghost. Christ is the head of this kingdom, in a particular manner, one, because he is God, sitting at the right hand of the Father, ruling all things in equal power and glory with the Father. Two, because he is mediator, or that person through whom God the Father works immediately and gives the Holy Spirit. When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, and gave him to be head over all things to the church. John 15, verse 26, Ephesians 1, verse 22. Fourth, who are the citizens and subjects of this kingdom? The citizens of this kingdom include, one, the angels who are confirmed in holiness, two, the saints in heaven composing what is called the church triumphant, three, the godly, or those who are converted and still living in the world, having as yet many cares and remains of corruption, composing what is called the church militant, four, hypocrites who are members merely of the visible church without being truly converted, these are merely apparent citizens being members of the kingdom of Christ only in name. They are called citizens of this kingdom, as the Jews were called by Christ, the children of the kingdom, Matthew 8, verse 12. Of these persons it will be said, the first shall be last, Matthew 20, verse 16, that is, those who wish to be regarded as the first, and yet are not, shall be last. They shall be declared as such as have no place in the kingdom of God. Fifth, what are the laws of this kingdom? The laws according to which this kingdom is administered are 1. The word of God, or the doctrine of the law and the gospel. 2. The power and efficacy of the Holy Spirit working and reigning in the hearts of the elect by the word. 4. What benefits does the king bestow upon his subjects in this kingdom? There is no kingdom which does not have a regard for the well-being of its subjects. Aristotle, in writing to Alexander, says, quote, A kingdom is not injury or oppression, but bountifulness. End quote. Hence the kingdom of God has, in like manner, benefits peculiar to itself. These are the spiritual and eternal benefits of Christ, including true faith, conversion, the forgiveness of sins, righteousness, perseverance in holiness, the Holy Spirit, glorification, and eternal life. If the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. John 8, verse 36, Romans 14, verse 17, John 14, verse 27. Seventh, who are the enemies of the kingdom of God? The enemies of the kingdom of God are the devil and wicked men. Of the latter, some are in the church as hypocrites, who arrogate to themselves the name and title of citizens of this kingdom, whilst they are nothing more than the pretended friends of Christ. Others again are without the church and are its open and avowed enemies, as the Turks, the Jews, the Samasartinians the Arians and all those who defend errors that subvert the foundation of our most holy religion. Eighth, where is this kingdom administered? This kingdom, as it respects the beginning and gathering of it, is administered here upon earth, yet in such a way that it is not confined in any one particular place, island, province, and nation, but is scattered over the whole world. I will that men pray everywhere. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. 1 Timothy 2 verse 8, Matthew 18 verse 20. No one ever falls from or loses his right and title to this kingdom if he continues in true faith. This kingdom is administered in heaven as it respects its complete development. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there shall also my servant be. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. We shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 
John 14, verse 3, chapter 12, verse 26, chapter 17, verse 24, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. Ninth, how long will this kingdom continue? The gathering of this kingdom continues from the beginning to the end of the world, because there always were, now are, and ever shall be, some members of the true church, whether few or many, who are to be gathered from the world into the kingdom of God. This kingdom will continue in its state of perfection, from the glorification of the righteous to all eternity. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, which, as we have already observed, must be understood respecting the form of the administration of this kingdom. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 24 Tenth, how this kingdom comes to us. This kingdom comes to us in four ways. One, by the preaching of the gospel, which reveals unto us a knowledge of the true and heavenly doctrine. Two, by conversion, when some are converted to God, who grants unto them faith and repentance. Three, by increase and development, when the godly make progress in holiness, or when the gifts peculiar to the faithful are continually being increased in those who are converted. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. Revelation 22, verse 11. Four, by the perfection and glorification of the church at the second coming of Christ. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, Revelation 22, verse 20. Eleventh, why should we desire the coming of this kingdom? We ought to pray that the kingdom of God may come both as to its commencement and ultimate development, one, on account of the glory of God, or for the sanctification and hallowing of his name. For that we may sanctify the name of God, it is necessary that he should rule us by his word and spirit. If God does not establish his kingdom in us and rescue us from the kingdom of the devil, we will never sanctify his name, but rather defile and cast reproach upon it, so that this second petition is necessary on account of the first. 2. On account of our comfort and salvation, God gives this kingdom to none except those who desire and pray for it, just as he gives the Holy Ghost to none but such as desire him. From these things we may readily perceive what it is that we pray for by this petition, Thy kingdom come. We desire and pray that God will, by his Son, our Mediator, whom he sent into the world from the very beginning, 1. Preserve the ministry which he has instituted, 2. That he would collect his church by the ministry of his word and the influence of the Holy Spirit, 3. That he would rule and govern the church thus gathered and ask his members by his Holy Spirit, who may subdue our hearts, control and change our wills, and conform us wholly to himself, 4. That he would defend us and the whole church against all enemies and tyrants. 5. That he would cast all his and our enemies into everlasting punishment. 6. That he would at length deliver his church and us from all evils and glorify us in eternal life. Objection. But that which our prayers neither hasten nor retard is sought and prayed for in vain, the kingdom of God or the deliverance of the church from all the evils and miseries to which it is here subject, will not take place sooner or later than God has decreed it. Therefore it is sought and prayed for in vain. Answer. We deny the major proposition, for if this were so, we might reason and conclude in the same way in reference to all the benefits which God confers upon us, that they should not be sought, inasmuch as they are all comprehended in his counsel. To this it is replied as follows. 1. But God has promised other blessings, with the condition that we should ask them at his hands. Answer. So also deliverance from all evils shall at length reach and be granted only to those in that day who desire and long for it, whilst groaning under the cross, and who pray that it may come according to the decree of God, and that not one of the elect may be excluded. 2. But we ought not to pray that God would hasten the deliverance of the church, because this would result in the loss of many of the elect who are not as yet born into the world. Answer. When we pray that God would hasten the deliverance of the church, we also pray that all those who are to be brought into the fold of Christ may speedily be brought in, so that not one may be excluded, and this we do, one, that the church may be speedily delivered, and that all the godly may enjoy a full and perfect rest from all their labours and cares, two, that wickedness and ungodliness of every description may be speedily brought to an end, and that all the enemies of Christ and his church may be cast into everlasting punishment, three, that the glory of God may be speedily seen in the perfect deliverance of the church and the rejection of all her enemies. We should therefore desire and ask of God in our daily prayers this our deliverance, and that also of the whole church, if we ourselves would at length be delivered with the church, 
For those who do not desire and pray for the coming of the Lord, to them he will not come as to his saints. End of section 77. Section 78 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Third Petition. 49th Lord's Day, question 124, which is the third petition. Answer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is, grant that we and all men may renounce our own will, and without murmuring obey thy will, which is only good, that so every one may attend to and perform the duties of his station and calling, as willingly and faithfully as the angels do in heaven. Exposition. In considering this petition, we must inquire, first, what is the will of God? Second, what we desire in this petition, and in what does it differ from the second? Third, why is this petition necessary? Fourth, why is it added, as in heaven? First, what is the will of God? The will of God signifies in the scriptures, one, the commandment of God. Ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Psalm 103, verse 21, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. 2. It signifies the events, or rather the decree of God, respecting future events, in which it is continually revealing and manifesting itself, not my will, but thine be done, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Who hath resisted his will? Luke 22, verse 42, Isaiah 46, verse 10, Romans 9, verse 19. Second, What do we desire in this petition, and in what does it differ from the second? Thy will be done. The sense is, cause and grant, that we may do not our own will, which is corrupt and perverse, but thine, which alone is just and holy, and that we may yield obedience to thee. We desire, therefore, one, a denying of ourselves, which consists in these two parts, one, that we hold ourselves in readiness to give up all our desires and wishes which are in opposition to the law of God, two, that we hold ourselves in readiness to take up the cross, and submit ourselves willingly to God in all things. In offering up this petition, Thy will be done, we pray therefore, first of all, that God would bestow upon us His grace, so as to enable us to deny and renounce our own corrupt and perverse will, and be willing to suffer the loss of all things contrary to His will. 2. A cheerful and proper discharge of our duty, that every one in his appropriate sphere may be able to serve God with diligence and to do his will, as well in those duties which are common as in those which are special. Those duties are common which are required not only from us, but also from all Christians, and comprise the virtues necessary for all the godly, as faith, conversion, godliness, charity, temperance, etc. Special duties are those which have respect to our own and to every man's proper calling in life, in praying, therefore, that the will of God may be done, we desire that all these duties may be properly discharged, and that every one may abide in the calling which has been assigned him, and to serve God therein, leaving the final issue of events with God, who disposes and directs all things. 3. We desire that such events, as are not contrary to the will of God, and which are pleasing to him, may come to pass. 4. We pray that all our actions and designs may be blessed and prospered, or that God may be pleased out of his infinite good to direct and accompany with his blessing all our actions, counsels, desires, and labors, so that no other events may follow them but such as he knows will most contribute to his glory and our salvation. God wills that we should desire these things from him and leave the final issue of things with himself, we in the meantime properly discharging our duties. To express the whole in a few words, we may say that when we offer up the petition, Thy will be done, we pray that God may, as it were, bury in us all corrupt desires and wishes, and that He alone may work in us by His Spirit, so that we, being sustained by divine grace, may discharge our various duties and carry out the end of our calling. Objection, but the former petition also contains a request that we may rightly perform our duty. Therefore this seems to be superfluous. Answer, we do not here pray for precisely the same thing that we do in the former petition, for in the former we desire that God may commence his kingdom in us by ruling us by his Spirit, who renews our will so that we henceforth, rightly discharging our duty, may render such obedience to our king as becomes subjects of his kingdom. But in this petition we desire that we may all faithfully carry out the will of God respecting us by properly discharging our duties in the different spheres in which we are placed. 
or we may express the difference thus. In the former petition, we pray that the church may exist, be preserved and glorified. In this, we ask of God that everyone may properly discharge his duty in the church. We may here, as we pass along, notice the connection and difference between the three petitions which we have been considering. The connection between them is of the most intimate character, so much so that no one can exist without the others. The third contributes to the second, and the second to the first, for the name of God is not sanctified unless his kingdom come, nor does the kingdom of God come unless by the use of those means by which it is advanced. These means now are the duties which belong to every man's calling in life. They differ in the following respect. In the first we pray for sanctification, or for the true acknowledgement and praise of God, together with all his works and counsels. In the second we desire the gathering, preservation, and government of the church, and that God may rule us by his word and spirit, defend and protect us, and deliver us from all the evils of guilt and punishment. In the third we desire that everyone may be diligently engaged in his proper place, direct all that he does to the glory of God, and regard whatever God sends upon him as good and calculated to advance his well-being. Third, why is this petition necessary? This petition is necessary, one, that the kingdom of God may come, which is the thing we pray for in the second petition, for unless God bring it to pass, that every one in his own peculiar sphere diligently do his will, this kingdom cannot be established, flourish, and be preserved. Two, that we may be in this kingdom. We cannot be members of this kingdom without doing the will of God. Nor can we of ourselves, on account of the corruption of our nature, do the will of God if he does not give us the necessary strength. This strength now God does not grant unto any except those who desire it, Hence it is necessary that we should pray to God that he may impart it unto us. Objection. It is not necessary that we should desire that which is always done, and which will certainly come to pass, even though we do not pray for it. The will of God is always done, and will most certainly come to pass, even though we do not desire it. Therefore it is not necessary that we should pray that it may be done. Answer. There is in the major proposition a fallacy in regarding that as a cause which is none, for we do not pray that the will of God may be done as if it would not be done, if we did not desire and pray for it, but for other causes, viz. that it may also be done by us, and that the events which God has ordained may contribute to our comfort and salvation. These events will not turn out to our advantage and salvation unless we submit to the will of God, and desire only that to be done which God has decreed and desires to be done. We also deny the minor proposition which is false, one, as it respects the calling of every one, because those who do not desire and pray that they may be able in their appropriate sphere to discharge their duty correctly, faithfully and with comfort to themselves, never do it. Two, it is also false as it respects the divine decrees, because God has decreed many events, yet in such a way that he has also decreed the means necessary thereto, and should someone reply, the decrees of God are unchangeable, so that the things which he determines upon will come to pass even without our prayers. We answer, the decrees of God are unchangeable, not only as it respects the event or end, but also as it respects the means which lead to this end. God has decreed to give the end, but it is by the means which lead to it, which is with the condition that we desire and pray for it. Fourth, why is it added, as in heaven? Christ adds the clause, as in heaven, for these two reasons. One, that he might set before us an example of perfection, after which we should strive. Two, that from the desire of perfection we might be assured that God will here grant unto us the commencement, and in the life to come the consummation, of all that we desire in reference to his kingdom and will. To him that hath shall be given, Luke 8, verse 18. The reason of both is this, that in heaven the will of God is done perfectly. Does any one ask by whom? We answer, one, by the Son of God, who does all that the Father wills. Lo, I come, I delight to do thy will, O my God. I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8, John 6, verse 38. Two, by the holy angels and blessed men. The will of God is done in heaven in such a way by the angels that every one of them stands before God ready to do whatever he commands. They do the general and special will of God most promptly and cheerfully. No one declines or refuses to do the service which God requires for them. No one transcends the limits which God has prescribed and in which he requires them to serve him. No one is ashamed to serve us, 
although we offend them and God by our sins. They are ministering spirits, Hebrews 1 verse 14. It is in this way, therefore, we all desire that we may also obey God and do his will on earth, as the holy angels do it in heaven. Objection. Things which are impossible should not be desired, but to desire that the will of God may be done on earth as in heaven, or that we may discharge our duty as the angels do in heaven, is impossible. Yea, it is to desire and pray for that which is contrary to the will of God. Therefore, it is not to be sought, since God designs that this shall be our state in the life to come, and not in the present state of being. Answer. In answering this objection, we would make the following distinction in reference to the major proposition. Things which are impossible should not be desired, unless God designs to give them at length to those who desire them. But God wills to give the ability to perform obedience to this his will, to such as desire it, in such a way that they commence this obedience in this life, and shall have it perfected in the life to come. The consummation of it is, therefore, to be ardently desired, whilst the impossibility of it should be patiently endured in this life. The consummation of it should also be desired, that we may at length obtain it, since he who does not desire it will certainly never obtain it. It is one thing not to be able to obtain this consummation, and another thing not to desire it. We also deny the minor proposition, in which there is an error in regarding that as a cause which is no cause, for we do not desire and pray that the consummation of our obedience to God may be accomplished in this life, but that we may here have the commencement, the continuation and increase of this obedience in us, and that at length, after it has been gradually carried forward by constant progression and increase, it may be perfected, and that we may then do the will of God as fully and perfectly as the angels continually do it in heaven. Hence, when we pray that the will of God may be done on earth as in heaven, the word as does not refer to and signify the degree, but the kind of obedience here alluded to, viz. the beginning of it, the desire and obtaining of which is not contrary to the divine decree, and as to the consummation of this obedience, it is proper that we should every moment desire and pray that we may be wholly delivered from sin, for it is agreeable to the will of God that we should pray for this, even though he does not design to perfect it in this life. It is not proper for us to search and scrutinize into what God has decreed, when we have this rule prescribed, that we pray for things upon the condition of the will of God. We should therefore submit ourselves to the divine will, and pray for what God has commanded us to ask of him, whether he has decreed it or not. God, for instance, wills the death of our parents, and yet does not design that we should desire and pray for their death. So God also wills that the church should have her seasons of affliction and oppression, but does not desire that we should pray for these afflictions, but for her deliverance, or that she may patiently submit to the afflictions which he sees fit to send upon her. So it is now in reference to the subject in hand. God does not design to give us perfect deliverance from sin in this life, and yet he wills that we should desire it and constantly pray that we may be wholly delivered from sin. There are, therefore, some things to be sought and prayed for which God will not bring to pass, and, on the other hand, there are some things which God designs to bring to pass, which we are not to desire and pray for, but patiently to endure, if they do come to pass. And yet in doing this we do not pray contrary to the will of God, because we always submit ourselves to his will in our prayers. End of section 78section 79 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fourth Petition, 50th Lord's Day, Question 125, which is the Fourth Petition, Answer, Give us this day our daily bread, that is, be pleased to provide us with all things necessary for the body, that we may thereby acknowledge thee to be the only fountain of all good, and that neither our care nor industry nor even thy gifts can profit us without thy blessing, and therefore that we may withdraw our trust from all creatures and place it in thee alone. Exposition. This petition respecting our daily bread, it would seem, should have been placed after the petition in which we pray for the forgiveness of our sins, inasmuch as such benefits as are most important should be prayed for first, whilst those which are less important should be sought last. But Christ, having regard to our infirmities, placed this fourth petition respecting our daily bread, as it were in the middle of the prayer which he prescribed, that we might both commence and end our prayers with petitions for spiritual blessings as being most important. 
and that the obtaining and receiving of temporal benefits might confirm in us more and more a confidence of obtaining spiritual blessings. In this fourth petition we are taught to pray for temporal blessings, concerning which we must inquire, first, why temporal blessings should be prayed for, second, in what manner they are to be sought, third, why Christ comprehends temporal blessings under the term bread, fourth, why he calls it our bread, fifth, why he calls it daily bread, sixth, why it should be given daily, seventh, whether it is lawful for us to pray for riches, eighth, whether it is lawful to lay up anything for the time to come. First, why temporal blessings should be prayed for. We should desire and pray for temporal blessings from God, no less than such as are spiritual, one on account of the command of God, which of itself should be sufficient, even though we should assign no other reason. We have as a warrant for asking temporal blessings from God both a general and special command. Christ gives a general command when he says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Matthew 7, verse 7. We have also a special command uttered by Christ when he prescribed unto us this form of prayer, saying, After this manner therefore pray ye, in which he also commands us to ask bread or temporal blessings from God. When Christ therefore commands us to take no thought in regard to what we shall eat, and says that all these things shall be added unto us, he does not design to forbid us to ask of God our daily bread, but condemns distrust or a want of confidence in God. Matthew 5 verses 31 and 33. 2. On account of the divine promise, God has promised to give us all things necessary for our life, and has promised them in order that we might desire and pray for them, and that we might have a firm confidence that we shall obtain things necessary for us, which confidence is spiritual and not carnal. Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Matthew 6 verse 32. 3. On account of the glory of God. This petition for temporal blessings is an acknowledgment and profession of the providence of God, especially towards the church. God desires that this praise should be given to him, inasmuch as he is the source of all good things, and that we may not suppose these things to come by mere chance. For, on account of our comfort, that they may be expressions of God's good will towards us, since good gifts, such as contribute to salvation, are promised and conferred only upon the children of God. Hence, when these gifts are conferred upon us, we should comfort ourselves by believing that we are of the number of those whom God has promised to grant these things. 5. That the desire and expectation of these blessings may be an exercise of our confidence and hope, for we cannot promise to ourselves temporal blessings unless we are assured of spiritual blessings and of God's good will towards us. Neither can we desire and pray for temporal blessings from God unless we are persuaded that we are in favour with Him. 6. On account of our necessity, that we may be able to do the will of God on earth. This we cannot do without daily bread. The dead praise not the Lord. Psalm 115 verse 17. 7. That the desire of these things may be a confirmation to us, and a profession before the world, that it is God who confers upon us even the smallest gifts. 8. For this comfort, that we may know that the church shall always be preserved on earth, since God always hears our prayers and will constantly grant unto us our daily bread, according to his promise. Second, in what manner temporal blessings are to be prayed for? Temporal blessings are to be sought and prayed for, as well as other good things promised in the gospel, one with confidence in the promise of God, or from faith. If we offer up our prayers differently, they are not heard, neither are the good things which we have made contributory to our salvation. Two, with the condition of the will of God, that God would give us what we pray for, if it be pleasing to him, and as he knows they may contribute to our advantage and his glory, because he has promised these things not with any determined circumstances. God has not prescribed in his word what temporal blessings he will confer upon us. It is different, however, as it respects spiritual blessings, for in reference to these God has expressly promised that he will give them to every one that asks. 3. With confidence of being heard, so that we believe that God will give us as much as is necessary to meet our wants. 4. To this end, that we may in the use of these things serve God and our neighbour, and not that they may contribute to our sensual desire. Those who do not in this way desire these blessings are not heard, and although they may receive what they ask, yet God does not hear them, because the things which they receive are not made profitable for their salvation. There are two reasons why God has not specified in his word what temporal blessings he will confer upon us, as the salvation of everyone, and the manifestation of his own glory demands. 1. 
because we are often ignorant what we should pray for and what would be good for us. God knows best what blessings it is desirable that he should confer upon us for the manifestation of his own glory and our salvation. As we, therefore, often err in asking temporal blessings, God confers only such upon us as he knows will be profitable for us. It is different, however, as it respects spiritual blessings, because these are all profitable unto us, and God has prescribed the way in which we are to pray for them, so that we cannot err in desiring them. For what God has positively promised, that we ought to desire positively, and what he has specially and simply promised, that we should seek and pray for in the same way. So we should simply desire and pray for the Holy Ghost, because God has simply and expressly promised to give the Holy Ghost to everyone that asks. Two, that we may learn to be contented with those things which we have received from God, and always submit our will to the will of God. Third, why Christ comprehends temporal blessings under the term bread. One, Christ, by a synecdoche which is common in the Hebrew language, comprehends under the term bread, all temporal blessings and such as are necessary for the sustenance of life, as food, raiment, health, civil peace, etc. This is evident from the design of the petition, for we pray for bread from our necessity, but there are many other things besides bread necessary for us, therefore we pray for them also under the term bread. This synecdoche, so common in the Hebrew language, often occurs in the Bible, as in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. He that did eat of my bread hath lifted up his heel against me. Genesis 3 verse 19, Psalm 41 verse 9. Nor did Christ merely comprehend under the term bread things necessary for the sustenance of life, but he also comprises such a use of these things as is profitable. For bread, apart from such use, is no better than a stone. 2. Christ furthermore comprehends all temporal blessings under the term bread, one, that he might restrain our desires and teach us to pray only for such things as are necessary for the support of life and for the service of God and our neighbor, both in our common and proper calling. Two, that he might teach us to pray not only for such things as are necessary, but also that the use of them might be made profitable to us and tend to our salvation inasmuch as these things profit us nothing without such a use. Bread now is made profitable to us, one, if we pray for it and receive it with faith, or with the intention, after the manner and to the end which God directs, which requires that we look in the exercise of faith to God, the author and giver of all good things. Two, if we desire that God will give, with the bread which we receive, the virtue and power of nourishing and preserving our bodies, which requires that we do not merely pray for bread itself, but also for the blessing of God, for if God does not bless us in that which we receive, all our cares and labors are in vain, and the gifts of God themselves are therefore useless and hurtful, according to the threatening, I will break the staff of your bread. Leviticus 26 verse 26. We may now easily see what we desire when we pray for bread, viz. 1. Not great riches, but only such things as are necessary for us. 2. That these things may be to us bread, or may be profitable and salutary, by the blessing of God without which bread is not bread, but becomes, as it were, a stone or poison. For he who gives bread, that it may not profit him that receives it any more than if it were a stone, gives a stone and not bread. Such now are the blessings which the wicked receive from God, and take as it were to themselves. Fourth, why does Christ call it our bread? Christ commands us to pray for our bread, and not for mine or thine, or any other man's, one, that we may desire those things which are given to us of God, for the bread which God gives us as necessary for the support of life is, and is made ours, when it is given unto us. This petition, therefore, give us our bread, signifies, give us, O God, the bread allotted to us, and which thou dost design shall be ours. God, as a householder, distributes to every one his own portion, or that which we deserve at his hands. 2. That we may desire things necessary, acquired by lawful labor in some honest and proper calling, pleasing to God and profitable to society at large, or that we may receive what we ask at the hands of God by ordinary means and lawful ways, the hand of God reaching them to us from heaven. This we command you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10, Ephesians 4 verse 28. 3. That we may use them with a good conscience and with thanksgiving, for God desires that we should take unto ourselves the assurance that when he gives us these things he also grants unto us the privilege of enjoying his gifts. God desires that we should use his gifts not as thieves and robbers, but cheerfully and with thanksgiving. Fifth, why does Christ call it daily bread? 
Christ calls the bread which we are commanded to ask of God daily bread, one, because he will have us to ask daily as much as we need for each day, two, because he would restrain our raging and boundless desires. Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. There is no want to them that fear him. Matthew 6, verse 32, Psalm 37, verse 16, Psalm 34, verse 9. Hence the petition, give us our daily bread, means, give us as much bread as is sufficient for us, give us so much of what is necessary for the support of life, as every one of us needs to serve thee and our neighbor in our several callings in life. Sixth, why does Christ add this day? Christ adds the phrase this day, one, that he might meet and guard against our distrust and covetousness, and keep us from both these vices, two, that we might depend upon him alone as yesterday, so this day and to-morrow, and also expect the necessaries of life from the hands of God, that we may know that they are not obtained by our own hands or labor or diligence, but that God confers them upon us, and that we may know that even though we receive them, yet they will not profit our bodies if the blessing of God does not accompany them. 3. That the exercise of faith and prayer may always be continued in us, for as long as it is said this day, so long does Christ design that prayer should be continued, that we may yield obedience to the command to pray always. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17. 7. Is it lawful for us to pray for riches? This, in connection with the following question, naturally grows out of what we have already said in reference to this petition, for when we are commanded to pray only for our daily bread, and that to this day, it would seem at first view that it is not lawful either to desire riches or to lay anything by for tomorrow. It is, however, certainly right and proper to desire riches if we remove all ambiguity from the word and understand by it things which are necessary for the support of life. It was in this way also that Epicurus defined riches, quote, to be a poverty adapted to the law of nature, end quote. This is a good definition of the term, for they are to be considered truly rich, who enjoy a sufficient amount of the things necessary for the support of life, and are contented therewith. If we therefore understand the term riches as just defined, they are certainly to be sought and prayed for at the hands of God, inasmuch as we are to desire such things as are necessary for nature, and for the position and office which God has assigned us in life. And the reason is that these necessary things or riches are the daily bread which we are commanded to ask and pray for at the hands of God. There are others, again, who define the term differently, understanding by it an abundance and plenty over and above what is necessary. So Croesus, surnamed the rich, said, quote, that no one is rich unless he was able to support an army by his revenue, end quote. In this sense, riches are never to be asked of God, seeing that this is not to pray for our daily bread. Solomon says in the person of all the godly, give me neither poverty nor riches, Proverbs 30 verse 8 by which words the Holy Ghost teaches that riches, when understood to mean an abundance over and above what is necessary, are to be deprecated by us. The declaration of the Apostle Paul in his first epistle to Timothy, chapter 6 verse 9, is also here in point, where he says, They that will be rich fall into temptations and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition, Christ also calls riches thorns, which we cannot handle without exposing ourselves to the danger of being pricked thereby, Matthew 13, verse 22. But on the other hand, godliness is great gain if a man be contented with what he has, 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. Should God, however, give us anything besides what is actually necessary for us, we should use these things properly, or reserve them for purposes good and necessary, for Christ commanded the disciples to gather up the fragments that nothing might be lost, John 6, verse 12. We have also a remarkable example in the person of Joseph, who, being warned of the approaching famine, gathered and laid by provisions in the time of plenty for the years of scarcity and dearth which were to come upon the land of Egypt. Genesis 41 verse 48. But here care must be taken, one, that we do not repose our trust in them. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. Psalm 62 verse 10. Two, that we avoid luxury and every abuse of the gifts of God. 3. We should regard ourselves as stewards of God who has committed these riches to our charge for the purpose of being properly expended, and has imposed upon us the duty of administering them so as to promote his glory, and that we shall at some time be required to render an account to God for our stewardship and administration. 8. Is it lawful for us to lay anything by for the time to come? 
that it is right and proper for us to lay something by for the time to come may be inferred from the command of Christ, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. John 6 verse 12. The same thing is also taught by the word hour, as it is here used. For we are required to aid and contribute to the support of the commonwealth, and to give to the poor as opportunity presents itself. This, however, we cannot do unless we lay something of our own by, so that we may have something to give whenever any occasion calls for the exercise of our liberality. We may here appropriately refer to all the precepts and rules which the scriptures give respecting parsimony and frugality, which virtues are employed in keeping and profitably disposing of things honestly acquired for one's own use and for the benefit of his friends, so as to avoid all sumptuousness, prodigality, luxury, and waste of the gifts of God. The Apostle Paul teaches that it is the duty of parents to lay something in store for their children when he says, The children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 14. These three things should, however, be observed in laying up possessions for the time to come. 1. That the things which are laid by in store be lawfully gotten, having been acquired by honest and lawful labour. 2. That we do not repose our confidence in them. 3. That they be preserved for lawful and necessary purposes, both as it respects ourselves and others, such as a proper support of our own life and for our families, for the preservation of the church and state, and for administering to the wants of the poor and needy, concerning which we may cite the following passages of Scripture. Trust not in oppression, and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labour, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Psalm 62 verse 11, Ephesians 4 verse 28. We may now easily return an answer to the objections which are brought against this petition. Objection 1. It is not necessary to desire and pray for what is ours. Daily bread is ours, therefore we need not desire it from God. Answer. There are here four terms arising from the ambiguity of the word our, which in the major proposition signifies a thing which we have in our own power, whilst in the minor it signifies a thing which becomes ours by the gift of God, or which we obtain from God by prayer, as we have already shown. Objection 2. It is not necessary that we should labour for that which is obtained not by labour, but by prayer. Our daily bread is obtained not by labour, but by prayer. Therefore, we should not labour for it, but merely pray. Answer. There is here an error in regarding that as absolutely true, which is true only in part. Those things which are simply not obtained by labour, neither as a cause nor as the necessary means, for these it is to no purpose that we labour, but although our labour is not necessary for the purpose of obtaining temporal benefits, as the whole or principal efficient cause, yet it is nevertheless necessary as a means instituted by God, according as it is said, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground. This we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Genesis 3 verse 19, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10. God gives all things freely, but not without labour and prayer on our part. Objection 3. Christ here commands us to pray for our daily bread, and this day, and not tomorrow. Therefore it is not lawful to lay anything in store for the time to come. Why then does Paul say that parents ought to lay up for their children? 2 Corinthians 12 verse 14. Answer. This objection is of no account, inasmuch as it regards that as a cause which is none. Christ commands us to pray for our daily bread, and this day, hence we are to ask that which is necessary for every day, this day, tomorrow, and as long as we live. We are, therefore, not to understand Christ as teaching that he will not have us to labour for the morrow, or that we are not to lay anything by for the future, or that we are to cast away those things which God has already given us, as sufficient for the time to come. For his object is to remove from us distrust, covetousness, and an unrighteous acquisition of goods and disobedience. He does indeed say, in another place, take no thought for the morrow, Matthew 6 verse 34, but his meaning evidently is that we should not think of the morrow with distrust, as though God would then give us nothing, or as though it would not be necessary for us to pray. He does not, therefore, forbid labour and prayer, but merely distrust and a want of confidence in God. End of section 79《Section 80 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fifth Petition, 51st Lord's Day, Question 126, 
What is the fifth petition? Answer. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That is, be pleased for the sake of Christ's blood not to impute to us poor sinners our transgressions, nor that depravity which always cleaves to us, even as we feel this evidence of thy grace in us that it is our firm resolution from the heart to forgive our neighbour. Exposition Cyprian correctly and piously observes, respecting the order and argument of this fifth petition, that we pray for the pardon and forgiveness of our sins after praying for a supply of food, that he who is fed by God may live in God, nor do we merely have regard for this present temporal life, but also for that which is eternal, to which all those attain whose sins are pardoned. This same father likewise observes that this petition is a remarkable and free confession of the church in which she acknowledges and deplores her sins, and is at the same time a comfort that the church shall receive the forgiveness of sins according to the promise of Christ, and also binds us to extend forgiveness to our neighbour. Christ, therefore, by this petition wills, one, that we acknowledge our sins, two, that we thirst and long after the forgiveness of sins, inasmuch as this is granted to none but such as desire it, and who do not trample underfoot the blood of the Son of God. 3. That our faith may be exercised, seeing that this petition springs from faith and also confirms faith. For faith is the cause of prayer, and prayer is the cause of faith as it respects the increase thereof. The principal questions which claim our attention in connection with this petition are the following. First, what does Christ mean by debts? Second, what is it to forgive debts or sins? Third, why is the forgiveness of sins to be prayed for? Fourth, how are sins remitted unto us, or what is the meaning of the clause, as we forgive our debtors? First, what does Christ mean by debts? Christ comprises under the term debts all our sins, original as well as actual, including sins of ignorance, of omission and commission, as he himself explains it in Luke 11 verse 4, where he says, Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive every one that is indebted to us. They are called debts because they make us debtors to God, both in respect to the obedience which we have failed to render, and also to the punishment which we are bound to pay in consequence thereof, for when we sin we neither give nor perform to God what we owe him, and as long as we do not yield this to him, so long do we remain debtors to God, and are bound to make satisfaction by punishment. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. Deuteronomy 27 verse 26 from this state of condemnation we could never be delivered if God did not remit unto us our sins. Second, what is it to remit debts or to forgive sins? A creditor is said to forgive a debtor when he does not demand from him that which he owes him, but blots his account from his books without exacting any punishment, as though it had been paid, as we may learn from the parable of the king who in view of the entreaties of the servant that owed him ten thousand talents forgave him the debt, Matthew 18, verse 27. So God forgives our debts when he does not lay them to our account, nor punish us on account of them, and that because he has punished them in his Son, our Mediator. This, therefore, is what we are to understand by the forgiveness of sins, that God does not impute any sin to us, but graciously receives us into his favor, declares us righteous, and regards us as his children out of his mere grace and mercy for the sake of the satisfaction which Christ made in our behalf, imputed unto us and apprehended of us by faith, and that he will therefore not punish us on account of our sins, but grants unto us righteousness and eternal life, since the remission of sin does away with the punishment of sin, for sin and punishment are correlatives. When sin is introduced or committed, punishment follows, but when it is taken away, punishment is at the same time removed. Objection. To remit sin is not to impute it, nor to be willing to punish it in us. But this is inconsistent with the justice of God. Therefore, when we pray that God will remit sin, we desire that he will act contrary to the order of his justice. Answer. We deny the consequence because the order of divine justice is not violated when God pardons sin, except he pardons it without any satisfaction being made. But it is not in this way that we pray for the forgiveness of sins, inasmuch as we desire it on account of the satisfaction of Christ. Hence, when our sins are remitted, there is no wrong done to the order of divine justice, as it is not done without satisfaction having been made. And if some should reply that God does not graciously and freely remit our sins, if he does it in view of a recompense having been made, 
We answer that they are forgiven in view of a recompense having been made, and therefore not freely in respect to Christ, but freely in respect to us, since it has not received satisfaction from us, but from Christ. And if it should still further be objected that remission of sins is not granted freely, since we have merited it in Christ, we answer that the merit on account of which our sins are pardoned is not ours, but Christ's, who was given by the Father freely for us, and merited this forgiveness for us without the intervention of any desert on our part, and that this his merit is freely imputed unto us. Hence our sins are graciously forgiven on account of the merit of Christ, from which it is correctly inferred that they are not imputed unto us on account of the satisfaction of Christ. For we do not desire that God would act contrary to his justice, and that he would not regard us as sinners, but that he would not impute unto us the righteousness of another, even the righteousness of Christ, with which our sins are covered. To express it more briefly, we would say, God remits our sins freely, one, because he does not demand any satisfaction from us, two, because he freely gave his Son in whom he made satisfaction, three, because he graciously gives and imputes the satisfaction of his Son to such as believe. Third, why should we desire the forgiveness of sins? We should desire and pray for the forgiveness of sin, one, on account of our salvation that we may be saved, for without the forgiveness of sins we cannot be saved. Neither does God confer this benefit upon any but such as desire it. Two, that we may be admonished and reminded of the remains of sin which still cleave even to the most holy in this life, and that our repentance may thus become more earnest and deep. Three, that we may desire and receive the former blessings, because, without the remission of sins, these blessings are either not given, or else they are given to their destruction. So the wicked often receive these gifts, but not to their salvation, for they rather contribute to their condemnation. Objection. It is not necessary that we should desire and pray for what we have. The godly have the remission of their sins, therefore there is no need that they should desire it. Answer. The godly do indeed enjoy the forgiveness of sins, but not wholly, and that too not in respect to the continuance, but merely as it respects the beginning thereof. This forgiveness should without doubt be continued, inasmuch as sins are continually found even in the regenerate. God does also continue it in all those to whom he forgives sin in his Son, but with the condition that we daily desire this continuance. Hence, although God has forgiven our sins for Christ's sake, yet he nevertheless designs that we should pray for their forgiveness. It is for this reason that we pray that God would forgive us the sins which we now or may hereafter commit. Fourth, how are sins remitted unto us, or why is it added, as we forgive our debtors? Our sins are so remitted unto us, as we also forgive our debtors, which clause is added by Christ, one, that we may rightly desire and pray for the forgiveness of our sins, and may therefore come before God in true faith and penitence, the sign of which is love to our neighbour. Two, on account of our comfort, that we may be assured of the forgiveness of our sins, when we extend forgiveness to others for the sins which they may have committed against us, and may have the assurance that we are acceptable to God, although there are many remains of sin still within us. Objection 1. He is not pardoned who himself does not forgive. We do not forgive, therefore we are not forgiven. Answer. He who does not forgive fully and perfectly does nevertheless obtain forgiveness if he does but forgive truly and sincerely. Therefore forgiveness shall also be extended to us if we forgive truly and sincerely. Objection 2. Christ commands us to pray that God will forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. But we do not perfectly forgive our debtors. Therefore we, according to this petition, pray that God will not perfectly forgive us our sins, which is to desire our destruction, since God will condemn even the smallest sin. Answer. This is to put a false construction upon the words of Christ, for the particle as, as used in this petition, does not signify the degree of forgiveness, or teach that the forgiveness which we extend to others is equal to that which God extends to us, but it signifies the kind of forgiveness or the truth and sincerity of the forgiveness which we and God extend, that God will as truly forgive us as we certainly and truly forgive our neighbor from the heart. Or, to express it more briefly, we may say that there is here not a comparison according to the degrees, but according to the truth and reality of the thing, so that the sense is, God so perfectly forgives us our sins, as we truly and certainly forgive our neighbor. Objection 3. But Christ commands us in Luke to pray, Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Luke 11 verse 4. 
Therefore, our forgiveness is the cause on account of which God forgives us. Answer. But this is to consider that as a cause which is none. Our forgiveness is not meritorious or the cause of divine forgiveness, but is merely an argument and proof that God has forgiven us our sins, since we have forgiven others, if not perfectly, yet still truly and sincerely. Our forgiveness cannot be the cause of the forgiveness of God, one, because it is imperfect, two, because if it were even perfect, it could still not merit anything for the reason that what we now do we owe to God. If we were now to perform perfect obedience, it would still be due to God. Yet we must not understand this as signifying an equality of forgiveness in us and God, but only as referring to a comparison of the kind of forgiveness. Objection 4. He does not truly forgive who retains a recollection of injuries and is desirous of taking revenge. But we all have a recollection of injuries and are desirous of taking revenge. Therefore we do not truly forgive. Answer. He does not truly forgive who retains a recollection of injuries without showing any signs of disapprobation or making any resistance thereto, and although we may scarcely be able to bury all remembrance of offences, or at least not without the greatest difficulty, yet if we only do not cherish it, but resist the remains of sin which still cleave to us and do not give indulgence to them, there is nothing which may prevent us from true and heartily forgiving others, and of obtaining that also, on account of which Christ has added the particle as, which is, as has already been remarked, that we might rightly pray to God, which takes place whenever we pray in faith and repentance, both of which are confirmed in us by this petition. Faith is strengthened and confirmed in us by this petition because when we truly extend forgiveness to our neighbor, we may and ought certainly to believe that our sins are also forgiven us so that we have a good conscience and are sure of being heard, according to the promise of Christ, if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Matthew 6 verse 14 True repentance is in like manner confirmed and increased within us by this petition, since it was chiefly to lead and provoke us to this that the condition was added, as we forgive our debtors. For if we would obtain forgiveness for ourselves, we must also extend forgiveness to others. Both causes are contained in the words of Christ as just cited. If ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That is, then you may certainly believe that you will be heard of your Father in heaven, which words comprehend a confirmation of our faith, whilst the antithesis which follows adds a spur, or provokes to repentance. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Matthew 6 verse 15. Objection 5. But Paul did not forgive Alexander, for he says, 2 Timothy 2 verse 4, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Yet he obtained forgiveness of God. Therefore our forgiveness is not necessary in order that we may obtain the forgiveness of God. Answer. Forgiveness is threefold. 1. Of revenge. This pertains to all men inasmuch as all ought to forgive revenge. It is of this that this petition speaks, and this Paul forgave Alexander. 2. Of punishment. This all cannot forgive, as all cannot inflict punishment. Neither ought the magistrate, to whom it belongs to inflict punishment, to remit it, except for just and weighty reasons, for God desires that his justice and law should be put into execution. This Paul also forgave Alexander, in as far as it had respect to him. Yet he at the same time desired that he should be punished of God, in case he would persist in sin. 3. Of judgment in reference to others. This should not always be remitted, for God, who prohibits falsehood, will not have us to judge of knaves as honest men, but desires that we should distinguish the good from the bad. Christ enjoins the same thing when he says, Give not that which is holy to the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Matthew 7, verse 6, chapter 10, verse 16. Paul did not, therefore, sin in entertaining an opinion of Alexander as a wicked man, as long as he did not repent of his wickedness. End of section 80. Section 81 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sixth Petition. Fifty-second Lord's Day, question 127, which is the Sixth Petition. Answer, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That is, since we are so weak in ourselves that we cannot stand a moment, and besides this, since our mortal enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, cease not to assault us. Do thou therefore preserve and strengthen us by the power of thy Holy Spirit, that we may not be overcome in this spiritual warfare, 
but constantly and strenuously may resist our foes, until at last we obtain a complete victory. Exposition. There are some who here make one petition, while others make two. We should not, however, strive or contend in reference to the matter as long as the doctrine which is here taught is fully retained. To us the words seem rather to constitute two parts of one and the same petition. Lead us not into temptation is a petition for deliverance from future evil, but deliver us from evil is a petition for deliverance from present evil. The things which we are here to consider are the following. First, what is temptation? Second, what is it to lead into temptation? Third, what is it to deliver from evil? Fourth, why is this petition necessary? First, what is temptation? There are two kinds of temptation. The one is from God, the other is from the devil. The former is a trial of our faith, piety, repentance, and obedience, which is from God, through the various oppositions and hindrances of our salvation. As by all evils, by the devil, the flesh, lusts, the world, afflictions, calamities, the cross, etc., that our faith, patience, hope, and constancy may be made manifest both to ourselves and others. It is in this sense that God is said to have tempted Abraham, Joseph, Job, and David. The Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Deuteronomy 13 verse 4, see also Genesis 22 verse 1, Psalm 139 verse 1. So God is also said to tempt his people by false prophets and by the cross, the temptation of the devil, or that by which the devil, the flesh, and the wicked tempt us, is every solicitation to do wrong, which solicitation itself is sin. It was in this way that the devil tempted Job, that he might draw him from God, whom he loved and worshipped, although the final issue of the temptation was different from what the devil designed and anticipated. So he also provoked David to number the children of Israel, 1 Chronicles 21 verse 1. Objection. But it is said in the epistle of James, chapter 1, verse 13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted of evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Answer. God tempts no one by soliciting and enticing him to sin or evil, but he tempts us by trying us. But the devil, the world, and the flesh tempt us so as to entice and solicit us to sin for the purpose of drawing us from God. In this sense of the term, God tempts no man. Hence, when it is said that he tempted Abraham, Job, and David, we are to understand it to mean nothing more than a trial of their faith and constancy by afflictions and the cross. So he also, by the use of the same means, tries our faith, hope, patience, love, and constancy, whether we will also worship and serve him in afflictions. From what has now been said, we may easily perceive, since temptation is attributed to the devil and to the disordered inclinations of men, in what sense God is said to tempt and not to tempt men. Satan tempts men both by offering occasions to sin from without, and also by instigating them from within to sin, that he may thus plunge them into destruction and cast reproach upon God. Disordered inclinations tempt men because they tend to such actions as God prohibits. God, however, tempts not to destroy us, nor to lead us into sin, but to try and exercise us, when he either sends calamities upon us, or permits the devil or men or our flesh to provoke and invite us to sin, hiding for a time his grace and power in preserving and ruling us, that our faith and constancy by these exercises and trials may be more clearly manifested, not indeed to God who knows from everlasting what and how great our faith is, and how great it will hereafter be by his blessing, but to ourselves and others, that so, by these examples of our deliverance, there may be confirmed in us a confidence of the divine presence and protection, that a desire of imitating us may be awakened in others by seeing our perseverance, and that true gratitude may be kindled in all of us towards God, who has delivered us from our temptations. It was in this way that God tempted Abraham when he commanded him to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. Genesis 22. So he is said to have tempted his people by withholding water from them, Exodus 15. This petition, therefore, lead us not into temptation, which Christ commands us to address to God, does not simply speak of the trials and proofs of our faith and piety, to which David willingly offers himself when he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart, try me and know my thoughts, but also of the cunning devices and assaults of the devil and of our flesh, and of desertion in external and internal conflicts. Nor does the Apostle James speak of our being tried, but of our being enticed to sin when he says, Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. 
but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. James 1, verses 13 to 16. Hence, it is also apparent how God punishes the wicked and chastises and tempts the godly by evil spirits, whilst he is nevertheless not the cause of these sins which are committed by the devil, nor is a partaker with them in his wickedness. For that the wicked are punished by the wicked, and the good chastised and exercised, is the just and holy work of the divine will. But that the wicked execute the judgment of God by sinning is not the fault of God, but comes to pass by the corruption of the wicked, which they have brought upon themselves, God neither willing, nor approving, nor accomplishing, nor furthering their sins, but only permitting them, in his just judgment, when accomplishing his work and purpose through them. He either does not reveal his will to them, or does not influence their wills to regard his revealed will as the end and rule of their actions. This distinction between the works of God and those of the devil, and of God's accomplishing his just work through the devil, and of his permitting the sin of the devil, is evidently confirmed by the history of Job, whom God designed to try, whilst the devil attempted to destroy him. The same thing is also proven by the history of Ahab, and by the prophecy respecting Antichrist, where the devil deceives men that he may destroy them, whilst God permits them to be deceived, that he may in this way punish them, and suffers the devil to execute his will and purpose. 1 Kings 23, 2 Thessalonians 2. Second, what is it to lead into temptation? When God is said to lead us into temptation, we are to understand by it that he tries and proves us according to his most just will and judgments. When the devil is said to lead us into temptation, it means that God permits him to entice and solicit us to sin. We are here in this petition taught to pray for deliverance from both of these forms of temptation. We therefore pray, one, that God will not tempt us for the sake of trying us, if such be his will and pleasure, or, if he does tempt us, that he will give us strength to endure the temptation. Two, that he will not permit the devil, or the world, or the flesh to entice us to sin, or if he does permit us to be tempted, that he himself will be present with us, that we may not fall into sin. This, therefore, is the true sense and meaning of this petition, lead us not into temptation, suffer us not to be tempted above that which we are able to bear, neither permit the devil to tempt us in such a way that we may either sin or wholly fall from the objection. Temptations which are good in respect to God are evil in respect to the devil, and yet God, notwithstanding, leads us into them. Therefore God is the cause of sin. Answer. There is here a fallacy of the accident. They are sins in respect to the devil because he designs to entice us to sin by these temptations. In respect to God, however, they are not sins because they try us and withdraw us from sin and also confirm our faith. Temptations, therefore, in as far as they are trials, chastisements, martyrdoms, etc., are sent of God. But in as far as they are evil and sinful, God does not will them, so as to approve and affect them, but only permits them. Third, what is it to deliver us from evil? There are some who understand by the term evil, as here used, the devil. Others understand by it sin and others death. It is best, however, to understand it as comprehending all the evils of guilt and punishment, whether they be present or future, Yea, and the devil himself, the author and grand contriver of all wicked deeds, who is called by the Apostle John, according to a significant form of speech, the wicked one. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. Whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. 1 John 2, verse 13, Matthew 5, verse 37. Cyprian understood the term evil, as here used, to include all the adverse circumstances which the enemy brings against us, from which we can have no sure protection except God deliver us. Hence, when we pray that God will deliver us from evil, we desire, one, that he will send no evil upon us, but keep and defend us from present and future evils, both of guilt and punishment. Two, that if he does here send evils upon us, he will be pleased to mitigate them and make them contribute to our salvation, that they may be profitable to us. 3. That he will at length fully and perfectly deliver us in the life to come, and wipe away all tears from our eyes. 4. Why is this petition necessary? This petition is necessary, 1. On account of the number and power of our enemies, together with the magnitude of the evils to which we are exposed, and our own weakness. 2. On account of the preceding petition, that we may obtain the forgiveness of our sins, inasmuch as our sins are not forgiven, except we continue in faith and repentance. But we will not continue in these, if we are tempted above our strength, if we rush into sin and fall from God himself. Objection 1. 
We should not pray for deliverance from things good and profitable to us. The temptations which are from God, such as trials by afflictions, poverty, false prophets, etc., are things good and profitable to us. Therefore, we should not pray for deliverance from them. Answer, we are not to pray for deliverance from things which are in themselves good and profitable. But trials, afflictions, crosses, and other temptations are profitable not in themselves, but only by an accident, which is the mercy of God accompanying them, without which they are not only not profitable, but constitute a part of death, and lead to death both temporal and eternal. Hence, in as far as afflictions are evil in themselves and destructive to our nature, in so far are we to pray for a deliverance from them. But, in as far as they are by the goodness of God good and profitable to those who believe, we should not desire to be delivered from them. Or we may express it thus, that which is good and which accompanies afflictions and the cross, we should not pray for deliverance from, but afflictions and the cross itself which are evil in themselves, being destructive to our nature. From these we should pray for deliverance, as Christ himself also prayed when he said, Let this cup pass from me, that is, let it pass from me, in as far as it is a destruction and evil, in which sense the Father himself did not desire it. But in as far as the death of Christ was a ransom for the sins of his people, in so far both Christ and the Father desired it. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Matthew 26, verse 39. Objection 2. We ought not to pray for deliverance from what God wills, but God wills our temptations, therefore we ought not to pray for deliverance from them. Answer. We ought not to pray for deliverance from what God wills, in as far as he simply wills it, but he does not simply will temptations. He does not will them in as far as they are destructive to us, but only in as far as they are trials and exercises of our faith, prayer, and constancy. In this respect we ought also to desire these things, and that we ought not simply to desire temptations is evident from this, that it is the part of patience to endure and submit to them, which it would not be, but rather our duty, if we should simply desire them without being permitted to pray for deliverance from them. God will not therefore have us to desire evils in as far as they are evils, but will have us patiently to endure them in as far as they are good and profitable to us. Objection 3. It is in vain that we pray for what we never obtain, but we shall never obtain a complete deliverance from temptations in this life, for all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. Therefore it is in vain that we pray not to be led into temptation. Answer. There is here an error in regarding that as a cause which is none, for we pray that we may not be led into temptation, not because we are here wholly to be delivered from temptations, but because we are delivered from many temptations and evils in which we should have perished, had we not sought and prayed for deliverance. This should be a sufficient reason why we should pray as we are here taught. But we may add still further that this petition is necessary in order that the evils into which we fall may be made contributory to our salvation. Those now who desire deliverance in general obtain these two great blessings from God, notwithstanding he designs that this benefit be imperfect, even to those who desire it, on account of the remains of sin which still cleave to us, and that because he will have us to pray with confidence and submission to his will, that we may obtain it fully and perfectly in the life to come. The benefit of this petition is one, a confession of our weakness in enduring temptations, even the smallest, that no one may be unduly exalted and filled with conceit, as Peter was, when he declared himself willing to die with Christ, and that no one may take to himself the glory of his confession and sufferings, seeing that the Lord himself teaches us humility, saying, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Matthew 26, verse 41, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. 2. A declaration of the miseries and evils of this present life, that we may not become secure and fall in love with the world. 3. An acknowledgement and confession of the providence of God, which, as Cyprian writes, teaches that the devil can effect nothing against us except God first give him permission, which should lead us to reverence and fear God, since the wicked one can accomplish nothing in all our temptations except God give him power to do so. God now grants Satan power over us, according as we permit sin to reign in us, as it is said, Who gave Jacob for a spoil, and Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord? He against whom we have sinned. For they would not walk in his ways, neither were obedient to his law. Isaiah 42 verse 24. This power too, which is given to Satan, is twofold, either for our punishment when we sin against God, or for our glory when we are tried and exposed. This is Cyprian's view of the subject. 
It is proper that we should here notice the order and connection between the different petitions which we have now considered. 1. The Lord commands us to seek the true knowledge or profession of God, which is the cause of all his other blessings. 2. That God would rule us by his Spirit, and so continually confirm and preserve us in this knowledge. 3. That every one may by this means properly discharge his duty in his appropriate sphere and calling. 4. That he would give us those temporal blessings necessary that every one may perform his duty. The fourth petition, therefore, agrees with the preceding, for if it is necessary that we should all be in our proper calling, we must live and have what is necessary for the support of life. 5. The petition for temporal and spiritual blessings follows next in order, and is thrown in to meet our unworthiness, that thou mayest give us temporal and spiritual blessings, forgive us our debts. The fifth petition is therefore the foundation of the rest. If this be overthrown, the rest will likewise fall to the ground. For if any one has not the assurance that God is reconciled to him, how can he know him to be merciful? How can he continue in that knowledge which he has not? How can he do his duty and the will of God when he is the enemy of God and desires contrary to his will? How can the gifts of God contribute to his salvation? 6. After the petition for temporal and spiritual blessings, the petition for deliverance from present and future evils follows, being the last. From this last petition we return again to the first, deliver us from all the evils of guilt and punishment, present and future, that we may know thee, our perfect Saviour, that so thy name may be sanctified by us. Question 128. How dost thou conclude thy prayer? Answer, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for ever. That is, all these we ask of thee, because thou art our King and Almighty, art willing and able to give us all good. And all this we pray for, that thereby not we, but thy holy name may be glorified for ever. Exposition. This conclusion contributes to the confirmation of our faith, or to our confidence of being heard, seeing that God is willing and able to grant what we desire and pray for at his hands. Thine is the kingdom. The first reason is drawn from the duty of a king, which is to hear, defend, and preserve his subjects. Therefore thou, O God, since thou art our king, more powerful than all enemies, having all things in thy power, both good and evil, evil, so that thou art able to restrain and repress them, good, so that there is no blessing so great that thou canst not give, if it be agreeable to our nature, since we are thy subjects, be present with us by thy power and save us, seeing thou hast a love for thy subjects, and canst preserve and defend them. And the power. The second reason is drawn from the power of God. Hear us, O God, and grant us all that we pray for, since thou art able, and thou alone, for this power rests in thee alone, being joined with infinite goodness. And the glory. The third reason is from the end or final cause. We ask these things for thy glory. We desire and look for all good things from thee, the only true and sovereign God. We profess and acknowledge thee as the author and fountain of all good things, because this glory is due thee. We therefore desire these things from thee. Therefore hear us for thy glory, for this petition and expectation of all good things from thee is nothing else than an ascription of honour and glory to thee. Hear us especially, since thou wilt grant us the things which we desire. Thou wilt do what contributes to thy glory. What we desire and pray for contributes to thy glory. Therefore thou wilt grant it unto us. Give us, therefore, what we pray for, and the glory shall redound to thee, if thou deliver us. For so shall thy kingdom, power, and glory be manifested. Objection. We seem to bring persuasive arguments to God, by which we may constrain and influence him to do for us what we pray for. But it is in vain that we use arguments with him who is unchangeable. God is unchangeable, therefore it is in vain that we thus plead with him. Answer. We grant the argument as it respects God, but not as it respects us. Or we may reply that there is here an error in taking that as a cause which is none. We do not use arguments that we may move and influence God, or persuade him to do what we ask, but that we ourselves may be persuaded that God will do this, that we may be assured of being heard, and acknowledge our necessity and the goodness and truth of God. These arguments are therefore not added to our prayers for the purpose of moving and influencing God, but merely to confirm and assure us that God will do what we desire and pray for, these now are the reasons on account of which he does it. Thou art the best king. Therefore, thou wilt give to thy subjects what is necessary and tends to their salvation. Thou art most powerful. Therefore, thou wilt show thy power in giving these greatest of all gifts, which can be given by no one besides thee. 
it shall contribute to thy glory. Therefore thou wilt do it, because thou hast a regard to thy glory. Question 129. What does the word Amen signify? Answer. Amen signifies, it shall truly and certainly be, for my prayer is more assuredly heard of God than I feel in my heart I desire these things of him. Exposition. The word Amen is not added as a part of the prayer, but is connected with it, to denote one, a true and sincere desire that we may be heard, that the thing which we desire and pray for may be ratified and certain, and that God would answer our request. Two, a certainty and profession of our confidence, or a confirmation of that faith, by which we are fully persuaded that we shall be heard. The word Amen signifies, therefore, one, so let it be, or let that come to pass which we ask. Two, may God, who is not unmindful of his promise, certainly and truly hear us. End of section 81. End of commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard.